Hello everyone, welcome to this AWS full course by Intellipart. Many companies are doing heavy layoffs right now. However, there is one IT field that has continued to thrive and that is the cloud industry. According to LinkedIn, there are 27,000 cloud jobs available in India and almost 5 lakh plus jobs available worldwide. If we talk about salary, in India the salary for an AWS cloud professional is between 12 lakh rupees to 35 lakh rupees. Whereas in the US, it ranges between $100,000 to $250,000. Do you want to start your journey in the cloud domain? Then this video on AWS certification program is for you. This AWS course for beginners covers all the important skill sets required to get you a job. This video has been designed by top industry experts from around the world, which includes multiple real-time projects and important interview questions. But before we dive into the technicalities, I request you guys to click on the subscribe button and hit that bell icon to never miss out on any updates from us. Now let's move on to the agenda. So we'll start off by understanding what is cloud computing exactly and then understand what is AWS. Once we're done with that, we'll talk about the top cloud providers which are out there such as AWS, Azure and GCP. Once we move on, we'll talk about some of the important services of AWS, such as EC2, EBS, EFS, and Amazon FSx. Once we're done with that, we'll move on and talk about some security services in AWS, such as IAM and CloudWatch, and then move on to discuss elastic load balancer and auto scaling. Once we're done with that, we'll move on and we'll do a real world project, which is going to be a multi-tier architecture project from scratch, once we're done with that, we'll pick up some real-time interview questions which will be asked to you in your next AWS interview. AWS was introduced in 2006 and since then, they have been the largest player in the public cloud market. According to Forbes, AWS grew $4.3 billion revenue just in the second quarter of 2021. The top three companies who offer cloud services in terms of market share are Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud Platform. AWS by itself covers 32% of the public cloud market share. So what exactly is AWS? Amazon Web Services or AWS is a cloud service provider owned by Amazon. It offers cloud services in compute, storage, database, content delivery, networking and other domains. Most of the offerings from AWS are infrastructure as a service offerings, but it also offers PaaS service such as Elastic Benstock and Lambda which are popular and highly used services. AWS offers you all the necessary tools you would need to set up your IT infrastructure without paying any upfront. For example, Netflix. The world's biggest premium video streaming service is completely hosted on AWS for its application needs. The world's largest e-commerce company Amazon is also hosted on the AWS infrastructure itself. When you see such big players in the respective fields rely on AWS for their infrastructure needs, you as an individual user can trust and be inclined towards AWS for your cloud needs. AWS offers a wide range of services that can be categorized into the following. We have compute and network services, storage and content delivery services, security and identity services, database services, analytic services, application services and management tools. Now we have few applications of AWS. What are they? Let's look into it. The first one we have is storage and backup. That's Amazon's cloud storage is an easily accessible and useful services for business. Next we have enterprise IT. That's Amazon cloud services offer the ideal solution to enterprise IT's time consuming pace. Mobile, web and social applications. AWS can launch and scale various applications like mobile applications and SaaS applications. Big Data AWS and Big Data work well with each other to come up with the power and infrastructure necessary to meet the needs of high-end intelligent software. Websites can be hosted on AWS Cloud. It is also good for hosting CDNs and DNS and domains. 
In gaming, AWS makes gaming applications easily available to the worldwide gaming network and provides gamers the best experience in online gaming across the globe. Now how much salary does a AWS engineer earns? In India, it earns on an average basis 7 to 13 lakhs per annum, while in USA on an average basis, he or she can earn $137,000. The reason why Amazon is so huge is because of AWS along with its retail arm. The cloud service has a very high revenue and is growing rapidly. Now did you know that AWS IES Cloud is 10 times greater than the 14 competitors of AWS combined? Now this speaks volumes about the strong capabilities that this service possesses. AWS is basically a subsidiary of Amazon.com, which is basically the largest e-commerce company in the world, right? Uh, so the way AWS came up in the market was that Amazon, the largest e-commerce company, was building the infrastructure for its website, right? And they designed an infrastructure which was highly scalable, highly available. It can auto scale itself. It can, you know, downscale itself. So all of these things were part of their architecture of the Amazon website. Now, when they created an infrastructure like this, they thought, why are we only using it for our website? Why don't we make it available to the general public? And they can use it as long as they want in a pay as you go model. And that's how the cloud computing model or the cloud computing business came, uh, came into the uh, picture, right? So the same infrastructure that it was using for its website, it got or it made it introduced to the world to say like I am hosting my website or I'm using I'm hosting my Amazon e-commerce website on this infrastructure if you also want your application to be as successful as reliable as available as my website you can use the same infrastructure and you know what you just have to pay for the time that you used it and the cost is as low as 0. 0.0005 dollars isn't that amazing so that's how AWS came into the picture, right? And now today it offers services in compute, it offers services in storage, networking, management, security, and many more that we're going to discuss as we move along. All right, so this is the AWS story, guys. We we understand now that what is cloud computing, it, we understand now that the different kind of models that cloud follows, all of those things are followed by all the cloud providers. AWS is one of those cloud providers, and I told you the backstory of it, how it was launched, how it was accepted and since it's the first player which came in the market it's very matured in terms of its services uh, i think they have covered all their edge cases as to how our application can actually uh, not be of use to a particular company or can fail and they've covered all that so you can be rest assured that if you are deploying an application onto aws it is in safe hands just a quick info guys intellipath offers an aws certification course for solutions architect certified by nescom and it aligns with industry standards. Through this course, you can learn all the important concepts of AWS and upon completion of the course, you will receive a NESCOM certification. With this course, we have already helped thousands of professionals in successful career transition. You can check out the testimonials on our Achievers channel, whose link is given in the description below. Without a doubt, this course can set your career to new heights. So visit the course page link given below in the description and take a first step towards career growth in the field of AWS. So before understanding cloud computing, we need to understand what exactly is an internet and how internet and intranet are two different things. So if you will see uh, what is an internet, then internet is a global system of interconnected computer network that uses internet protocol to communicate between network and device. So what exactly is an internet? Internet is the global system for interconnected computers network talking and or you can say it is a way through which we can uh, share our resources we can have the communication and what exactly is in communication protocol communication protocol you can say is nothing but the rules let us say if now i'm speaking english then i should be aware about the english language rule and if i'm aware about that then only i'll be able to properly communicate Similarly, whenever our machines communicate, then they need to be aware about the communication protocol or you can say communication rule. Then only they will be able to communicate properly. So in the protocols, we are having different type of protocol and out of those UDP and TCP IP are two of those. 
Moreover, if we will see what exactly is an intranet, intranet uh, you can say is more restricted network or a network which is local or you can say it is a sort of a private network which is having very limited access worldwide. So now uh, let's see what exactly is in virtualization. So virtualization is the process of creating a virtual environment of something. That something can be your hardware platform, your storage device or your network resource. So virtualization uh, basically is the way of creating something which is not physically available but logically it is being available. Now let us say if virtualization is the technology or you can treat it like as a software. So let us say virtualization is the software that manipulates the hardware. So when we manipulate this thing then whatever we get is known as cloud computing. So this is how virtualization paves the way for our cloud computing. Now what exactly is in cloud computing? Cloud computing is the delivery of computing services like server, storage, database over the internet as per pay as you go option. So with cloud computing we can have faster innovation, flexible resource and more economic scalability. You uh, pay only for the particular resource that you use in the cloud computing. Let's have a quick quiz question guys. What is cloud computing? Your options are a method for storing data on physical servers located within an organization's premises, a technology that enables the sharing of files using Bluetooth connections, a service that allows users to access and use computing resources like servers, storage, databases over the internet on a pay-as-you-go basis, or a form of computing that relies solely on standalone offline computers. Please mention your answers in the comment section. So if we are using cloud service models, then we have three different types of model available to us. One is infrastructure as service, second one is platform as service, and the third one is software as service. In infrastructure as service, it contains the basic building block for your cloud IT it provides you with the highest level of flexibility and the management control over your IT resources. And let us say if you are using platform as service, there you are uh, not considering about the underlying infrastructure there or you can say hardware. All you are concerned about your platform, you uh, always have the focus upon deployment and management upon your application. So with this the efficiency increases if you are using platform as service because you are uh, not consi uh, considering the other aspects like procurement, capacity planning, software maintenance, patching or any other heavy lifting task. Let us say if you are using software as service then you, here you are not concerned about the software and the infrastructure that is being managed or whether the service that you are using, you are also not caring about it, whether in the backend it is being managed or not. Here in software service, all you are concerned about is how to use that particular piece of code. So if we will move back here, so we can see, let us say if you are using an on-site uh, sort of resources to manage your demand, then here you will be uh, particularly managing everything starting from your application to operating system to your hardware. But let us say if you are using infrastructure as service, then majority of the things like virtualization, server, storage and networking is being uh, managed by the cloud providers. Let us say if you move into platform as service, so uh, upon your uh, hardware and the operating systems or you can say your operating softwares are being managed by the AWS or your particular cloud provider. So you are not concerned about their thing. All you are concerned about is the particular application and the data. Let us say if you are using SaaS, then here uh, you are not concerned about the particular services or the particular uh, hardware or the software that is underlining you. You are considering about the particular usage of a software. So if we will go for a SaaS, then we can have the example of emails. Let us say if you are using an email, then all you are concerned about is typing a mail and sending it to the particular user that you want to 
uh, send the mail to so you are not considering about whether the email uh, servers are available or not you are uh, only working upon that particular thing to send the particular request and you are intended that the particular person to whom you are sending should get that mail let us say if you are using platform as service so you can basically use aws elastic beanstalk there you take your code and paste it there and after that the deployment and the running of the things and the particular time to time update is being done by the aws elastic beanstalk let us say if you are using infrastructure as service then it's just like interacting with your aws account where you create all of the resources and then try to do the things so you can also see let us say if you are having this infrastructure then you can imagine like uh, those are the tools for interacting with it then we have the platform so upon the integration of infrastructure and platform after that if we will uh, perform the specific task then we get the end uh, result and upon that end result we do the work now after this let us move in and let us see what is cloud deployment models in cloud deployment model we are having basically three different types of model one is public cloud private cloud and hybrid cloud in this particular cloud deployment model we basically try to identify the specific type of cloud environment based on ownership as well as on the cloud nature and purpose let us say if you are using public cloud then uh, anybody uh, over the internet have the access to the system and the services so using this public cloud only uh, the particular cloud infrastructure service are being made available to the general public or you can say to major industrial groups so in the public cloud if you will see the security will be less as compared to the private cloud so in the public cloud uh, you are having a lot of uh, service providers like aws microsoft azure google platform uh, and the ibm is also there let us say uh, you have you are using the private cloud then in private cloud what exactly happen is the opposite of your public cloud it is far more restricted cloud it is available only for a specific uh, particular customer or client so here you get an one on one environment and for the single user it is being designed and this particular uh, type of cloud deployment model is also known as internal cloud so uh, if you are using the private cloud then you can have better control over the resources that you use and your data security and privacy also gets enhanced now at the end we are having the hybrid cloud so hybrid cloud is a mixture of both public cloud and private cloud so if you are using hybrid cloud then you will get a good flexibility and enhanced security and the organization can move their application and data depending upon their need in between the clouds if they are using hybrid cloud so if you will see all of this uh, public and private cloud provider are also being available uh, availing the particular hybrid cloud also aws also has a hybrid cloud so if you give a specific request to the aws then you can obtain the thing similarly ibm also provide this type of cloud aws suite let us say this is an corporate data center and you are having an on premise setup and uh, let us say this is the architecture of your particular uh, network you can say or you can say your infrastructure is based upon this architecture so uh, you will be having a particular domain for the accessibility of your particular website you can say www. Uh, whatever name you want to have and let us say if they are a user so they will be interacting uh, with that and they will be accessing the thing to protect uh, from any of the unauthorized access you will be having firewalls to save the particular data you will be having databases and you will be having servers and the storage options will be available to you so whatever things are there uh, in your storage option you can take it and uh, you can uh, basically modify those things using your databases you can manipulate the data using the databases and you can store the data in the storage option for monitoring uh, the things you uh, will be having some other applications there and you will be also enabling notification to see what exactly is happening in your architecture but let us say if you are using all of these things then they will not be provided by a particular provider 
So you will be uh, have to uh, integrate a lot of things. Let us say if you are using databases, so you have to set up the things manually storage options you have to invest upon the hardware cost that is going to get incurred the domain names will be provided by someone else for the uh, monitoring purpose you will be having different application so integration of the things will take a lot of time and the availability of the architecture is also in question let us say if you require a storage uh, suddenly if the demand for the storage increases in abundance then you cannot uh, manually manage the things then you have to set up uh, the more hardwares so which uh, in the meantime can cost your organization and let us see if it, there is a particular user and if it creates a fake account then I'll, and if that particular uh, user is able to breach your network then it can create a lot of uh, unsuspicious activity in your account uh, that particular user can uh, particularly damage your architecture a lot. So apart from this, if we will see what we have in AWS suit is that in one place we are uh, able to get a lot of different services and the integration is also pretty much easy. And as because this is being provided by the AWS, so it will have encryption in every level. So it doesn't matter what service or what resource you are using. So it will be far more secure, far more flexible and far more available as compared to the previous setup. Let us say if you are having a domain and you want to manage it, you can manage it using the Route 53. Let us say if there is a particular user and that user want to access your architecture or your website. So you can particularly specify in that thing in the IAM. You can provide them with the credentials. You can even provide the permissions to them that what, what exactly is the accessibility of that particular user, what that particular user can use and what it cannot use. Let us say if you want to make your network more secure, you can definitely work in VPC. So VPC is the way in which you can create the architecture. If you not choose VPC, you will not be able to launch your machines. So definitely at the very starting point only, the security purpose uh, increases uh, enormously. And let us say there is the particular security groups and nickels to uh, check whether the things are going properly or not, whether the accessibility that you define is only going to be that much only, no more, no less. And let us say, if you need uh, more uh, storage options, more uh, virtual machines, so the scaling up of the thing will be far more easier and it will be far more available as compared to the previous setup. Let us say if you want to uh, monitor the things, what is the logs that is being incurred, how is your account been functioning, then you can definitely use CloudWatch, even CloudTrail also you can use and there you can also check whether any suspicious activity is being registered in your account or not. Let us say if you want to have the notification, you can use the SNS service that is being available. Apart from that, you also have the option of SQS and SES. So all of these things you get in AWS. So integrating the things and the security aspect also increases in abundance. So if you will go with this. Let's have a quick quiz question, guys. What is AWS suit? Your options are a collection of popular video streaming services, a suit of cloud computing services offered by Amazon Web Services, a bundle of office productivity software from Amazon, or a specialized suit for online gaming by Amazon. Please mention your answers in the comment section. Just a quick info, guys. IntelliPath offers an AWS certification course for solutions architect certified by NSCOM and it aligns with industry standards. Through this course, you can learn all the important concepts of AWS and upon completion of the course, you will receive a NSCOM certification. With this course, we have already helped thousands of professionals in successful career transition. You can check out the testimonials on our Achievers channel whose link is given in the description below. Without a doubt, this course can set your career to new heights. So visit the course page link given below in the description and take a first step towards career growth in the field of AWS. Virtualization in AWS. So what exactly is a virtualization? Virtualization is the process of creating a virtual environment of something. That something can be your hardware or it can be your storage device also or your uh, network resources you can say that so now let us say if we are using virtualization then there are a lot of advantages what are the advantage it saves up uh, space as well as operating cost moreover uh, it will enable us with the easy management of our data center 
Now there are different types of virtualization like hardware virtualization, application virtualization, server virtualization, storage virtualization, network virtualization and desktop virtualization. But uh, here in virtualization in AWS, we will be focusing on our hardware virtualization. Now if we will look into an hypervisor, what exactly is an hypervisor? Hypervisor is a hardware virtualization technique that allows us to uh, basically run multiple uh, guest operating system on a single host system on same time. The hypervisors uh, you can also say is also known as virtual machine manager. Now coming on to type 1 hypervisors. Uh, basically, uh, there are two types of hypervisors. Uh, one is type 1 and type 2. So let us first discuss about type 1 hypervisor. Type 1 hypervisor is also known as native and bare metal that you can uh, see from the picture. From the picture, you are also able to see uh, one thing is that in type 2 hypervisor, we are having an operating system, but the same is not applicable with type 1. So type 1 hypervisors run directly on underlining host system. It has direct access to hardware resource. It does not uh, require any uh, base server operating systems. You can say that. So as it does not require any base operating system, so it is far more efficient uh, because it has direct accessibility to the hardware uh, components like CPU, memory network and physical storage. The only you can say the disadvantage that we get with type 1 hypervisor is we need to have a dedicated separate machine to run the instruction. So if you will uh, look for the examples of type 1 hypervisor, then you can go with VMware EX1 uh, 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 particular hypervisor is an example. Microsoft hypervisor 5 is an example of that. Now let us discuss about what is type 2 hypervisor. It is also known as hosted hypervisor. The only difference that you will find in type 1 and in type 2 is that uh, here in type 2, our hypervisor does not uh, directly interact with an, our hardware. We are having an operating system in between that. So that is what happens in type 2 hypervisor. Type 2 hypervisor runs on an underlining uh, resource. This does not run directly over the underlining resource, but uh, rather it runs as an application in host system. So uh, and software is already installed in our operating system. And using this uh, particular software, the hypervisor make operating system. Uh, basically, it reaches out to operating system and ask to make hardware calls. So basically, type 2 hypervisor is useful for the engineers or you can say security analysts to check the malware and the newly developed application. So if you will look in, type 1 hypervisor uh, is far more efficient or you can say is far more better performing as compared to type 2 hypervisor because in type 1 hypervisor we don't have any middleman but type 2 hypervisor is easy to set up and can be set up quickly in test driven environment. Now after this uh, let's move forward and let us see what is Zen hypervisor. So Zen hypervisor is a type 1 hypervisor which provides services that allows multiple computer uh, operating system to execute on same computer hardware concurrently. So uh, Zen hypervisors run in more privileged CPU state than any other uh, software on machine except the firmware. So you can say that um, being in uh, type 1 hypervisor, whatever features that are being available in our type 1 hypervisor, uh, Zen hypervisor have all of those things. You can see AWS uses the particular Zen. Top three cloud providers for the time being that's Microsoft Azure, AWS and GCP. So AWS is Amazon Web Services. Microsoft Azure is a particular you can say service uh, provider which is being powered by Microsoft. AWS is being powered by Amazon.com and GCP that is Google Cloud, Cloud Platform is being uh, specified or you can say is being powered by Google. So Microsoft Azure was initially launched in 2010. Similarly, AWS was launched in 2006 and GCP was launched in 2008. So being the oldest cloud provider, AWS has more availability zones and uh, you, even you can see more number of availability zones, they are also rolling out. Similarly, Azure has 54 regions and uh, it is available in 140 countries. 
दो जे सी पी ऑल्सो गॉट लॉन्च इन टू ओ एट बट मेजोरिटी ऑफ इट सर्विसेज हैव बिन स्टार्टेड टू रोल आउट वेरी रिसेंटली सो यू कैन थिंक जे सी पी इज वेरी न्यू इन दिस पर्टिकुलर अरिना नाउ इफ एल मूव फॉरवर्ड नाउ इफ यू विल सी द मार्केट शेयर एंड द ग्रोथ रेट करेंटली ए डब्ल्यू एस इज द लीडिंग मार्केट शेयर इट इज द फ्रंट रनर इन द पर्टिकुलर क्लाउड प्रोवाइडिंग डोमेन आफ्टर दैट वी हैव अज्योर एंड देन वी आर हैविंग जी सी पी सो नाउ इफ यू विल लुक इन टू ए डब्ल्यू एस ए डब्ल्यू एस बींग द ओल्डेस्ट क्लाउड प्रोवाइडर सो इट हैज मोर नंबर ऑफ फीचर्स इट इज अवेलेबल इन मोर अवेलेबिलिटी जोन एंड इवन मोर नंबर ऑफ रीजन्स आर इवन बींग इन रोल आउट फेज सो ए डब्ल्यू एस ऑल्सो प्रोवाइड्स बेटर सिक्योरिटी एज कंपेयर टू इट्स अदर peers and the particular if you will see the documentation part of aws is also very good though aws does not have its own tools so it relies upon third party for the tools but uh, the users are pretty happy with the things because it's working very smoothly so if you will see the major uh, you can say the client for the aws are netflix airbnb unilever bmw samsung mi and there are many more and the only part where aws misses out is the complex billing architecture now if we will uh, look into the azure aspect so azure uh, works uh, being in the hybrid cloud just like uh, our aws works in public cloud so majority of the fortune 500 companies are the client of microsoft azure microsoft azure has a very good integration of the azure platform with its microsoft product but it lacks in the integration part when it comes to non microsoft product and the billing aspect of the azure is uh, you can say is good as compared to the aws but the documentation aspect is not good in uh, terms of azure you can say that and after that if we will move forward we are having google so google is very new in this field but it is the leader in ml and ai tools so it has smaller uh, global presence but if you will look in they have very good documentation and videos if you want to cover the gcp aspect now if you look into aws for past 11 year aws is the current market leader in cloud domain as per the gartner chart and even being the oldest so aws has the better community support as compared to its peers let's have a quick quiz question guys which of the following statements about ec2 instances is true your options are they are primarily used for storing large data sets they are virtual servers that can be used to run applications in the cloud they can only be used for batch processing tasks or they do not support scaling based on demand please mention your answers in the comment section Just a quick info, guys. Intellipath offers an AWS certification course for solutions architect certified by NSCOM, and it aligns with industry standards. Through this course, you can learn all the important concepts of AWS, and upon completion of the course, you will receive a NSCOM certification. With this course, we have already helped thousands of professionals in successful career transition. You can check out the testimonials on our Achievers channel, whose link is given in the description below. Without a doubt, this course can set your career to new heights. So visit the course page link given below in the description and take a first step towards career growth in the field of AWS. What is an EC2? So let's go and let's explore the things. So basically EC2 is Elastic Compute Cloud. You can think it like an uh, computing resource that you get or you can think it like a virtual server that is being available to you. Let us say if you are uh, sitting physically and if you want to interact with your website so you need a physical machine in that machine you need operating systems you need different types of cpu processor and all of those things so let us say if you want to use all of those things virtually then you can use amazon ec2 basically amazon ec2 is this service and inside this service we will be interacting with a particular resource known as ec2 instance and there we can build our virtual machine so ec2 is a computing capacity that is scalable in amazon web services cloud using amazon ec2 eliminates the need to invest in 
hardware upfront allowing you to develop and deploy application more quickly how exactly can we do all of these things because if we are using the cloud then we can scale up or scale down the resources very quickly and we also have the provisioning method uh, that is being given to us so we can do all of those things very quickly now if we will see what are the features of ec2 first of all as i told you instances are virtual computing environment so how is it helpful to us let us say if you are working currently in a particular machine having the operating system ubuntu now let us say your needs are changed and now you need to shift to windows then if it is your physical machine then there are two options available one you have to download some virtual box and upon that you have to install the windows or entirely you have to buy a new system but let us say if you are having a particular physical system and there you are able to access the cloud computing then you can basically launch a particular instance of whatever operating systems you need so basically instances are virtual computing environment so virtually you can do these things after that you have the amazon machine image so amazon machine image are nothing but uh, they are the iso file or in more simpler terms these are the operating systems let us say if you are interacting physically with your machine then you might be having windows or mac os similarly if you are creating a particular virtual machine there you can choose this particular ami option under this ami option you can get amazon linux ubuntu linux red hat linux mac os and windows uh, type of operating system and depending upon your need you can use it and you can even create a image of that from the existing machine after that if you will look into instance type let us say uh, if you are having a physical machine then there you will be having different types of uh, memory storage being available to you your storage options will be there your networking capacity will be there your particular processors will be there like i5 or i7 similarly if you are choosing the instance type there you get uh, all of this option you can basically choose how many virtual cpus you require what is the memory that you require so all of those things are being availed to you from the ec2 after that if you will look uh, there is also key pairs which are very essential let us say if you want to launch a particular machine then if you are having the particular key pair then only you can launch the ec2 so basically that enhance enhances the securitical aspect of the thing now we'll move forward now let us try to understand what exactly is elastic mean when we say elastic compute cloud so elasticity basically mean to particularly uh, go on with the capacity to manage the capacity let's say currently if i am having a lot of user interacting with my architecture so a lot of load is upon my particular machine so but dynamically my ec2 instances or my ec2 service should be able to manage those things so that is what elasticity means it will either provision or deprovision the resources depending upon the traffic or you can say depending upon the load let us say now you can see if the number of users decreases then the particular resources it need to free up and let us say if the number of users increases then it should be able to get uh, more number of resources dynamically it should expand or it should contract so regions and availability zones so why is it important to know about regions and availability zones because there will be few services which will be region specific and there will be few services which are global let us say if you are interacting with ec2 service then that particular service is an regional service but let us say if you are interacting with s3 service then that particular service is going to be global so now let us understand what exactly is an region so you can see uh, these are the particular regions that have been available uh, for the time being in the green color you can see these things and the red are the ones that are going to come up so a lot of uh, new regions are being uh, and going to be enrolled by the aws so now let's try to understand what exactly is an region let us say uh, here is a particular name that is known as north virginia north california mumbai frankfurt or tokyo so those are known as regions so what uh, happens in region uh, regions are those geographical location where our aws data center lies now the things come what is an particular availability zone let us say in north virginia you can see it is also known as us east 1 there we will be having uh, availability zones 
So what are the availability zones? You can say US East 1A, US East 1B, US East 1C, 1D, 1E and 1F are known as availability zones. So each region is independent of one another. So we are having availability zone because let us say if one particular availability zone goes down then there will be other availability zones to maintain the flow of the state of whatever architecture we are having so that basically our particular website does not go down or our architecture is available for most of the time. Let us say if uh, we want to reduce the latency then we can do it if we are having our particular servers running in different uh, availability zones if one of the availability zones goes down then the other will come into the picture and we will be getting an uninterrupted service for whatever thing we are using so this is what region and availability zones are ec2 instance type so before that uh, let us understand what exactly is an instance type so instance type is a combination of uh, cpu memory storage and networking capacity it gives you the flexibility to choose the uh, approximate uh, minimum resource for your particular application let us say if you are having a physical machine so in a physical machine apart from your operating system you have a lot of different specifications like you might be having the storage options that is being available to you you will be having the uh, networking setting option that is being given to you similarly you will be uh, also having uh, CPUs running. So let us say if you are uh, trying to create a virtual machine. So while creating a virtual machine you need to specify all of these things because we have seen let us say if you are creating a virtual machine. So you get the option of choosing an AMI. Similarly you will be also uh, getting the option of choosing the particular specifications for your particular machine. So now if we will move forward and if we will see here then in instance type uh, we get uh, five different type of instance type general purpose, memory optimized, storage optimized, accelerated computing and compute optimized. Now if we will uh, go for the general purpose instance type here you will get a mixture of everything. It can be uh, memory, you will uh, get uh, relatively uh, storage options, you will also get the option of uh, managing the particular load so in general purpose uh, you basically get a mixture of memory storage networking everything you get uh, not very much but yeah in a limit it will be in a packed manner it will be available to you and if you will go for the memory optimized from its name it is very much uh, explanatory if you are going for the memory optimized then the memory that you will be getting will be uh, pretty much more as compared to the other instance type that is being available. Similarly, if you go for uh, storage optimized, then the storage uh, class you will get a lot as compared to the other particular aspects. Uh, now, if we will uh, look into the accelerated computing, here uh, we basically use it for, uh, let us say, if there is a sudden spike in the particular users that is coming to your architecture or to your traffic. Let us say now uh, currently with your website two users are interacting and in next two minutes 10,000 users came up. So suddenly the interaction of the user has gone tremendously up. So there you can use your accelerated computing. Now comes uh, when exactly do we use compute optimized. We use compute optimized in those particular scenarios where uh, we need a high performing CPUs. So if you need a high performing architecture then you can definitely go for compute optimized. So what is an AMI? AMI is basically Amazon machine image. So you can think AMI is uh, like an ISO file or uh, in more uh, layman term you can think AMI is like an operating system that you choose for your particular machine. Let us say if you are having your physical machine. So there you have the operating system that has been working upon. And because of this operating system you are able to uh, interact with the hardware and you are able to do the things definitely GUI will be also there. So if you are choosing the uh, AMI then basically you are specifying what type of operating system your particular machine should be having. It can be Mac OS, it can be Windows, it can be Red Hat Linux, it can be Ubuntu or it can be Amazon Linux as well. So 
if you are choosing the ami not only you are choosing the operating system but also you are choosing the architecture it can be 64 bit architecture or your 32 bit architecture or arm 64 is also being supported uh, so that depends upon what type of ami you are choosing and upon that it will be given if you are selecting the ami with that ami a particular storage options also get attached with it storage uh, in this sense you can say a root volume will be there and this particular root volume will be a ebs type only and let us say if you are uh, choosing this ami so based upon this uh, ami it will uh, dictate how exactly will you be using the things so this ami uh, you can say is an important aspect if you are uh, going to choose a particular machine how exactly let us say right now you are upon your particular system and suddenly your requirement changes now let us say in your physical system you are having windows and now you want to use mac os so there are two way out to use that either you can install the virtual box and you can uh, basically install the mac os in that or else you have to entirely buy a new system for using the mac os but let us say if you are having the access to the cloud then simply you can uh, choose the ami and start using a particular uh, machine of your type so whatever way uh, whatever thing you want to have you can use that so now if we will look in uh, creating and copying an ami so if uh, you will be uh, able to launch a instance then then you will get the option of uh, creating an ami out of the particular instance so now the question come why exactly are we creating the uh, ami let us say if you are having a particular machine and your machine is somehow uh, due to some error it is not working but if you could somehow able to trace back your particular operating systems or whatever architecture it was in then let us say if you take that operating system put it in some other system then you can say that you have actually replicated your previous machine which was not working so that is the particular advantage that we get if we are able to copy our ami because instance replication is not supported in the aws but let us say if you are able to create the ami of a instance then you can do it you can do the replication let us say if your particular instance is present in one region then you can uh, with the help of the ami you can launch uh, another instance in different region with the help of aim let's have a quick quiz question guys and your question is what does abs stands for your options are elastic block store elastic backup service elastic business system or elastic block storage please mention your answers in the comment section just a quick info guys intellipath offers an aws certification course for solutions architect certified by nascom and it aligns with industry standards through this course you can learn all the important concepts of aws and upon completion of the course you will receive a nascom certification With this course we have already helped thousands of professionals in successful career transition you can check out the testimonials on our achievers channel whose link is given in the description below without a doubt this course can set your career to new heights so visit the course page link given below in the description and take a first step towards career growth in the field of aws public ip and elastic ip so what exactly is an public ip so let us say if you have launched a instance and it is in the public subnet then you are going to get the public ip this public ip is not associated with your account but let us say if you are using an elastic ip then that particular elastic ip is going to be associated with your particular account now comes the thing that if you are using public ip then it can be basically get freed once you uh, stop your instances let us say if you are having a particular ip and uh, it is associated with your particular instance you stop your instance it get freed up and once it is free it can be used by other but let us say if you have associated a particular elastic ip with your instance till the time you don't free it it will not get free so if you are using in elastic ip as it is being available to you every time till the time you don't release it so it is also chargeable but the public ip is not chargeable so now let us try to understand why exactly are we in need of of elastic ip let us say if there is a particular company aws 
and uh, they have a domain aws.com let us say if they are having a particular public uh, sorry elastic ip they can basically map their domain name to that particular public uh, to that elastic ip so whenever someone will type aws.com or even if let us say if they in the future changes their domain name to something else let us say to aws.com to aws.tk if they are having that elastic ip they can map n number of domain name to that particular elastic ip and all of the traffic will be then redirected to the particular website they want but let us say if you are using the public ip every time they uh, stop their instance of or you can say if their particular website does not function properly so public ip can get lost then the uh, direction of the particular traffic can be can go to anywhere and they will not be able to properly manage it so if you are having a particular elastic ip associated with your particular domain name so you can uh, map n number of domain names to the particular architecture you want so uh, that is what public ip do and your elastic ip uh, do now if we will uh, move forward and if we will see here now let us see what exactly is an elastic network interface it doesn't matter whether it is your physical machine or your virtual machine you will be having an uh, elastic network interface so basically let us say this is the particular first point of interaction of your machine to the internet if you are uh, trying to uh, get the internet or you can say if you are trying to make the connection then the from your particular machine the first point of connection will be done through the network interface card only your network interface contain elastic ip public ip private ip and the security group of your machine we have already discussed what is elastic ip a particular elastic ip which is static it uh, does not get released till the time you don't release it public ip is attached with your machine if you stop your machines then it will uh, going to get free and it is going to be allocated to someone else private ip is the internal ip of your particular machine and what are security groups security groups are nothing but the virtual firewall that is being present in your machine so ec2 is uh, is a particular service that is being available to us and in this service i am going to use this instance resource so basically this instance is nothing but a virtual machine so if i want to work uh, with anything let us say if i want to work with my website then i need a virtual machine available with me then only i'll be able to work so what i'll do i'll go into instance and right now i don't have any instance running so i will create a instance of mine i'll click on this uh, launch instance at the very beginning i have to specify the name uh, let me give it a name let us say shub after uh, this what i'll do i have to choose an ami so before moving forward we need to understand what exactly is this an ami is so uh, basically this ami is uh, nothing but a type of an iso file you can think like that or you can think like uh, it as a like an operating system that you are choosing for your machines i get different types of operating system i can choose amazon linux i can choose mac os i can choose ubuntu or i can even choose windows but in this session i'll be choosing ubuntu this ami uh, contains uh, every information that we require for launching an instance just like let us say if you are having a physical system there you have operating system it can be either windows or it can be upon mac os so similarly when we will be launching our virtual machine we also have to specify the type of uh, particular virtual machine uh, operating system we want and here i will be choosing ubuntu after this i'll move forward i will uh, not do any changes to here and make sure to choose uh, the type of uh, ami which are having this free tier eligible criteria only or else you might get charged so if i will choose of ubuntu you can see in ubuntu i am having this as free tier eligible this type of architecture is also having a free tier eligible if i'll move to the end i am also having uh, ubuntu server 18.04 lts as also uh, my free tier eligible similarly if i would have chosen amazon linux so here also i might be getting two or three different types of free tier eligible so if you are choosing any of those make sure to choose a free tier eligible only or else you might get built 
Yeah. So let me show you. Yes. So here it is. You can choose only the free tier. You can definitely choose other one, but uh, it's better to go with the free tier eligible, or else you might get charged. After this, uh, similarly, just like we have architectures here, also in the virtual machines, uh, the architecture comes up. We will not do any changes here. Now we will come into an instance type. Now before uh, selecting an instance type, we need to understand what exactly is an instance type. So instance type is nothing but a combination of you can say CPU, memory, storage, and networking capacity. Okay. So let us say if you are having a virtual server. So there, let us say if you are working on a Windows operating system. So apart from operating system, uh, you have a lot of different things uh, that is being you can say fixed in your machines like the type of processors you go like you can have i5 i7 processor you can have some generations based upon that so similarly instance type will do that work uh, if you are choosing a particular instance type you can get different types of uh, virtual cpus you will be getting different types of memories and depending upon your need you can choose in this uh, demo session we will be choosing t2.micro why because it is comes under free tier eligible criteria apart from this you don't get uh, any other instance type having free tier eligible criteria now after this uh, what i'll do i will have to make a key pair so now uh, let us understand what is an key pair basically key pair is a type of a security credentials that you get uh, let us say if you are creating a uh, instance then you have to specify this key pair only if you have this key pair then only you will be able to log in into your instance or else you will not be able to do uh, the type of uh, key pair let us say if i will move into here create a new key pair if i will move here then you can uh, see i have to type a particular key pair name so uh, let me write a name let us say shub i am working in north virginia so i'll specify that uh, north virginia demo key what okay so uh, this is the name of my key pair here also you, you can see the thing you will need it later to connect to instance so whenever you will try to uh, connect to your instance you need this key pair and the key type that i will have is uh, rsa and the particular uh, format of my private key file will be dot pem okay and this uh, ppk is for Putty, when we will be working with putty, we will see how to convert this PAM into putty. So the, this key pair that I am creating right now is the private key. Okay. And there are two types of key that I will be having. One is public and one is private. I will be having this private key with me and the particular public key will be there with AWS and it will resides in my machine. Whenever I will try to connect to my machine, then AWS will check whether my private key is matching with my public key or not if everything goes well and fine then only i'll be able to connect it after this i will click on create key pair so right now uh, this particular pam file has been downloaded after this what i'll do i will uh, move into this i'll move into network settings for the time being i will not do any changes here but yes uh, in this security group what i will do i'll move here and in the type i will keep it all traffic so why exactly I am keeping all traffic because uh, now you need to understand if I am having all traffic that means I am allowing connection of my machine through any port and uh, it will be able to connect from anywhere. Okay. So uh, for the timing you can choose this once we will move forward then you will be able to understand much more better that why uh, exactly the security groups are having different types of port but for the timing you can uh, just keep in mind that security groups are nothing but they act like a virtual firewall for your machine so here i am specifying okay through whatever ports i want my machine to get connected it can get connected after this what i'll do i'll go down i'll not do any changes here is the summary of the thing if you want you can review it and after reviewing the things you can simply click on launch instance and it will uh, get launched yeah so now it has got launched if i'll click on view all instance then you can see uh, right now it will be in pending state and after some time it will be available how to connect our ec2 instance uh, using directly from the aws management console and we will also look in how to connect our ec2 instance from a putty so uh, let us start uh, right now uh, in the previous session we have 
already launched an instance uh, at that time the instance state was not in available but now it is uh, running you can see moreover uh, this status checks has also been passed it will take some time for that you can wait for that and once it is passed now we can move forward so after launching the instance you can see a lot of uh, information that is being available to you like the public ip the private ip and the instance id is also being provided to you moreover whatever vpc it is in those things will be also visible to you the instance type that we have chosen there will be also now visible to you the vpc id and everything you can see after this uh, the security group if you will uh, move in you can see that this was the security group which we have chosen launch wizard 13 here we have allowed all traffic so that is also now available similarly you can choose each and everything uh, available here so let us see how exactly to connect this ec2 instance so simply i will uh, choose my instance after choosing it i'll go into connect and here I will be getting a four different types of options, but I'll be choosing EC2 instance connect. After that, I'll click on connect. Now uh, the things will be now connected. Yeah. So now I have successfully connected it. And uh, now after connecting, the very first step that you should be doing after connecting your machine is updating it. How to update it? You can type a particular command sudo apt get update. And uh, this will particularly update your machine uh, just like in your virtual um, in your physical machines you do refresh once you start a new session similarly uh, we will be updating our machine uh, what is the significance uh, of this step let us say uh, if you are having a physical machine so why do we exactly uh, refresh our machine so that if any port or if any terminal is busy in some work and if the efficacy of our machine is not that much uh, if we want to uh, restore that efficacy or efficiency we can use that similarly if I want my machines to be available if any updates are being there it should be updated if any port is uh, not working properly if all the connections I want to have properly then I can use this command sudo apt get update the significance of this particular thing sudo is that uh, let us say if I am using a particular software there are two options either you can straight away open it and start using it or there is an another option of uh, run as an administrator so why uh, do we get the option of run as an administrator while working with any of our uh, software because there are certain privileges those are being reserved only for the administrator similarly if i will try to update the machine without this sudo it will tell me okay you don't have the permissions to do that that's why I will type here sudo so that I will specify to my machine that okay I am a super user do basically I am an administrator and I should get uh, the particular you can say facility to update my machine and uh, to update it uh, the package from where I will be updating it okay the thing from which I will get the update is being residing upon here apt get update after this what I will do I will hit enter so it will update my machine so now my machine is being updated now let us see how to connect our machine using putty basically putty is a third party uh, software uh, that you get okay so if you want to use putty then you have to download putty once you will download putty uh, with that uh, putty gen by default will come so what i'll do first i will show you uh, what exactly will putty gen do uh, this is putty gen okay you have to download this thing Putty, you have to download from it from the web browser you can download it and once you download it uh, then you have to uh, basically uh, put your PAM file here if you people uh, might be remembering the particular type of file that we have chosen for our machine is a dot PAM file okay this one will be having a dot PAM uh, file extension at the end when we have downloaded it but if you want to work with your putty then we need to have a .ppk file because ppk stands for putty private key file so my pam file uh, i have to convert it into .ppk file and once i convert it then only i'll be able to use it so what i have to do i ha i will go to my putty gen after moving into putty gen i'll click on load and once i will uh, click on uh, load i will uh, go into downloads and here i will do it all files so once I'll do it all files, I will be able to see the .pem file that I have created. I'll click on open. 
after this a pop up will happen i'll click on okay and here what i'll do i'll click on a save private key after this it will ask again a pop up will happen i'll click on yes and after this i have to uh, save it okay the particular name that i have given for that uh, the same one i'll keep it and uh, the only thing uh, that i will change here is i will uh, not have a dot pem here because i need a particular ppk file yeah so it is here after this i'll click it uh, save and it has now got saved okay so after this what i'll do i'll open my patti so this is the uh, patti that i need to open so after opening patti what i need to give i need to give the public ip of my machine so i will take the public ip of my machine i will select my machine after selecting it i will take the public ip of my machine after that i will paste it here and after pasting it i will move into ssh from here i will move into authorization and from here i'll browse in and i'll be able to see it make it all files okay let me check in uh, where exactly it is so okay, so here it is so i'll choose it i'll click on open and after this i'll click on open so i'll be getting this pop up and that means that everything is successfully done so i'll then click on accept after this i will type here ubuntu as uh, my login why i am typing here ubuntu uh, it is because uh, the type of machine that i have chosen here is ubuntu and if you want to know how to see the username you can go into connect and here you will be able to find the username that is ubuntu so after this i will uh, hit enter and i have successfully uh, logged in into my ubuntu if you want uh, we have already updated our machine uh, so if you are uh, getting into the patti and this is the first time you are get, trying to log in into your instance then you should update it then the same command you have to paste here sudo apt get update after that you have to hit enter so it will update our machine the small updation has only come because uh, we have already done the updation earlier so i am currently in i have logged in into my aws management console and now i will be moving into resources of instance so um, here i will uh, create an entirely a new uh, instance so i'll first move into launch an instance after uh, moving into launch an instance uh, i'll be specifying a name let us say i am doing it for windows so let me choose windows so uh, after choosing the name here comes the important uh, aspect that we need to see the ami in this session uh, we will be going with windows ami and uh, what is an ami if we will look a ami is nothing but uh, it is a type of an operating system uh, that you choose for your machine ami also contain every information that you require for launching an instance similarly uh, this is because an virtual server so we are choosing the ami uh, if it would have been a physical server that you people or me will be working upon we can also have the same type of operating system that you want either you can go with mac os windows or whatever you like so here i am choosing windows after that i will keep it under the free tier eligible criteria only or else i might get billed so i will not do any changes here i want the latest version to be uh, enabled so i will go with whatever default setting it is be after this the instance type i will be choosing t2.micro only because this is the only instance type which is uh, available under free tier eligible criteria and what is an instance type instance type is basically a combination of cpu storage and uh, other lot of things uh, let us say if you are having a virtual machine and if you are uh, purchasing a sorry if you are purchasing a physical machine having an windows operating system after that you see a lot of specification what are those specification it can have i5 or i7 processor it can be a 9th gen or a 7th gen uh, operating an operating system enabled machine similarly uh, if you want to have a lot of different types of virtual cpus memories that thing you can choose using the instance type but currently will be working on with t2 dot micro because it is present under free tier eligible criteria after this uh, we will be uh, looking into key pairs uh, what is an key pair basically uh, when we will go in 
and create a new key pair uh, let us say so let me give a name let us say it is windows so what basically is this key pair is uh, basically it is a private uh, key pair that is being given to me in the pam format okay so what is the significance of this key pair let us say if i am launching my machine then uh, this key pair uh, will be matched with my public key the particular key pair that i will download now will be a private key pair okay private key file it will be but whenever i will try to launch an in instance then this private key file will be checked on with a public key file so there will be two type of file one will be public one will be private the private will be with me and the public will reside with my instance so whenever i will specify this private key then it, the particular aws will check whether the private key and the public key are matching or not basically you can remember key pair is a type of an credential that is been given to us and if you want to launch an instance then you need to specify the particular key pair if you are not having a key pair you can click on simply create a key pair okay you can click on it and after this it will uh, get downloaded after this i will uh, not do any more further changes i will keep whatever uh, it is in the default setting after that i will just go down and i'll click on uh, launch instance how to connect our ec2 of windows type so i'll refresh it so you are able to see that uh, currently the instance state is running and the status check has also been got passed so after this what i'll do i'll uh, select my particular machine after selecting it i'll go into connect so here i have to go into rdp client after going into rdp client uh, for connecting our machine i need a remote desktop file so i will click on download so my remote uh, desktop file has now got download what i'll do i'll open it so after opening it i will uh, click on connect but uh, before uh, connecting it what i'll do is that i will get the password of it so what i'll do i'll click on get password so if i'll click on uh, password then it will ask me okay upload your private key file so i'll click on upload and once i'll click on upload i will uh, move into the particular location where i am having the particular key uh, so this is the particular private key that i require windows.pem so i'll select it and after this i'll click on open so this private key uh, will get uh, pasted here after this i'll click on decrypt password so after this if you will see i have got the password so after this i will come back to my remote desktop connection and after that i'll click on connect so uh, it will open up uh, with all of the things that it requires and after it uh, what i have to do i have to uh, specify the password only here you can see the public dns is already uh, taken care of and the username is administrator so if you people can see that the username is administrator and that is also being reflected so after this all i have to do is to give it the password i have copied the password uh, i will go into a remote desktop file i'll just simply paste it and after that i'll click on ok and after that it will uh, ask me for few verifications and i'll do that and once i select every yes option then i'll be able to connect into my particular windows uh, ec2 so now it will prepare up so this is a major uh, benefit of you can say of cloud uh, here if uh, i would have taken some other thing let us say virtual box or uh, there what if i would have tried to install an operating system of windows type then it would be consuming my resources but here uh, you can see uh, this is the major benefit that i get using cloud i am using an aws account and upon browser i am uh, running this particular uh, you can say the operating system based upon windows this is my ec2 and here i am running my windows and after this uh, you can basically give the permissions and after this you can just move in and do whatever you want if you want to open the chrome uh, you can open it so whatever want uh, work you want to do uh, you can do it starting from here you can open your chrome and uh, you can do whatever you want
there is an another way also to connect to your uh, particular RDP. Okay, I'll show you that also. So let me minimize this. Uh, in my system, uh, if you people are using Windows, then you people uh, will be having a remote desktop file. You can either open it. So this is an another way of connecting uh, to your machine. You can uh, take the public DNS. After uh, taking the public DNS, you can paste it here. After uh, pasting the public DNS, you can just simply click on connect. So it will ask for the password. Uh, you can take the password. And once you take the password, you just paste it here and then you can click on OK. And if you are having a remote desktop file, if you are using Windows, then you will be having definitely having a remote desktop file. So you can also connect it using this. Okay, so another connection has was in progress, so that's why I'm not able to do it. So let me show you that also. Let me stop the previous connection that I am having. Okay, let me try it again. Okay, so let me try to connect it once again. I will be pasting the password again. After that, I will click on OK. Now I have successfully uh, logged in using this RDP also. So these are the two ways through which you can connect. Uh, if anyone is using Mac OS, then what they have to do, they have to go to the iStore and from there, they have to download the remote desktop file because in Mac OS, the particular remote desktop file is uh, not downloaded by default. You have to download it and after that you have to give the public DNS name. And you have to give the username after that you have to give the password and you will be able to connect it how to create an ami and uh, how to uh, copy it into an another region so for doing that what i'll do i'll go into launch instance so let me launch a particular uh, machine of ubuntu type so i will name it as ubuntu after naming it as ubuntu i'll choose the ubuntu ami after choosing the Ubuntu AMI, I will choose a key pair. So uh, let me choose the key pair that I have created. So here it is. Uh, so I will choose it. And after choosing the key pair, I will not do any other changes. I don't require it. So after that, I will click on launch instance. So now I am going to do all instance. So right now uh, it is in pending state, this one. So once it will be in running state, then I shall be moving forward. So now the thing comes is that why actually are we trying to copy an AMI? That is basically uh, because uh, we cannot uh, take a machine from uh, one region to another region. But uh, just think, let us say if I am having a machine, so I cannot uh, take it, it from one region. This is, uh, I am currently working in North Virginia. Let us say if I want to take uh, this machine, into an another region though i cannot take it but if i will be somehow able to take the operating system of this machine or you can say ami of this machine then you can say that i am able to replicate this machine into an another region so that is what the significance of ami copying will do so i will select my machine after that i will go into action here in the action i get an option of image and template i will go into image and I will click on create image. After that, I will uh, give it a name. Uh, let me give it a name somewhat like uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu AMI copy. After that, uh, if you want to give a description, you can give it. Uh, let me give it uh, copying AMI. And after that, uh, we need not do any other things. So what I'll do, I'll click on uh, create image. So after uh, clicking on create image, if I will now move into AMI, you are able to see this is the image that uh, we have just created. Okay. So here you can see the AMI name and that we have given uh, Ubuntu AMI copy. I misspelled the copy, no worries in that. So right now the state is pending. 
can see uh, other details uh, right out there. So let me give it a name. So let me give it a name. Let us say Ubuntu copy. To copy and I'll save. Now uh, the currently this date is in pending. So I shall wait. Once it will be available, then we will look in for more things. Okay. So uh, I waited for a few minutes and now uh, the particular state is available. Okay. So once you have the AMI, uh, you can do a lot of different things. You can uh, simply uh, launch an instance if you want. But uh, before doing that, what I will do, I will try to copy the AMI. So I will click on copy AMI. The AMI name uh, will come automatically. So now you have to choose the destination region. Uh, let me choose uh, destination region of Oregon. I will choose it. And after that I will click on copy AMI. So you can see the AMI copy operation uh, for the particular AMI ID is initiated. It can take few minutes for AMI to get copied. So if now I will move into Oregon region. So you will be able to see the particular AMI that we have created there is being available here. So if I will uh, name it, let us say Ubuntu, Ubuntu AMI. So I will save it now. I shall, uh, okay, so the state is pending right now. Uh, if, now what I can do, if I want to launch the instance from the AMI, I will be able to do it, but it will uh, not allow me because for the timing, if I'll go and if I'll start launching it, uh, it uh, will give me an error because uh, the state is currently in the pending state. Okay, the AMI state is now in pending. So now what I'll do is that I shall wait, and once the AMI will be. Uh, in the available state I shall then see. So I waited for a few minutes and now you can see that uh, it is available. So once it is available then I shall go and launch an instance from the AMI. So here uh, the very significant step that you will notice here is that uh, let us say if I am creating a particular instance let me give it a name Ubuntu. So if I will try to create an AMI this time I don't get the option of selecting any AMI because I already have an AMI that is being selected. So this is what you get when you already have an AMI. Apart from that you have to give a key pair and after giving the key pair you can simply uh, click on launch instance. So let me do the things. I think I already have a key pair in this region. So yeah, so let me select it and uh, after that what you can do can simply uh, launch an instance and the particular instance will be available to you. So if I go here and view all instance, so this particular instance is now available to me. So this is how you can copy an AMI and you can launch the instance. So ABS is Elastic Block Store or you can also say it Elastic Block Store. So basically this is an raw and unformatted storage option that is being available to you. Let us say if you are having your physical machine, in your physical machine you are having a RAM. So RAM as we all know is the fast accessible memory that is being uh, available to your machine. Similarly EBS is uh, similarly EBS acts like a RAM to your virtual machine. It is the fast accessible uh, memory to your virtual machine. So that is what EBS is. So and other thing that let us say if you want to use your EBS then at the beginning you have to format it because it does not comes with the formatted option. So you have to format it then only you will be able to start using it. Let us say uh, if you are using your root volume which is being attached to your machine while launching your instance then that root volume is already in the formatted manner but let us say if you attach the EBS manually then you have to format the EBS first then only you will be able to use it. Now if we will look into the uh, feature of EBS then uh, there are a lot of features. The first feature that comes up is that uh, depending upon the IOPS and throughput 
you can choose what type of EBS you want to have. Other than that, you can uh, have your EBS in the same uh, availability zone of your machine is there. So basically the accessibility will be faster. Apart from that, uh, let us say if you are using your EBS, then you can also specify the particular storage option that you want to achieve it. Now, uh, let us say if you are having a particular physical machine, so there you will be having a storage option. After that, uh, what you do? You just do the partitioning of that storage. So that thing has been demonstrated you here. Uh, let us say if you are having a storage option, then you can partition it to different types of drive C drive, D drive, E drive, whatever you want. And once you have made that partitioning, then you can move into that drives and start uh, making the particular folder inside it. And once you make the folder inside it, then you can start uh, storing any number of data you want. It may be a file, it may be a TXT or it may be a video, uh, whatever way you want to have it, you can have all those things. Now, if we will look into the uh, Linux or Unix file system, this is how the things are there. There will be a root volume and upon that root volume, you create a directory. So whatever thing we uh, refer a folder in the Windows uh, file system, that is we, uh, we uh, basically go with the name of directory in our Linux or Unix. Once you create the directory, then you can go to that particular location and start uh, having the particular data you want to store it. So this is how the things look in the Unix. We already know that EBS is a raw and unformatted uh, storage option that is being made available to us. Now let us say if you are using the storage options, then upon two things you will be looking on. One is throughput and one is IOPS. Now what exactly is an throughput? So throughput is basically a parameter upon which you decide that uh, what is the amount of data that is being transferred either from or to to the storage device per seconds or you can say in minutes. So based upon that you can decide that how much of data transferring are you able to do. And the other aspect that you check in is the IOPS. So what exactly is an IOPS? IOPS is basically input output uh, per second. So it basically gives you a uh, particular number that upon per second how much of input and output can be done upon your particular storage options that is being available being, uh, that is uh, basically upon an EBS how much of the input and output can be done. Now if we will move forward. So here we are uh, going to have the four different types of EBS volumes that are being available to us. Now, if you will uh, see the first two, general purpose and the provisioned IOPS, they are having SSD. Now, what exactly is an SSD? SSD is basically a storage option that is being available to us. So, if you will see what is uh, SSD stands for, SSD stands for solid state drive. And what does HDD stands for? HDD stands for hard disk drive. HDD is also a storage option that is being available to us. Let us say if you are having small or random uh, input output, then you will be uh, preferring SSD over the HDD because it performs better when it comes to small or random input output. But uh, let us say if you are having a large streaming workload, then definitely you will be performing HDD. And let us say if you are using SSD, then the performance attribute is IOPS. And if you are using HDD, then the performance attribute is going to be through. Now coming on to general purpose SSD, then the baseline performance is 3 IOPS GV with a minimum of 100 IOPS and a maximum of 10,000 IOPS. The burst performance that it can give you is 3000. Now let us understand what is an burst performance. Let us say if there is a particular you can say mean for the particular performance. And if your particular machine is unable to reach that uh, much of mean level. So whatever is being uh, you can say uh, the mean is 10 and your machine is able to perform up to 8 only because there is not uh, much more workload. Then that 2 units is being reserved. And when in the future your machine is going to need more number of performance then that 2 uh, unit is going to be get released. Similarly, if you are using general purpose, then you will get a mixture of everything. But let us say if you uh, want a little bit higher performance as compared to the general purpose, then definitely 
you can uh, look for the provisioned SSD. It will be performing, uh, it will be giving you the performance far better as compared to the general purpose SSD. Then we are having the throughput optimized HDD. Then uh, as you already know that being in HDD storage option, the major focus of this particular storage is upon the throughput. Uh, if you want the more throughput, you can definitely go for uh, throughput optimized HDD. And we are having cloud storage HDD. Let us say if there is a particular data whose retrieval is not that much frequent and if you want the particular attribute in that particular storage is throughput, then definitely you can use the cold storage HDD. Now, uh, as we already know that EBS, if you want to use then your particular machine and your particular EBS have to be in the same availability zones and you can attach one EBS with only one machine. But let us say if you want to attach multiple uh, EBS, then definitely you can use provisioned IOPS IO1 volume and for using that the particular uh, machine configuration has to be uh, AWS Nitro system based Amazon EC2 and that also have to be present in the same availability zone. If it is there, then definitely you can go for the multi-attach of your EBS. Now let us say if you are having this multi-attach uh, feature uh, being available to you, then you can perform a better uh, sharing of the data and the accessibility is also be good because that is, those things are present in the same availability zone. Now let us see what exactly is an EBS snapshot. So snapshots are nothing but the backup of your particular volume. So EBS we already know that it is uh, similar to our RAM. Uh, RAM storage that we get in our physical system. Let us say if there is some uh, of the data present in my EBS and let us say uh, due to some uh, chaos or due to some problem I lost my EBS volume then how will I be able to uh, retrieve it back only if I have uh, if I have taken the backup then only I will be able to do it. So uh, you get the option of taking the snapshots of your particular EBS all the snapshots are incremental uh, except the first one and where exactly is your snapshot being stored? It is stored in the Amazon S3. Now let us say if you are having the EBS snapshot then you can basically copy your particular snapshot or your backups from one region to another region and you can even use that particular uh, backup. How exactly? Let us say if you are having your particular a snapshot in US East 1. You take uh, the particular backup to the uh, US West 2. There you retrieve it back into the volume form and then you attach that volume to your machine. So then you will be able to use your particular uh, EBS volume uh, there. So that is how you can copy the things and after that you, you also get the option of you also get the option of managing your EBS by using data lifecycle managers. So basically you can define when exactly the backups needed to be taken, not manually. You can uh, do all of those things. You can automate every of the thing. And the best part about this thing is that it is free of cost. So you can schedule that. Okay. In what, uh, how many number of days a particular schedule backups would be happening and all of those things then will be stored up. So if you are uh, taking the uh, particular snapshots in a regular interval of time then you are protecting your data and whenever you want you can uh, just take it or you can say you can just put it back into your machine if you uh, want it. It will also help you in auditors or in internal compliance whenever if anything comes out and uh, let us say if you want to reduce the storage cost then you can do it by deleting the outdated backups. If you don't need any particular backup, you can simply delete that. And if you will look to the quotas of AWS data lifecycle manager, then you can uh, create up to 100 lifecycle policies per region. You can attach 45 tags to your resource and you can create one schedule uh, per lifecycle policy. So basically you are getting a lot of options. So you can definitely use the data lifecycle manager for managing your EBS. So now let us see what is EBS encryption. Let us see if you are having a particular volume then you can encrypt it 
and whenever you will require it you can decrypt it so if you are uh, using the things in this particular fashion then you are protecting your data from any of the uh, malware uh, act attacks so you can protect your data and you can keep it very safe and uh, the one thing that needed to be note is that it is supported only for the volumes not for any of the instances if you will uh, see this is an ubuntu machine that i have already created so out of this uh, what i'll do if i'll move into storage so i will be you will be able to see uh, that uh, i am already having a particular ebs volume so this is the root volume and uh, it doesn't matter whether it is root or not uh, it is uh, your ebs volume only so this is the by default ebs volume that uh, get attached to your machine when you will be trying to create your machine but uh, let us say if i need to attach more ebs volume then how can i do it so that thing we will look in so here you can see the root device type and it is an ebs volume so ebs volume is what ebs volume acts like a primary memory uh, to your particular machine it will be the fast accessible memory but with that we also have a limitation in ebs that it provides you with limited uh, storage capacity only and uh, if you will uh, see another thing uh, while working with ebs is that let us say if you want to attach any of your ebs volume with your machine then you need to specify your ebs volume in the same availability zone as of your machine so right now if you will see our machine is currently is in us east 1b so while uh, creating an ebs i will specify my ebs volume also in the same availability zone so for creating a ebs volume i'll move into this volume sections here i will get an option of create volume i will click on that and after that uh, i will uh, go on to the type of size okay size that i want to specify uh, let me specify the size as 5 after that as i already told you the particular availability zone that i need to specify has to be the one in which my machine is there because i will be attaching my this ebs volume to that machine only so i will select the availability zone after selecting the availability zone what i'll do i'll go and click on create volume so uh, right now if you will see with the available volume this is the only volume that is having 5 gib and uh, i just created it just because i created it right now and i have not attached it to any of my machine you can see the current volume state is available so first of all uh, let me name it let me name it as ubuntu ebs ubuntu ebs i will do that and i will save it so after uh, doing that what i'll do i'll attach this ebs volume to my machine so i'll go into action and here i will get an option of attach volume so i'll click on attach volume and here if i will type i will uh, get the particular machine name that i want to attach with so i will select ubuntu and once i select the ubuntu a uh, particular device name will come up that is dev slash sd app okay and after that what i'll do i'll click on attach volume so right now if i will go in here you can see this is currently in use so the same thing uh, will also be reflected in my instance if i will move back to here and if i will select my machine and if i will uh, go into storage earlier i was just having one uh, volume but now i have two volume this is the particular volume having the 5 gib is the volume that i have recently attached it so after attaching my volume i have a lot of other things to do uh, what is that uh, i have to uh, properly format it because uh, ebs is an raw and unformatted uh, storage type so i have to format it after formatting uh, it i have to mount it upon a particular folder then only i'll be able to use the thing so how to do that if uh, i will select my machine after that i'll go on to connect i will move into ec2 instance connect after moving that i'll click on connect let's have a quick quiz question guys and the question is what is amazon fsx your options are a cloud based relational database service a fully managed file storage service an artificial intelligence service or a content delivery network please mention your answers in the comment section but offers an aws certification course for solutions architect certified by nascom 
and it aligns with industry standards. Through this course, you can learn all the important concepts of AWS and upon completion of the course, you will receive a NESCOM certification. With this course, we have already helped thousands of professionals in successful career transition. You can check out the testimonials on our Achievers channel whose link is given in the description below. Without a doubt, this course can set your career to new heights. So visit the course page link given below in the description and take a first step towards career growth in the field of AWS. So after connecting, uh, the very first uh, step that I will be performing here is sudo updating it. Okay, sudo, I will type for that, I will type sudo apt get update. And I'll hit enter. So now uh, my machine is updated. So after updating my machine, I will type a particular command lsvlk to see the available storage options to me. So you can see this this particular under this name section. Uh, I am having a particular storage that is XVD. This is nothing but your default root volume that you have attached while creating your machine. And after that, if you will see this XVDF is the particular uh, you can say is the particular EBS volume that you have attached. Okay, and from the size also you can verify it. It's 5G. So after uh, doing that, what we need to see is that whether this particular volume is uh, unformatted or in format option. So how to check that? Uh, for checking that, we can do one thing. First of all, we will try checking the XVDA, which is our root volume. So by default, uh, though root volume is uh, EBS volume type, but it is already in the formatted manner. So how to check that? For that, we will type a command file minus s forward slash dev xvda so after that if i'll hit enter okay so it is telling me i don't have the permission so for that what i'll do i will type here after that i'll hit enter so you can see it is telling something like dos mbr boot sector extended partition table so what does this signify that my particular uh, ebs volume of root volume is particularly you can say in a particular formatted manner but if I will uh, do the same uh, thing for my XVDF or my EBS volume that I have just attached. If I will do the same, you will see something written as data. So what does this signify? That signifies that our system is telling, yes, there is a particular uh, volume uh, that is being associated with us, but I exactly don't know in what format it is available. So for that, what we will be doing, we will be uh, basically making it in a particular format option. So how to do that? For that we will type a command sudo mkfs after that we will type here minus t ext4 ext4 forward slash tab forward slash xvdf. So what does this uh, do? This is basically uh, making a particular format option. Uh, ext4 is a particular format uh, option that we get and we are trying to format our particular xvdf after that i will hit enter so now uh, you can see uh, the things like uh, allocating group tables done creating generals done and whatever backups and all it needed to do for the formatting it has been done now if i'll go back and if i'll paste the same file uh, same command that i was using earlier Earlier when I used the uh, same command sudo file minus s forward slash dev forward slash xvdf it was telling okay something is there but I don't exactly know in what format option is it available. Now if I will type this same particular command and if I will hit it you can see that the things uh, it is in uh, this particular things uh, tells us that yes now the things are been properly formatted and now we can start working upon it. So after this, uh, what is the step that we have to do? We have to create a directory and we have to mount this volume onto that directory. So how to do that? For that, I will type a command sudo mkdir mkdir and the particular of directory name that I will give is ebs volume. After that, I'll hit enter. So if I will do here ls command to see whether this directory is available or not, you will be able to see EBS volume is available. So once this EBS volume is available to me, what I will do now? 
Now I will start mounting my particular EBS volume. So how to mount it? I will type a command sudo mount. After that I have to uh, specify the particular uh, EBS volume that I want to mount on xvdr. After that I will just simply write the directory name upon which I want to mount it. After that I will hit enter. So now here if I will do ls blk and if I will hit enter. You can see my xvdf is now being mounted upon this EBS volume. Okay. And uh, if I would go back and if I would see here earlier this same thing was not there but right now it is available. So with this uh, we are able to see that yes now we are successfully able to do the things. Now the another thing that we would be looking in is that let us say if I am typing here another command df minus h uh, to see uh, exactly how much things are been available to see that okay in this xvdf though I will be it has been specified that I will be getting 5g of storage option but in exact if you want to see how much is being actually allocated to my uh, particular xvdf you can see this using this command uh, df minus h and it is 4.6 g only so let us say if you uh, want to increase it how you can do that if you want to have the particular size that is being specified uh, for that you can type a command size 2 fs after uh, that you can type here dev slash x b d f okay and if you will hit it enter now you can see okay permission denied because i have not written sudo here so let me type here sudo if i hit enter now uh, nothing do the file is already long block okay so whatever things it needed to do it is already has been given that's why it is showing but uh, let us say if there is some particular scenario where the things are not given or the storage option uh, whatever it needed to give you is not available if you want to make it available then you can use this command sudo resize to fs uh, forward slash dev forward slash xvdf and you can just hit enter and you will be able to do the things and after this uh, the last thing that we need to see is that let us say if you want to unmount this particular EBS volume from this particular directory how to do that for that you have to type another command sudo umount though we are unmounting but the command will be umount after that you have to specify uh, the device name or you can say the particular volume that you want to disassociate and after that you can hit enter after that if i will uh, do here ls blk and if i'll hit enter you'll be able to see that we have successfully unmounted how to attach our ebs volume to our windows machine so i already have a windows machine uh, running you can see this and uh, what now I will do is that I will create a particular EBS volume and I will attach it and then I will try to do uh, the mounting upon this particular machine. Okay, So before uh, creating an EBS volume I need to check out what is the availability zone of my machine because EBS needs to be in the same availability zone as of my machine. So my machine is available in uh, US East 1B. So I will create a volume and I will keep that uh, particular EBS volume in the same availability zone. I will go into create volume. After the, the size that I will specify here, uh, let us say it is 10. And after this, uh, let me choose an availability zone. Let me go for US East 1B. After that, I will click on create volume. So uh, if you will see, this is the particular volume that I have just created uh, you can see the time from that also you can know and from the volume state it is creating right now so i'll select it after that i will uh, name it let me name it as windows ebs out of that i'll click on save so let me check yeah so now it is available so what i'll do now is that i'll select the ebs and i will go into action and here i will click on attach volume so I will choose the instance that I want to attach it. I will choose the windows. So the device name will come up and after that I will click on attach volume. So successfully I have now attached it. Now if I will move into my particular machine. Now if I will go into storage. 
should be able to see it. Yeah, you can see this particular machine that I've just attached. After this, uh, what I'll do, I'll go into uh, connect option. I'm going to RDP client. I will basically download the RDP for it. I'll open it. But before connecting, uh, what I need to have, I need to have the password. So I'll get the password. This is the particular, uh, you can see the file that I require, windows.pem. After that, I'll click on open. So this file will get open. After that, I'll click on decrypt password. So now I will be having the password. So for that, what I'll do, I'll open the RDP uh, again and after that, I'll click on connect. So it will ask me for the password. I will um, copy the password. After that, I'll paste the password here. After that, I will click on OK. Click on yes. Okay. So now I have successfully connected into my RDP. The RDP I have, I'm in. So for the time being, I don't require it. Data. Okay. So I don't require uh, all those things right now. So what I'll do, I'll close it. If you want to set up, set it up. This is how you should set it up. I'll close it. Okay. So what uh, I'll do is that as I have uh, successfully mounted uh, the thing, now if I'll come into this PC, you will be able to see this particular thing in this local disk uh, C, and this is the uh, root volume that is being attached to it. The uh, particular root volume having a size of 30 GB. Now here it is showing 29. So this is what our root volume is. But uh, now I am unable to see uh, the particular volume, the particular EBS volume that I just mounted. So what I'll do, I will, uh, uh, though I have attached it, now I need to uh, bring it here. So I can do it. I, I'll search disk management. I'll click on disk management. So it will open up. Uh, first of all, you can see this is the particular root EBS volume that is being available to me. So now, uh, and this is the another volume, the particular EBS volume that I just attached. So before doing anything, what I'll do, I'll first bring it into online. Yeah. So okay, now I'm in online. Okay. So it is taking time. We shall wait. And once uh, this will be available, what I'll do, I'll click on new simple volume and after that, uh, I need to do few steps and this particular volume will also be reflected there. Okay, let me click on initialize disk. Okay, I'll click on OK. okay so now, uh, it is uh, present, okay. So now it has gone to online. So everything that I'm missing. How to this? Uh, I'll go on to new simple volumes. I'll click on new simple volume, and after that, what I have to do? I have to just click on next, and uh, I'll be clicking on next. I'll not do any other changes. Yeah, I'll be doing it uh, assigning the following drive letter as D. Okay, whatever you want, you can do. But I'm happy with D. How to this? I'll click on next. After this, I will. Uh, Go with NTFS only. I will not do any changes. I will click on next. After this, I will click on finish. And now, uh, if I will go back here, you will be able to see the D drive is also available. How to create a snapshot? How to encrypt our EBS volume? So, if you could see, I already having a particular instance running. Okay, it is of Ubuntu. Uh, Type. So uh, basically the AMI that I have chosen here is Ubuntu. So if I will uh, select my machine and if I will go here, you can see the particular platform is Ubuntu. And uh, apart from that in the security group, I have allowed all traffic. So now uh, if I will move into storage, now here you can see only one particular volume is present that is my root volume that is also of EBS type and now what I'll do I'll attach and I'll also show you once I modify the EBS volume the same will be reflected here. So for attaching my EBS volume I need to be uh, aware of where exactly is my machine available. 
so you can see it is available in the availability zone us east 1c this is my machine after this what i'll do i'll go down and then i'll move into volumes so here i'll be creating a volume i'll click on create volume so volume type will be general purpose ssd this size that i'll have here will be 6 6 gib after that the availability zone that i'll be choosing here is us east 1c because my machine is available in the same availability zone and after this i will uh, encrypt my volume how to encrypt your volume you have to click on encrypt this volume once you click on that it will ask you for the kms key if you want to have it uh, you can give a specific custom kms key otherwise you can go with default aws ebs kms key also once you select it all these things will be available your kms key description will be there kms key that protect my ebs volume when no other key is defined and all other particular thing will be available to you okay so these are the things that you will get and uh, what exactly is this kms key will do basically it is a service that is being available to you it is key management service and why is this service being created so that you can in a better way control and uh, cryptograph your keys so that you can protect your data and uh, once we are done with that i will click on create volume and now uh, my volume is being created okay so this is the volume it is right now in creating state if i'll refresh it you will be able to see this is available okay this is the 6 gib size that i have specified so if i'll refresh it you can see it is now available so i will give it a name ubuntu ebs after that i will save it so this is how you can encrypt your particular key you can see the particular kms key thing is also available to you you can see it and the kms key id is also been associated now so after this what we will do you can also see the encryption thing that is being also leveled here is encrypted so after this what we will do we will attach it into a machine so let me select my volume after that i'll move into action and i'll click on attach volume here i will have to choose the particular instance that i want to attach with ubuntu ebs is the one machine that i want to attach it with after that i'll click on attach volume so now uh, my volume is being attached with my machine now if i will move back into my machine so now if i will refresh the thing you will be able to see go into ebs i'll go in here i'll go into storage you can see this is available okay and you can see uh, whatever thing was there it is also present here encrypted yes kms key id is also available and after this what i'll do let us say if i want to modify this ebs volume how i can do that i will simply select my ebs volume i'll then go into action i'll then click on modify volumes and one thing that you should know is that you cannot reduce the size of the volume that you have specified at the beginning you can only increase it if i'll try to decrease it let us say you can see this particular pop-up will happen the size of the volume can only be increased not decreased so what i'll do i will then just increase it and let me increase it to let us say nine after that i'll click on modify and here it will ask do you want to modify it i'll click on yes modify it now you can see if i'll refresh it here you can see it has been successfully modified now if i'll go back to my instance and if i'll refresh here now you'll be able to see the updated thing here i'll move into storage you can see the volume size is now nine okay now what i will do if i will uh, now let us create a snapshot and let's look in that let me select my ebs volume after that what i'll do i'll go into action and here i'll get an option of create snapshot I will click on create snapshot 
after that i will be giving a particular description let me give it a description let which is say it is ubuntu it is ubuntu snapshot ubuntu ebs snapshot after giving the description i'll click on create snapshot if you want to give the tag you can give it let us say if you have any key you can give it i don't have so let me give it a key, name and after that if you want to give some value let me give it a name as ebs ebs snapshot after that you can simply click on create snapshot so you can see successfully created snapshot from volume this this is the volume id and this is your snapshot id after that if i'll move into snapshot so here you can see from the description this is the snapshot that i have created it is ubuntu ebs snapshot you can see snapshot status and everything you can even see the encryption was enabled for my ebs but that thing also got reflected here also and what is this snapshot snapshot is nothing but an backup of your volume let us say if you created a volume and you want to uh, have a backup of that so you can basically create a snapshot so let us say if your ebs uh, volume get deleted mistakenly then you can restore this snapshot and you can get your data back so you can see here this is my particular snapshot that i have created let us uh, do the thing let me give it a name ubuntu snapshot ubuntu snapshot after that let me save it now let us see if i am having my volume this if i go to here and let us say let me force detach it now if i will go here successfully force detach a volume now let us see if by mistakenly this volume of mine got deleted okay okay let me say let us say by mistakenly this volume of mine now got deleted so what i can do now I, the thing that i can do here is i can bring this same volume back from this snapshot if i am having so how to restore the particular ebs volume that has just got deleted mistakenly you can select your snapshot after that you can go into action and here you get an option of create volume from snapshot so you have to click on that okay everything will come in the manner that you have specified and after that you can just have to select the availability zone let me select it one see able to select the snapshot first snapshot restore no need to do any other things you just have to click on create snapshot and this snapshot will be becoming your particular ebs volume so you can see here snapshot id that is 05 or this is our ubuntu snapshot that we have just created after that if i click on create volume and now if i will move in here you will be able to see this snapshot that we have just created okay so let me go in and show you so basically uh, this is the snapshot that we have created and right now it is available and it is having everything same encryption is encrypted you can say the encryption is thing has been specified as encrypted it is having the kms id so our exactly same ebs volume we are able to restore if somehow you delete it so this is the major benefit if we are creating snapshot so efs is elastic file system so through the efs we can share our data and uh, most of the time it is also available and the scalability also it, that it provides is also limitless the particular uh, storage capacity that e efs provide us is unlimited so let's move forward and let us see what are the features of efs so it is completely managed and uh, let us see if uh, you are using any service in the aws then it will be having its own security own encryption so the data security is also very good you can uh, also get the life cycle management and the storage class for managing your data in the efs 
security purpose it is also very good the performance is also good as compared to the other uh, storage options that are being available and uh, the particular storage that it provide us let us see if we will compare it with the EBS then it has an enormous gap in between because we know EBS cannot provide us with uh, unlimited uh, storage capacity now if we will uh, see uh, what other thing uh, does EFS provides us if we will compare it with the EBS now let us go and let us see that let us say if you are using EBS then uh, your particular machine and your EFS has to be present in the same availability soon but that is not the case with your EFS EFS uh, does not need to be present in the same availability zone as of your machine your machine can be uh, in the region and EFS will be in that region and after that you can do the connection so the availability zone specification does not apply to the EFS now EBS being an uh, elastic uh, block store so it comes in raw and unformatted manner but the same is not applicable to the EFS so you can straight away go into EFS and you can start using the thing and where does we use EBS let us see if there is any database application that is running then we will be using EBS but uh, for the companies to improve their content management systems they can be using EFS because let us say if any company is using it uh, then they will be uh, dumping a lot of data into it EBS definitely will be uh, fast accessible because EBS acts like a primary memory to your machine but EFS acts like a secondary uh, storage option that is being available to your machine but the storage option that EFS can provide EBS cannot provide you. How to create and mount an EFS? So for working with EFS we need an instance. So let us go and uh, launch an instance. I will click on launch instance after that I have to give a name to it so the name that I will provide here is Ubuntu EFS after giving it a name I will choose the AMI is of Ubuntu so I will be basically working with Ubuntu now I will be moving down here I will choose a particular key pair that we have created that is Shubnot Virginia Demo Key 1 I will select it now I will go into network settings, I will click on edit, after that I will not do any changes in VPC subnet or in this particular aspect but I will be going down here and in my security group I will keep it as all traffic and the source type will be anywhere. So you can remember the security group name, uh, uh, we will be looking into this that it the name is launch wizard 18 why I am uh, change the things and why I am keeping a note of it we will be able to figure it out in few more minutes ok I will do the changes and after that I will move down I don't need to do any more changes if you want to see the summary you can look in that after that you can simply hit on launch instance so uh, now my instance will be launched so it will take few moments to uh, be available to me so basically uh, here will be our instance yeah Ubuntu EFS currently it is in pending state so in the meantime as uh, my machine is getting created what I'll do I'll now move into EFS and I will create a particular EFS okay so I'll go here I'll click on create file system all I need to give is to provide it a name uh, let me give it a name as Ubuntu EFS Ubuntu EFS and the VPC that I will have here will be of default type if you people could recall the things then uh, in while launching my machine also I'll be uh, having I was having the same default VPC so I'll keep the same VPC here also the storage class that I'll be going on with is standard after that I'll click on create so now this is my particular machine uh, sorry my particular EFS that I have created and the file system is now available now if I will click on the name of my EFS what I can see if I will move into networks right now the mounting targets are being created so I need to change this mounting targets ok so uh, apart from this other thing that we should be looking in is that 
there are a lot of benefits if we are using EFS as compared to the EBS. So in the EBS, if you people could recall, then EBS was very, you can say, availability zone specific. You need to specify your EBS in the same availability zone as of your machine. And uh, the storage capacity that we get in EBS is also limited. But the storage capacity that we get in EFS is unlimited. Moreover, uh, we can also uh, connect our EFS with n number of instances we require but the same option was not available in EBS. Now uh, if I will refresh it, still now it is creating. So what we need to do is that we need to click on this manage and then we will be changing our security groups. We need to attach the same security group that is being attached with our machine. So basically we have to do the changes with the availability zones. So if I'll move back to my instance here. So right now it is an initializing state. So if you people unable to recall that what we have attached. So if I'll move into security, you can see launch wizard 18 is the one. So I will uh, particularly keep the same uh, security group with my EFS also. And apart from that, another thing that you people should be aware of is that uh, while trying to connect, uh, while trying to uh, connect or you can say it while trying to mount my EFS then uh, with my EC2 instance at that time what I will be doing is that I will be installing NFS common. So now uh, you need to understand why exactly are we trying to install an NFS common. It is because your EC2 instance and your EFS are two different service. So if those two different services want to access each other then we need a medium so that they can do the things so for that for the accessibility of the things we will be installing nfs common so now let me check if my machine is available or not so if i will refresh here okay still it is initializing so let me check if my efs has given me the mount targets are available or not yeah so now uh, the mount targets are available so I'll click on manage, I'll go inside and I'll change this default security groups. So I'll uh, remove it one by one. After removing it, I'll move into security group and I need to select the one security group that is being attached with my machine. So it was launch wizard 18. So here it is. So I will uh, have this same launch wizard available to every of my availability zone. So I'll move in one by one and I'll do the things. And here I'll move into 1D, type 18, I'll select it. Again, let me go here 18, at the end, let me select 18. Okay, after uh, doing the things, uh, what I'll do, I'll click on save. So uh, now our EFS is ready to be mounted uh, why I have attached launch wizard 18 because if you will people go and look in this is the particular security group that is being attached with my machine. Now if I will refresh it you can see this Ubuntu EFS is in now running state. So what I will do I will select it out of this I will click on connect and now I will connect this particular machine. So it will now come up now the very first step that I'll be doing once my machine is available is that I'll be updating my machine. So as I'm working with uh, Ubuntu, so I'll type here sudo apt get update and after that I'll hit enter. So now uh, my machine will be updated and after updating my machine, the next step that I will do here is installing NFS common. If you people could recall, I have already told you what uh, is the significance of NFS common. My EC2 instance wants to access EFS. So it needs a medium so that it can access the thing. So who is going to provide that medium, a way to access the thing? It is going to be provided by NFS common to me. So to install that, I'll type a command sudo apt get install NFS common and after that I'll type here minus y so that uh, if any permissions has been required whether you want to download it or not it will not ask me straight away it will download after this I'll hit enter so uh, now all of the packages that I require 
uh, will be getting downloaded and now yeah it's available now so after uh, this what i have to do i have to create a directory upon which i want to mount the efs now uh, why do we want to create a directory to mounting it now if i'll move in to my efs and if i'll click on attach i get two options of attaching either i can at, uh, you can say mounted by dns so what will happen upon this dns name fs a particular id is given and after that a uh, dns name a whole of this us is to amazon.com yes this upon this particular you can say upon this particular dns name uh, the particular efs will get installed sorry will be mounted and here if i'll click on mount by ip then what will happen upon this ip address this particular efs will be mounted now if you could see in the architecture of both of this this is the particular command that is being provided to us from the aws for mounting our efs here what i am having i am having uh, this particular command and at the end if you could see this is written efs so what basically is this telling that the architecture is such a way in that if you want to mount your efs you need to create a directory of the name efs let us say if you don't want to give the name what you can do you can create a directory of whatever way you want to have or whatever name you want to have in after that you you can give whatever name you want to give it okay so if i want to mount it via dns then same thing goes on upon this dns name it will be uh, you can say mounted and i have to create a particular directory named as efs if you want some other name you can do it and you can change it once you paste it there so i'll go into connect to instance so ac2 instance connect i'll go here so first of all what i have to do i have to create a directory so how to create a directory i will type here sudo mkdir basically make directory how do this the efs that i the directory name that i'll give here is efs how do that i'll hit enter so now i'll type here ls command to see if the efs directory is available or not you can see it is available and once it is available what i'll do i'll go back either thing you can take either you can take the dns name you can copy this and paste it there or you can take this ip name uh, you can sorry you can take this uh, nfs client command code and you can paste it there so you can i'll be taking this particular code i'll take it i'll go back and simply i'll paste it here after pasting it uh, what i'll do i'll simply hit enter yeah so now uh, it has been successfully mounted now if i will type here command df minus h then you can see i am being successfully able to mount this thing upon this particular directory named as efs if you want to create any direct uh, you can say any file in this efs directory how you can do that you can move into this directory by typing a command change directory efs you can hit enter now i am in efs let us create a file sudo uh, using touch command you can create it sudo touch uh, let me create a file named as one.txt and you can do that you can hit enter now if you will do the things you will be able to see this file is available in this efs so amazon fsx is easy and cost effective to launch run and scale feature rich high performance file system in cloud so basically fsx is uh, like a file system that is being available to us it make uses of uh, ssd storage to provide fast performance with low latency but it can also make use of hdd now if we will look into the use cases of uh, fsx then uh, we will be able to note that uh, it supports wide range of workload with its reliability security scalability and broad set of capabilities aws fsx is built on latest aws compute network and disk technology which is fully managed service and apart from that uh, it is compatible with a lot of the services that is being available like amazon ec2 instances of amazon workspace let us say if you are having an fsx then you can simply mount it upon the uh, windows or upon uh, the other amazon linux machine that you wanted to have being a file system you can think that it is an modified version of the efs now basically uh, right now amazon fsx uh, is being provided 
with uh, four different types. One is for Amazon FSx for Windows file server. One is uh, Amazon FSx for Lustre. Apart from that, we are having also other two that is uh, NatApp, OnTap and uh, your particular Open ZFS. So these options are also available, but we'll be majorly looking into the Windows and the Lustre. So uh, apart from this, uh, one thing that is far more uh, uh, you can go with surety is that it will be highly available 99.99 times it will be available to you. It is simple and uh, fully managed. So if it is fully managed, so you need not to be uh, worried about the things like its availability and all. So AWS will be taking care of all of those things and uh, you whatever resources or whatever up to storage you will be using let us say if there is a particular storage limit that you are using let us say for 5 tv for that only you are going to pay and the easy integration of fsx with the other services like ec2 and all makes it even it more lucrative uh, service to be used so you can uh, just go on with that uh, amazon fsx is a modified version of the efs it has better feature as compared to the uh, efs that is being available to us so if you will see to the first feature of fsx we can see that dfs uh, basically distributed file system namespace allows you to group files here from multiple file system into a single common folder structure a namespace from which you can access the entire file data set. Now what exactly does it tell us? Let us say if you are having an DFS, basically it will allow users or application to access data files such as PDF, image, Word document or other types of uh, data files from shared storage across any one of the network server. So let us say if we are able to access the thing, how will we be able to access the thing? Basically, there will be a single folder and upon that single folder, we will be able to access all of the thing. Now, if we will uh, look into the other feature that is using Windows uh, robust file copy to copy your files uh, directly to the Amazon FSX. So what basically is happening in this? Let us say in your machine, you are having some data and you want it to be uploaded into uh, somewhere where it will be safe and your machine uh, data space will be free. So then you can use this particular option. So FSx provide you with this option. Now if we will look into the other features of FSx then it uh, actually includes as FSx uh, works with uh, the Microsoft uh, Active Directory to integrate with the existing Microsoft Windows environment. So let us say if you are using the Active Directory, then what will happen? Then uh, the Microsoft uh, Directory service will use it to store the information about object or the network. So it can be very useful for the administrator or for the user. Now, apart from that, if we will look into the feature of uh, FSx, then as with every AWS service, uh, encryption will be provided to you. Apart from that, KMS is also provided to you basically key management service. So you can even encrypt the data and even you can put the key upon that. And apart from that, uh, Amazon FSx follows the ISO, PCI, DS and SOC standards. So basically you can think that whatever things are being rolling out, it is in acknowledgement to the current uh, versions that is being specified. So if you are using Amazon FSx for Windows file server, uh, then whatever Microsoft products are there, all of them will be compatible with the uh, Windows file server of FSx. So let us see if you want to move any Windows based app to this shared storage, you can do it with ease. Apart from that, if you are using FSx for Windows file server, then we will uh, get full support from SMB protocol, Windows NTFS and Microsoft Active Directory. So now comes what exactly is an SMB protocol. So it is a service uh, server message block protocol. It is a network uh, file sharing protocol. So we'll get the support from a network file sharing protocol and we will also get the support from Windows NTFS. So actually NTFS uh, is a new technology file system. This is a primary file uh, system for the recent version of Windows and Windows Server. Let us say if any uh, new version of Windows has been rolled out, 
then we can uh, will be able to use all of those features if we are using the FSX for Windows file server. And apart from that, we can also use uh, Microsoft Active Directory for the integration purpose. And FSX use SSD for the first performance. Now, if you look into the features of AWS FSX for Windows file server, then one thing uh, that we are very sure about is the compatibility of the Windows. But uh, the uh, Windows versions need to be uh, either 7 or above it. We can even access our Windows FSX from uh, other EC2 machines like Windows EC2 machines from Workspace or even VMware Cloud on AWS. It is even fully managed by the AWS. So let us say if any hardware patching needed to be done, uh, then all of those things is going to be taken care of by the AWS or the Microsoft because it has the integration directly with the uh, Windows. So we will uh, be very much carefree and it uses SSD for the fast performance, but it can even use HDD if required. Now, if we will look into the use case, uh, when exactly will we be using it? Let us say if there is a particular Windows based application or a workload uh, that is being running and uh, it needed to have a shared file storage. It is in requirement uh, of having a shared file storage for storing its data, then we can use it. Apart from that, uh, let us say if any development environment uh, is working upon and they want to recite their codes or build repositories so that that particular code will be available to each and everyone present in the development team or if they are working upon an application and that application needed to be available to each and everyone so that they can fix the bug, they can find out what error is it giving us or what is the particular performance level they want to judge. So they need the accessibility of that particular application or of that particular code repositories. So then we can definitely use um, FSX for Windows file server and using that we can even transfer the things to them. Now if you will see that how does uh, FSX for Windows file server work? First of all, we have to uh, have a particular directory available to us. Once we have the directory, we can then start integrating our particular uh, FSX with that directory. And once we do that, then we can uh, configure our file, then we can connect that FSX to our machine. And if any particular application is running, and if it uh, wanted to use any storage options, then we can uh, basically integrate that application uh, with our machine having the FSX or we can even integrate the application with the FSX and then they can start using the things. Now, if we will look into Amazon FSX for Windows file server supported client and access method and environment. So uh, if you look into the client space, then we can use the Amazon EC2 instances here. We can use either Ubuntu or we can use directly Windows um, AMI if we want. Apart from that, also we get a lot of other options. Now, how exactly are we going to access it? We can access it using the DNS name, DNS name provided in our active directory or using the distributed file system namespace that we have already discussed and the environment uh, needed to be either an on-premise environment. If you want it, you can do it or from an AWS account, you can also access the thing. So in this session, we are having uh, this much. Now let us discuss about the failovers. Uh, we have uh, basically discussed till uh, yet in this session about the Windows file server. Now uh, we will lo look more into the failover processes that how exactly is the failover process work. So let us say if we have enabled uh, multi-AZ, then the failover will start automatically. So uh, and when exactly are the conditions when it will start? Let us say if there is a particular availability zone and it has gone down, then it will start uh, preferred uh, file server needed to be available, but it is not there. Or let us say if any maintenance start happening at the background, then the failover process will start automatically. And uh, what exactly happens in the failover if you will Look, uh, then uh, let us say whatever things uh, we are able to access if it has gone down, then uh, we will start uh, requesting for that. Uh, we will do the read and write request for whatever data we are having in our file system and they will uh, be st again start rolling the things back. Uh, then uh, once all of the resources are available in the particular subnet or you can say in the particular place where we want, then the FSX automatically goes back to the preferred, preferred file server. And how much time will it takes uh, for it? Uh, it takes around 30 seconds from when it detected a file server. So within the uh, very small span of time, it will do a lot of work. How to create an Amazon FSX 
for Windows. FSx for Windows file server provide a fully managed native Microsoft Windows file system so that you can move your Windows based application that required shared file storage to AWS. So for uh, using this Amazon FSx, first of all, we have to create a directory. We also need to have a particular instance of Windows AMI and an Amazon FSx. So I have already created the things because the creation of uh, Amazon FSx and your directory service is going to take uh, 20 to 30 minutes. So that's why I have already created the things. So let me show you up how to do the things. First of all, you have to create uh, this directory because using this directory only your Amazon FSx is going to get created. So first of all, you have to go and you have to create a directory service. So you have to go to setup directory. After you go to setup directory, choose the AWS managed Microsoft AD. After that, click on next. So here in the addition, uh, you can choose standard edition. After that, uh, provide a DNS name. Uh, if you are having any DNS name, then you can provide it or just you can provide a DNS, whatever you like. And uh, after that, uh, provide a particular admin uh, password. So this password uh, should be containing at least uh, three of the things out of this four. Either uh, it should be having a lowercase, uppercase, numeric and special character. After that, once you confirm it, so let me uh, give a particular password. And uh, after that, click on next. So here uh, in the VPC, you can uh, go with no preference also. But let us say if you want to uh, give the particular preference in this subnet, then you can choose the same uh, particular uh, availability zone in which your machine is available so that the connection will become pretty easy. And uh, the VPC you will choose in which your machine is there. Uh, it's in default. So we will uh, be going with default and you can go back. You might be having this instance running. So you can go here. You can check uh, in which availability zone it is there. And after that, you can give the preference uh, accordingly. Even if you leave it no preference, then also there is no problem. So let me uh, go on with no preference. After that, you can click on next. Once you click on next, a review page will pop up in front of you. After that, uh, you can go on with uh, the charges that is going to get incurred. And up, up, apart from that, you can also see a 30 day a tri a limited trial will be also there. So you can also use that. After that, you can click on create directory. So it is going to take uh, 20 to 30 minutes for the creation. So I'll not create it because I already have one. So uh, once you do that, uh, this particular directory will be getting created. And once you create uh, this directory, you have to come to Amazon FSx. Here you have to go to create file system. And here you have to choose Amazon FSx for Windows file server. Choose it after that. Click on next. And here you can basically provide a file system name that you want. Let me provide one. And after that, you can go with deployment type. Either you can go with multi AZ or even you can go with single AZ. So whatever you prefer, you can go. And here uh, the storage capacity that you will be choosing is 32 GIB. Why? Because this is the minimum capacity that you need to give. And the storage type will be SSD only. So here also, if you want the particular subnet, you can go on with this particular subnet in which your machine is available or else you can go on with whatever default is being given to you. So after that, uh, let us say if you are Microsoft Active Directory will be available. Then once you click on it, you will be able to see uh, something like this particular directory as uh, this particular directory is already available. So you will get this option of creating the particular directory. You can choose it after that. So let me choose it. Once you choose it, after that you can click on next. Once you click on next, uh, you will get this type of a pop-up and after that you can review the things. These are the things that are not editable after creation. You can check it out and after that you can simply click on create file system. Once you do that, your uh, file system will be created. So I already have the one, so I'll not, uh, I have not created it. And creation of this uh, FSX is going to also take 20 to 30 minutes. So you need to be a little bit patientful. So once you have done uh, all of these things, you have to go back and then you have to connect to your machine. 
So choose your machine. After that, click on connect. Once you click on connect, go to RDP client. So here you will get an option of download uh, RDP file. So I'll download it. Once you do it, uh, just open it. So before uh, connecting it, I need to have the password. So I'll click on get password. So here I have to give upload the particular private key file. So here I, I have to upload my private key file. So I'll click on upload and once I do that, I'll come to downloads and this is the particular PEM file. So I'll select it. After that, I'll click on open. And once I'll do that, I'll click on decrypt password. So once I'll do that, I'll uh, get the password. So now let me try connecting through RDP. So I'll click on connect. So then I have to provide the password. I'll copy it. And here I have to paste the password and I'll click on open. So now uh, I'll click on yes. So it will uh, take time to come up. So we shall then wait for that. And once it comes up, then we will be doing few setting options. Then we will be able to see Amazon FSX in our particular Windows system. Okay, so uh, it has started to come up. Uh, it will be available in just one or two more minutes. Then we shall be moving on then. Yeah, so it has come up. So after this, but uh, here we have to search for network settings. Okay, so uh, here we have to go for a Windows system. In our Windows system, we have to choose go to our control panel. Not, not the network settings. So you can search it. You can go to control panel. Okay, so go to control panel. And here in the control panel, here we have to go to network and internet. Once we move into a network and internet, from here we have to go to network and uh, sharing center. Go to that. Once we uh, move into that then we have to go to change adapter settings so here it is available so once we move into change adapter setting then we have to uh, go to our ethernet so if you will press upon it uh, we will have to move into properties so once we will uh, come here then we will be getting this internet uh, protocol version 4 tcp ipv4 we have to choose it and we have to click on ok so let me double tap on it. But so here, uh, once this page come up, we have to use this. We have to click on use the following DNS server address. And once we choose that, then we have to go back to our Active Directory. We will be moving into our Active Directory. And from here, we will have to take this DNS address. So let me copy. It. And here we have to paste it. And uh, after that, we will again move back and we will take the another uh, DNS address. So let me copy it and uh, we will be pasting it here on the alternate DNS server. So once we do that, then we can click on OK. After that, uh, once again do OK. So now uh, once we are uh, done with it, we shall be moving back. Now we will be moving into our system and uh, security we will have to go inside that and here uh, we have to then move into the advanced system setting option so once we will uh, move into our advanced setting system option there we will be able to do it let me move into system this one so let me check it out in token internet we have already done it now we will have to system going back here. Yeah, okay. So uh, let us go back. We have given the DNS name. Okay. So it was here that I was checking for the DNS name. Okay. So now uh, let us come into system and from here we will go into advanced system settings. Once we come into this advanced system setting, then we will be moving into computer name. And here we have to click on change. Then here we have to choose uh, the member of domain. 
and once we choose the member of domain then we have to provide the domain name that we have given so if we will go here so here we will be able to get our domain name let me go to application yeah so here it is already ship.tk so let me copy it and once you copy it come back here and paste it so once you do that then click on ok Okay, so now it will ask you for the username and the password. So we will be providing it. So let me provide it. Click on OK. And once you will uh, do that, so now your connection will be established. So I provided uh, the uh, particular password that I have used for my Active Directory. So I shall wait now. Okay, so let me try connecting it once again. Okay, so here it comes up. So let me click on OK. You must restart your computer to apply these changes. So I'll again click on OK. So now uh, it will be basically restarted, and once it is done, then we will be moving on. So then we shall be restarting the things. Okay, so we have done all of the things now it's all about uh, the restart so let me restart it okay. so let me do it okay let me click on restart now once again okay so now it, it will get restarted the remote desktop session is end your uh, remote computer is restarting let me click on ok so now again i will be connecting to it let me see if it is available or not. Okay, so uh, I'll be giving few more time. After that, what we will be doing is we will be moving into our Amazon FSX, and here I'll select the Amazon FSX and I'll click on Attach. And here I will have to copy this and paste it there. So let me check. Let me select the machine. Let me try connecting it once again. So let me download the RDP once again. So let me open it. Click on connect. So it will ask for me the password. Let me get the password once again. Click on upload password. This is the particular key. I'll click on open. And once I'll do that, I'll click on decrypt the password. So I'll uh, basically have the password with me. And now let me connect it. So I'll click on OK. Click on yes. Okay, so now the things are available. So once I'll move inside it, I'll copy that and I'll paste it in the command prompt. Then we shall be able to see the things. Yeah, so now uh, it's available. So now uh, if I'll go here, we'll be able to see. Let me go into this files or from here also. Here only, let me go to files. So if I will move here right now, so if I will move into this PC, yeah, so you can only see that local disk C is now available. So now uh, after the things, you will be able to see another particular uh, storage option will be available to us. Let me open the command prompt. Yeah, the things will be pretty slow, but we need to uh, wait. So after this, what I will do? I'll open the command prompt. After that, I'll go to Amazon FSX. So I'll copy it. And uh, once I copy it, so I'll come back here. And here I'll paste it. So the if you want whatever directory uh, name you can give, you can basically give whatever directory or drive you want. Let me go for hatch. So once I give give it hatch, then after that, I'll uh, simply enter. So it will basically ask for the username to me. So uh, the username that uh, will be of mine is this particular uh, thing, shub.tk. So let me copy it. So you can come back here and here you can paste it. And after that, you have to give the slash. And here you have to type admin. Once you type the admin, hit enter. It will ask you for the password, uh, give the password that you have given for your Active Directory. 
after that hit enter you can see the command uh, completed successfully once it is done uh, now if i'll go back and now if i will move into this pc you will be able to see we have successfully uh, given or we have successfully mounted our uh, amazon fsx on to our windows system amazon fsx for lustrum so fsx for lustrum make it uh, very easy to launch and run the world's most popular file system so if we will look into the uh, amazon fsx for windows file server there if you want to use it then you need to be available with uh, microsoft active directory and you have to use that and along with that amazon fsx for windows file system you have to use then only you will be able to use it once you integrate this three thing with your uh, machine but if you will compare it with the lustre then it is far more easier to work with lustre file system is an open source and parallel file system that support many requirement of leadership class hpc simulation environment now if we will look into the hpc simulation environment what exactly the things are happening hpc basically is high performance computing let us say uh, we can use it for incredibly computational uh, intensive task like quantum mechanics glass uh, exploration and forecasting so there wherever we need better hpc simulation there we can uh, use the fsx for lustre for storing our files we will look more into it in our uh, use cases now if we will look into the feature of amazon fsx for lustre uh, whatever features we are having in microsoft uh, uh, file system we will be having all those things but few add ons will be there what are those things first of all we will have a seamless integration with our amazon s3 data so what is the major benefit if we are able to integrate to it with our s3 let us say if our data is present in the s3 then we can track our data much more properly we will be having our uh, buckets uh, so we can uh, even give the policies as per our need and we can make our uh, file system much more secure we will be able to uh, make our luster much more secure by because every aws uh, service uh, provide us with the encryption so we can make our luster even more secure and our s3 policies we can make and uh, we can even make our s3 more uh, safer now uh, it is one of the world's uh, best and high performance file system that is being available to us you can also access the luster from the on premises so just like the other uh, file systems uh, if you will see it is simple and fully managed data accessible to other aws services also so the integration of uh, amazon fsx for lustre uh, has with other services also and multiple deployment options also you get when you will be using lustre so uh, as we are able to integrate it with the s3 then it makes the processing of our data far more easier we can uh, have the data in our s3 we can go through it and if we want uh, to use it then also we can use it uh, let us see if there is a particular data which was present in our uh, lustre then we have moved the data from lustre to the s3 from the s3 we can load that data into our redshift and then we can start using it so basically it makes accessibility to the data far more easier and whatever operations we want to perform we can also perform that very well now if we will look into the use cases uh, machine learning uh, uses massive amount of training data so we can basically store all those datas in our lustre and uh, also machine learning is changing the experience of the hpc simulation because if you will uh, go for forecasting or for gas exploration everywhere machine learning is being used so if uh, we are able to integrate the machine learning with our lustre file system then it can uh, provide us with uh, enormous uh, results and let us see if you want to do any media processing like rendering of a video visual effects there also the data that is being created you can simply put it there to your uh, fsx uh, for the lustre from there you can have it into the your s3 and you can do whatever you want to do so that is the major benefit of the fsx for lustre it is very much simple as compared to the other or uh, uh, amazon fsx that have been present 
So if you are using Amazon FSLs for Lustre, then it make it easy and cost effective to launch and run the popular and high performance Lustre file system. Moreover, we can use Lustre for workloads where storage speed matter such as machine learning or high performance computing. So now let's go and create our file system. So I'll click on create file system. This is the one that we'll be choosing uh, Amazon FSX for Lustre. I'll select it. After that, I'll move down and I'll click on next. Once you'll click on next, then you can provide the file system uh, name. So let me give it FSX file system only. So after providing that, you can come and choose the deployment and storage type. So I'll be going on with scratch and SSD. SSD basically is the storage type that is being provided to me. So after that, we will be coming down to throughput per unit of storage. So here, uh, I'll be giving the storage capacity. The minimum size that I can provide here is 1.2 TIB. So I'll be giving that 1.2 TIB. And once I give that 1.2 TIB, then the throughput capacity will be calculated upon 200 uh, Mbps TIB into 1.2 TIB and that comes out to be 240. So after that I'll move down and here once I reach in network and security, here the uh, particular VPC that I'll be choosing will be default VPC. Now here comes uh, to specify the VPC security group and here if you will come down you will be able to see the VPC security group associated with your file system network interface must allow inbound uh, luster traffic like TCP port 988 101 uh, sorry 1021 to 1023. So this thing we have to enable in our machine. So I have already uh, launched an machine if you will see the name. So this is the particular machine that is running Amazon Linux FSX and uh, the AMI that I have chosen for this machine is uh, Amazon Linux and it is currently available. So now uh, let us go into its security group and do the following changes that is being asked to us to do. So we will move into this and after that we will click on edit inbound rules. So here basically we will be adding a few more rules like custom TCP and the port range that we will be giving here is 988 and I will make it at anyway IPv4. After that I will click on add rules and here again it will be custom TCP only and after that the port range that I will be specifying here is 1021 to 1021. So after that, I'll uh, choose anywhere IPv4. So uh, we have done uh, whatever things needed to be done. And after that, I'll click on save changes. And why we have given such? Because we want to connect with our machine. After that, I'll click on save rules. So here it is launch user 29. So if you want to give that particular um, security group, you can also choose that. Or else you can go on with so it's default only. So let me choose it. So after that, uh, you can select the subnet in which your uh, particular file uh, system will reside. So you can choose it. So mine it's for default US East one. So I'll go with that. And after that, if you will come into data repository, uh, then you can import or export. So this is an optional step. If you want the particular data uh, of your file system to be imported or exported to S3, you can do this, but I'll be not doing it. After that, I'll simply click on next and you can basically uh, review the things and after that, you can see uh, what are the things that is being enabled, editable after creation. So you can see what are not editable after creation, your deployment type, your storage type and the other things that you can see. After that, you can click on create file system. So uh, it will take a few moments to be available so we shall wait till that okay so i waited for uh, five to six minutes and uh, now you can see our file system is available so now uh, let's go back to our uh, ec2 management console and now let's connect our machine so i'll click on connect and after that i'll come here and i'll click on connect So now uh, once I am successfully able to connect it, so first of all I will update it, sudo yum update 
and once I update it okay, so all of the things will get updated and once I update it uh, then I'll be installing a de uh, particular dependency so that I can use my Amazon FSx cluster so I'll wait uh, once uh, this particular updation is done then I'll be installing the dependency then we shall be moving forward Oh, so once it has been uh, successfully uh, particularly you can say updated now uh, let us install this particular dependency and it goes something like uh, sudo amazon linux extras after that you have to click on install minus y plus free 2.10 and uh, once you type this particular command after that you have to click on enter so basically it will uh, install all of the dependencies that we require for connecting uh, with our particular amazon fsx so after that what we have to do we have to select our file system and we have to click on attach once you click on attach then we have to make a directory and apart from that if you want to see um, this is the particular file system id you can basically move inside it and uh, you can check other things like uh, the network security the monitoring aspect the administration data repo we have uh, not created any s3 for that so we'll not be getting it so if any updates uh, available then we can see that the network security can come to the subnet and you can choose all of the network interface that is being attached so now let me go on to attach and uh, we have to uh, make a particular directory so let me copy this particular command and so copy it take it back and simply paste it here and once you paste it hit enter so now if i'll do ls command you will be able to see th this particular directory uh, is already been created though we are not able to see it but no worries so let me take this particular command now i'll copy it and if i'll paste it here now and if i'll hit enter and now if i will do df minus h command now we'll be able to see that we have successfully uh, made this uh, amazon fsx and it is mounted upon our fsx directory so basically this signifies the fact that uh, this fsx is also got created and we have successfully mounted it upon our particular dns name that we will given so here was the regular fsx dns name that was given to us and we have successfully mounted our things upon that so this was the particular thing that we needed to uh, accomplish and we have successfully done it first of all we will look for windows file server now if let us say we are in the region north virginia so the type of storage options that we are going to have is ssd storage capacity hdd storage capacity throughput storage capacity and backup storage capacity now depending upon the single az deployment or a multiple az deployment we are going to get the pricing for that let us say if i am using ssd storage capacity and i want to have a single az deployment then i have to pay 0 0.130 dollar per gb per month but if I choose with the same storage option multiple AZ deployment, then I'll be paying $0.230 per GB per month. Similarly, we will be having other storage options available. Now, let us move into a problem statement and try to understand the things. So, here if I will move it, we can see the problem statement is there. Assume you want we want to store 10 TB of general purpose file share data using HDD storage in the US East North Virginia. Based upon the typical uh, duplications, saving of 50 to 60 percent, we provision 5 TB multiple AZ file with 16 Mbps of throughput capacity. Also assume that we have an average uh, backup storage of 5 TB during the month. So, Upon this 10 TB, we are going to segregate it into 5 and 5 TB. So, 
if we will look in uh, to the very first statement here we are using hdd storage capacity and it is if you will uh, look in it is for uh, multi ac so if we will uh, go back here and if we will see here in the hdd uh, storage capacity for multi ac uh, we have to pay 0.025 per gb per month now if we will move in we can see that 5 tb is going to get multiplied with 0.025 because we are using HDD so from that we will be able to calculate what exactly we are going to uh, get billed for for the storage now if we will uh, look into the uh, throughput then 16 mbps of throughput we are using now if we will uh, go back so we can see the throughput capacity for multi AZ is 4.5 dollar per mbps per month so here we have done that same thing 16 mbps into uh, 4.5 dollar per mbps uh, per month so it is going to be 72 dollar per month now we are taking a backup of 5 tb now if i will uh, go back here we can see uh, whether it is single az or multiple az uh, the price is gonna same it is 0 0.050 dollar per gb per month so upon that we will do the calculation and once we do the uh, calculation we will be getting the total monthly charge that is going to be 456 dollar so this is how you can do the uh, particular uh, pricing of your windows file server now let's look for the lustre now here if you will uh, look for the lustre then uh, we are having uh, different storage options that is being available to us either we can choose the scratch or we can choose the persistent now upon that uh, upon the particular mbps tib baseline we will be uh, going to get build let us say if i'm using the scratch so for 200 mb uh, per second uh, per tib baseline up to 1.3 gb per second per tib burst i'm going to get build 0 0.14 dollar now if i'll move in and if i'll see the problem statement then what it is telling me assume we have a scratch file system so basically we are using this scratch storage option in the us east north virginia region which has been provisioned with four uh, 4800 gb of storage capacity we spin up our file system for eight hours workload every day and then shut it down we do this uh, for the 30 days now if i will uh, move back in and i can see that for scratch uh, what is the price that I'm going to pay? It is 0 0.14 dollar per GB per month. But here uh, the calculation that uh, we are going to have is 8 hours. So I, first of all, I have to find that for 1 hour, how much exactly is I'm paying? So how can I find it? Uh, if it is for per month, I'll divide it by 30. And after that, I'm going to divide it by 24 so that I'll be getting for per hour how much exactly is it costing me so i got the things and once i get uh, how much it is costing me i'll then uh, multiply it with the 400 gb of storage capacity upon eight hours because i'm going to run it for eight hours and for 30 days and whatever is the cost and that is going to be the cost for my lustra so basically this is how you can uh, do the calculation upon the things so if we will uh, look into the term tenancy then what basically that means that basically determine who is the owner of the particular resource let us say if you are having a house then it might happen that you are the owner of that particular house so that is what happened in instance tenancy we try to figure it out that who exactly is the owner of a particular instance if you will uh, look into this scenario which is known as shared or default instances then we can see that uh, there are a lot of EC2 machines running and uh, those EC2 machines are running upon our underlining hardware and uh, it is also having Zen hypervisor because AWS uses Zen hypervisor so that one particular underlining hardware is being used by lot of customers so that is what you can say is the default or you can say shared tenancy uh, or you can say shared instances where there is one hardware and the users are uh, more than one who are using that hardware.
Now, if we will uh, go into the dedicated instance, what will happen? There will be only one customer who will be using the underlining hardware. So that is the difference in between shared and dedicated instance. So in one, you are having lot of users using uh, underlining resources and in one, you are the uh, or you can say there is only one particular customer using that particular instance. Now let's move and try to understand what exactly is reserved and spot instances. But before that, we have to understand what is this placement group. So let us say uh, you launch an EC2 instance, then your EC2 instance is uh, spread upon the underlying hardware in such a manner that the failures of that uh, EC2 instance can be minimized. And for that minimization, placement groups plays a very bigger role. How? Because uh, placement group uh, will look upon the workload, then uh, it will do the placement in such a manner that your instance will be able to meet the workload that is being distributed. So that is what your placement group does. It will look into the underlying hardware, it will look upon the particular workloads that are being employed and after that it will do the uh, particular you can say uh, it will place your instances in that manner. So we, we also have the cross uh, platform placement group. So there what will happen let us say if we are uh, having a particular uh, storage option that is being shared then it has to be shared in such a manner that it is available to every of the particular availability zones or to the regions and it should be available for majority period of time. It should not go down. So that thing also our placement group ensures. Now let's try to understand what exactly is a reserved and spot instance. So basically reserved instance uh, you can say is a type of a contract in which uh, you uh, buy out or you uh, pre-book your instances. Let us say right now your organization is using two instances and you have figured out that uh, in the near future, you are going to uh, need a more number of instances. So basically, you can pre-book your instances. And till the contract uh, expire, those particular instances will be available to you. Okay, either you can use it or you may not use it, but it will be available to you. Now the thing comes is that what is the uh, benefit if I am uh, having a particular instance reserved? Then let us say if you need a particular instance right now and you go and buy it out then the charges that you will be uh, bearing will be uh, more as compared to the reserved instance. If you reserved a particular instance then you can get the instances for much uh, discounted rates. Now you can uh, look into the instances sizes and the uh, normalization factor here and we, uh, we will be uh, able to figure it out. If you will uh, go and if you will uh, go for the reserved instances, then you will be uh, able to figure it out that uh, if we go for reserved instances, then we are able to save our cost enormously. So you can uh, also think in such a manner that uh, if you are uh, using a particular instance, let us say if you are uh, using a, a, you can say previous version of a machine right now, and if you pre-book a particular instance, then you can uh, even get the advanced uh, version of that particular machine in far more cheaper rate than whatever you are using. So that is basically uh, the benefit of using the reserved instances until the time the contract ends, the uh, particular period and uh, your instances will be available to you. So now if you will uh, look into the spot instances, uh, what exactly is the spot instance? Um, let us say if there is an any unused EC2 instance, uh, so you can uh, avail those instances in cheaper rate you can basically bid for that and uh, if the instance price uh, there uh, during your bid price then you will be able to get it but let us say uh, if the spot prices increases then the instances uh, will be terminated and you will uh, not uh, be able to get the instances so the benefit that you also get here in this spot instance is reserving uh, you can say you are able to save up your cost so that is the uh, major benefit so you can use so basically uh, you can think spot instances are those ec2 instances available to you for uh, cheaper rates which are uh, less than uh, those instances if you will go and buy which are on demand prices so you can get the ec2 instances uh, below the on demand prices 
so if we will uh, look into the pricing of ec2 then uh, if you are using uh, if you are under that free tier eligible criteria then you get uh, 750r per usage of your ec2 machine and uh, let us say if you are uh, not using that and uh, if you are not using t2.micro but if you are using other instance instance types let us say m5.large for that you have to uh, pay uh, 0.096 dollar per hour similarly uh, apart from t2.micro whatever things you are going to use you are going to pay for that let us say if your particular machine is getting any data transfer in so uh, it will be free but let us say if you are sending the data from your ec2 machine to uh, services like s3 glacier dynamo db uh, simple queue service simple email service in the same region if those are available in the same region then it is entirely free but let us say if uh, those things are uh, in the different region if your machine is in a different region and the services to whom you are sending it if those are in different region so you will be uh, basically uh, paying for uh, that let us say if you are using elastic ip then also you will be uh, paying for the thing uh, apart from that uh, depending uh, upon whether you are in same as you or not you will be also paying for it and let us see if you are using any resource so as per the uh, service level agreement which this is the agreement that has been done by the service provider and the client all of the resources will be available for 99.99 time now uh, if we will move in and uh, if we will uh, look into the pricing of on demand uh, let us say if you are using a particular uh, instance type that is uh, m5.xlarge then you can see for uh, using it per you have to uh, pay 0.192 uh, dollar but let us say if you uh, move into the reserve instance uh, for one to three year term pricing then you will be able to save a lot of a lot of your cost uh, if you are using the reserve instance because you will be reserving the things uh, early and if you are uh, reserving the things early then you can uh, save enormously so that is what uh, we are having in the reserved instance so now let us say if you are using the evs then uh, for the you will be definitely getting a particular free tier uh, a particular amount of data free you can see uh, it that you are going to have 30 gb per month uh, of free ebs data accessibility with a combination of gp2 and magnetic with uh, some uh, input output operations and with some snapshots uh, but uh, let us say if you are uh, not under the free tier and let us say if you are using this gp2 provision iops uh, or you can say throughput optimized then you will be paying for that if you create the snapshot then also you will be paying for it if you are not under that free tier eligible criteria and let us say if you have used the ebs uh, and if you have stored the data for uh, more than you can say 30 gb then also you will be paying it and as per the uh, service level agreement the ebs will be also available for 99.99 times iam basically if you will see it is made up of uh, three words and here we need to uh, give a special attention to the first uh, two words that is identity and access so what basically does that this two particular word mean identity and access let us say if you are having an aws account so there if you want to uh, use that particular account so you for using that account first of all you need to be a user and let us say if you are a user now uh, after that because you are a user so you will be able to authenticate yourself basically you can sign in into the account because you will be having all the credentials to sign in into the account so you can basically sign in but let us say after that signing in uh, you need to do a lot of work because just simply signing in is not uh, what you desired for you also desired for working there uh, you wanted to interact with the services so for interacting with the services you need uh, to have the permissions available you you need it to be authorized because let us say if you are creating an aws account then the first time that you create an account then at that time you become a root user 
so root user is uh, having all of the permissions uh, it uh, basically has the full admin access so it can basically use all of the services all of the resources without any restriction but let us say if you are uh, not an a root user you are an iam user then by default uh, no permission is being made available to you so basically uh, you needed to be given the permissions and only if you are having the permissions so you will be able to work so that is what uh, we will be looking in in the iam so basically first of all you need to have the identity available with you you need to be a user and once you are uh, the user then the particular uh, whosoever has created your account need to specify uh, what exactly can you access let us say uh, if the particular user who has created uh, a new user uh, has not specified any of the particular uh, permissions or you have not given you any access so you will not be able to work you will just go inside the particular console and you will be stuck there so that is what we do in iam first of all we create a user and give the credentials basically first of all we authenticate that user after that we authorize what exactly that user can do so that we can uh, securely control the access of all of the aws services and resources so now uh, the thing comes is uh, let us say if i have created a particular account then i am the root user why exactly cannot uh, why i needed to create more users because if i am having the root account available with me i can give it to everyone and they can start interacting why to unnecessarily create a lot of user then the answer to that is let us say in a organization we are having different team there will be financial team there will be operational team there will be support team and there will be devops team so a lot of teams are there there will be analytics team so let us say if there is a particular uh, financial team so they need not to have the access of ec2 they don't uh, want to interact with ec2 what they want they want to interact with the database they wanted to uh, get the information about uh, the people for and how exactly is the payment being done so why to give them the uh, other service permissions because if they are uh, not aware about those services then it might happen that they sometimes start the services and they might misuse it and let us say there is a particular devops team there so they don't need to have the access to each and every service they needed to have an access to ec2 instance let us say so we can give the permission to the devops team okay they can access the ec2 and if there is a particular admin that admin require uh, the full permission so we can avail them the full permissions so that is what we can do using the iam basically we can specify whatever a particular user require or whatever a particular group require we can specify the permissions to them and they can start working so that is why we are in need of iam so that uh, people uh, with we want to restrict the limitation so that people cannot misuse it and we will be having a much more control over whatever things we are doing so let us look into what is arn amazon resource name so amazon resource name is a sort of a unique identifier for all of your uh, resources this arn is being created by default by the aws and if we will look in uh, why do uh, aws create this arn it is because let us say you in your account uh, hundreds of resources are running so let us say now aws want to bill it so aws will not uh, do the billing by taking consideration uh, into the things uh, into the names that you have specified let us say i am having a two ec2 instance running my first ec2 instance name is ubuntu1 and my second ec2 instance is ubuntu2 now aws will not bill my instances upon the name that okay ubuntu1 was running for uh, more than 750 hours so it has got billed because why uh, will aws will not do because in the later stage it might create a lot of confusion let us say today you ran ubuntu 1 after 15 days you stopped it and you uh, created an another instance and then you also given the same name to that particular machine so identification purpose uh, it will be chaotic and we will be not able to track the things properly 
but let us say if the ARN is there, so let us say if any billing things needed to be done, then AWS can build the uh, things upon the ARN. So basically it is a unique identifier that AWS keeps track of. You can also use it, uh, let us say if you are creating a work policy, then in the policy you needed to specify the ARN, so there also you can use the ARN. Now if we will look into the ARN format, basically uh, it uh, comes with uh, three. The first one is ARN and in the partition AWS will be written, after that the service name, the region in which it is uh, running, then the account ID, the 12 digit account ID will be there and after that what instance uh, or you can say what resource is it running. If it is EC2 it will be mentioned there uh, or you can say EC2 instance is running. So those things will be uh, there specified and the other tools are uh, having uh, just little difference there uh, before the resource we will be getting resource type. Now let us see example to understand it uh, more clearly. Let us say uh, if uh, a particular EC2 instance is running. So how exactly will the things look like? ARN uh, colon AWS service the region in which it is running after that the account ID will be there then instance and after that the instance ID. Similarly for AMI also uh, we get this similar sort of thing. So for basically whatever resource you use or whatever service you use for that you are going to have the uh, IRN and basically AWS will clip uh, track of the thing and they can uh, do the billing uh, in a much more clear manner and let us say if you are specifying any policies then also you will require this ARN so that you can specify it in the policy. So now if we will look into IAM hierarchy. Now let us say uh, you are having a permissions like uh, you can create users, you can create groups. Let us say if you have created a user, user1, then individually uh, you can uh, specify the permissions to them. But let us say uh, I am having a particular team, uh, particular DevOps team. In that particular team, uh, you can say uh, there are 100 uh, of users. So it is not a good idea to individually go to each user and attach the permission. So what I can do? I can create a group. In that group, I can uh, basically add all of the user and after that, I will attach the permission to that group. So if I am doing it, what will happen? All of the users present in that group will get the permission. So that is what we can do. And after that, we can specify, we can create uh, groups, we can create user, we can specify them in our groups and we can do the things. So what exactly is an IAM user? Uh, it is a sort of an entity which is there to interact with your particular account. Let us say uh, if you are having an account so you can create different users by allowing them different permissions to work with. Let us say if you have created a created your AWS account right now and you have started using it. So for the very first time uh, you will be interacting with the account and you will be interacting your account with the root user and uh, by default root user is uh, available with all of the permission that uh, it requires. So root user has full administrator access but this uh, particular thing does not applies to the IAM user you create. IAM user uh, by default has no permissions enabled. So it is up to you to avail whatever permissions you want that particular people to have. You can basically limit their scope. Let us say if you did not uh, provide them the permission then what will happen? Then they will be not able to interact with any of the resources or any of the services those will be there. So you have to basically give them the permissions. Once you give them the permission then only they will be able to work. Now let us say if you are creating an IAM user then you will be giving their username and after that they need to authenticate their self when they will doing the sign. So generally uh, the way that we prefer 
is uh, going through the uh, management console there uh, they have the password available uh, with them so they can use the password and they can uh, directly go into the aws account and they can start using the thing but there is an another way out also and that is through the programmatic access let us say uh, if you are uh, working uh, on a particular platform like uh, terraform and you uh, want to access your aws account so that options also you can uh, made available if you have enabled the programmatic access. Now uh, what basically uh, can be done in programmatic access. So users will be doing API call and they will be using this CLI to access the AWS resource. Also there are other ways of programmatic access also uh, through the access keys. So but uh, most often uh, the two options are available while creating a user either you can give them the programmatic access or you can uh, make them available through the management console you can basically give them the password and they will be able to log in and uh, let us say if they are using a programmatic access way then they can use the command line interface through that uh, they can do the api calls from program and they can access the account and they can then start using it now uh, let us say if there is a particular iam user and uh, it want to access the thing using the programmatic way for programmatic access you need to have a key that is known as access key so just like uh, we uh, take care of our credentials similarly we will also need to take care of our access key why because let us say if I am having uh, my username and I don't remember the password and if I will uh, through the root account if I try to see the particular uh, account uh, a particular user password then AWS will not let it show. So what that particular user can do that particular user can simply uh, reset their password and if AWS is not letting the password to be seen by the user why are they doing it for better uh, you can say security purpose similarly just like you do a uh, login into your account through the credentials similarly if you are using the access key then you can do the programmatic way of accessing your account so just like your credentials you also need to keep your access keys secret also now at a given time only two active keys uh, will be there so let us say if there is a particular active key one which is active and which is uh, not active so you can uh, what you can do either you can uh, delete that access key and you can create a new access key so let us say if you are creating an access key then you can download it and you can keep secure with you so maximum two active uh, access key you can have at a particular time now if you look into IAM groups what we basically do let us say if we are creating n number of users so basically n number of users will be working in some department let us say there are six department and in six department 600 people are working and those 600 people want to access the AWS account so giving the permissions to each of them individually is a very problematic way or you can say chaotic way uh, because it will take a lot of time and even managing the things uh, will not be that much easy uh, the boundary scope also we will not be able to define properly so what basically we can do we can create uh, six groups after creating six groups we can uh, basically add all of those users there and we can attach the permissions there and let us see if any restriction needed to be put how we can put it i can simply put it into the groups and in the group whosoever user are there upon them also the particular uh, rules will be specified now let us say if you are interacting with your account so you can go for a multi-factor authentication or you can say it is a two-way authentication at the beginning uh, let us say if you are having the credentials available with you you can uh, access it but let us say it might happen that sometimes you may not uh, you may disclose your particular account credentials like your username your password may get exposed so for that what you can do you can put mfa in your particular account so mfa comes with three ways either uh, you can uh, opt 
for the uh, security token based if you are opting for security token based multi factor authentication then you have to purchase the device that is being uh, you, you can see in your screen let us say if you choose it uh, the sms based so you can uh, basically have to uh, you will get a sms in your particular account and you can use it or else what you can do you can uh, download the mfa uh, app available uh, from different uh, corporations like microsoft uh, available with the particular mfa google mfa is there so you can just link that mfa with your account and let us say oh, if you are trying to access your account then at the beginning you will be giving all of your credentials username password account id and after that a security code will be sent in that mfa and once you uh, put the mfa there that mfa code then only you will be able to log in so let us say if you uh, by mistake uh, expose your particular uh, credentials then also no one will be able to access it because they will not be having the mfa available with them now let's look into json because in iam we can create policies and the policy is actually written in the json format so json is javascript object notion so a javascript object uh, notation if you will see how exactly will it work let us say if you are a particular employee so you you will be having all of these details like you will be having an employee id employee name you will be living somewhere so that address you can specify you can specify whatever skills you are aware of you can uh, specify uh, the cars available with you so those things you can specify similarly when we will be also creating the policies this is not exactly uh, the thing that we will be specifying in policy but yeah this is the way in which we will be uh, doing the json i uh, will be uh, specifying the json policies so we can uh, have a look and we can get an idea okay in similar fashion we will be specifying there the resources the action that needed to be done and each and everything so that is what i uh, will be doing now if i'll move forward so this is the particular uh, previous json file only that is being available so uh, i am currently in my iam dashboard so here if i'll go down you can see all of the users that are being currently available and now let us see if we want to create a user so we will see how to create it we have to click on add user so after clicking on add user we will be giving a name let me give the name as dev1 so once i click on the user as dev1 so the name has been given now let us say in one go you want to create another user so you can also do that you can just click on add another user and you can give here the name dev2 let us say if you want to add another user you can do it by using typing here dev3 so let me give it a name dev3 demo dev2 demo and dev3 demo so let us say if you have created all of the users name that you wanted to create after that if you will come down here then you have to select aws access type either uh, we can you can go with the password that generally we do or you can give the access through the programmatic access by that what uh, the particular user will be doing let us say the user want to access the particular account then they can use all of this available uh, option that is aws api cli sdk and other development tools that is being available but we will go with password so let me select the password once i click on that then it will ask me okay tell us the way to uh, generate the password either you want to give the custom password basically custom password will be the password that you can give and the uh, auto generated password will be generated automatically so i'll choose the custom password after that i'll be giving a password so let me give a password let us say if i give the password after that there is an option of require a password reset user must create a new password at new sign in let us say for the very first time any of this user sign in into the aws management console then after that what they have to do they have to reset the password if you want you can tick it or if you don't want you can just uncheck the box so i'll uncheck it i don't want 
want that thing to happen. After that, what I'll do, I'll click on next permissions. So here, it will tell you to set the permissions. So what basically this step means, let us say if you are creating a user, then by default, no permission is given. Let us say if you want to create an EC2, then you should be having the permission. Let us say if you want to delete the EC2, you should be having the permission. Let us say if you want to access any of the service, maybe it's EC2, S3, RDS, IM, SNS, Lambda, then you need to have that permission. If you don't have that, then you won't be able to do. And let us say if you are creating a new user, except the root user, then by default, no permission is enabled. So you should be setting up the permissions. Let us say if the particular user you have created and these are the groups that are being available. Let us say these groups are having some attached policy like Amazon EC2 full access and there are other policies like administrator access. If you just attach the user to this group, then whatever this group is having the permission that user will get. So you can also do that. But for the time being, all I will do is creating an user and then we will look in the other way of attaching the roles or you can say the policies once we create it. So there are other ways also you can directly copy permissions from existing user. You can choose any user and whosoever user is having whatever permissions attached to them, you can get that or you can click on attach existing policies directly. That also that option also you can do. But for the time being, I will not do it and I'll just move forward. I click on next tags. If you want to give the tag, you can do it. Let me give it value as user. Whatever you want, you can do it. So after that, let's click on next preview. So this basically will uh, tell you that, okay, your user have no permission. Even if your user login into your AWS management console, then they will not be able to do anything. So you can see that. And after that, and just once you click on uh, create user, so all of the users has now been created. Now, if I'll just close it, and now if I will take you into the user section, you will be able to see the new users, dev1 demo, dev2 demo and dev3 demo. So if I'll move here, you can see dev1 demo, dev2 demo and dev3 demo. So these are the users that we have just created. Now let us see how to create the groups. So what I have to do, I have to click on user group. And once I click on that, these are the available groups that are being available right now. So let me create a group. Once I'll click on a group, it will tell me, okay, give the user group name. Let me give it um, dev1 and 2 group. After that, you can just choose the users that you want to attach. So let me choose dev1 demo and dev2 demo. So after this, if you want to attach any policy, you can do that. For the time being, I'll not do it. I'll simply click on create group. Okay, so the group has been now created. Now you can see dev1 and dev2 group is available. Similarly, let me create another group and this will be dev3 group. I'll click it if you want. Uh, okay, so let me select the user. Then select it and in one group also, you can keep the other users also. And after that, if you want to give the permissions, you can give it. For the time being, I'll not do it and I'll simply click on create group. Now the group has been created. You can see I have recently created this two group and the users you can also see permissions right now they don't have any permission. Now let me go into the incognito mode and uh, now in the private browser let me try logging in. Let us say for dev1. So I'll show you. I'll click on sign into console. So now as I have not given any permission, so even if I log in, I will not be able to do anything. So let me give it, after that username, let me give one demo, after that I will give the password, once I will give the password, I will click on sign. So now uh, you will be able to see that I am able to log in, but I will not be able to do anything. Let us say if I move into EC2 here. If I move into EC2, you will see that I don't have any permissions to do. Okay, I don't have any permission to work with anything. All will show me API error. So what basically does this mean? That means that I don't have any permissions to do. 
Let me go into instance running. So let me try launching instance. You can see here. Yeah, let me choose an for that. Let me choose an AMI. You can see the AMI ID is not valid. The AMI may no longer exist. All these things are coming because you can see I am not able to choose instance type. I will not be able to see uh, the key pair that is also available. You are not authorized to perform this option. You can see basically what problems I am facing because I don't have the permissions. So this is how uh, we have seen in this particular demo how to create a user and the user group IAM policies. So in IAM policy, if you will see, we have to basically specify a JSON document or you can say the policies are written uh, in the JSON format and there we can also create uh, the particular policies in JSON format and if we uh, specify those policy uh, to our user or to our group we can also work. Now let us say if there is a particular JSON policy in JSON format then there are few things that we need to be uh, aware of and what are those three things uh, that we need to few things that we need to be aware of we will look into that but there are three significant things that we should be aware of we basically call them as year and what are those effect action and resources now if we will look into effect what exactly do we specify there we specify there that let us say if there is a particular action whether it will be allowed or it will not be allowed basically whether it is it will be allowed or it will be denied that is all that we need to do in the effect so only uh, two words we have to write either allow or we can deny it let us say there is a particular policy that is uh, of your bucket bucket uh, deletion you go into the effect you go into the bucket policy and there in the policy in the bucket section there will be the option of allowed let us say you deny it then no one will be able to delete your bucket because in the policy it has been mentioned that deletion is not allowed so that is what we do in effect now let us come into action in action we basically specify what exactly can be done. Let us say if you are having a policy, in the policy, in effect, you have given the particular word that is allowed. Now, in the action, we will be specifying what exactly is allowed. Let us say if there is a particular bucket of yours, in that, uh, there is in the action. Uh, in the effect you have given the allow and in the action you have specified everything so if you have given in action everything an asterisk sign is would be given if you have given that what will happen then anyone can uh, put data into a bucket can delete uh, data from your bucket they can uh, do uh, the versioning enabled they can uh, tweak the life cycle management uh, the particular data uh, accessibility will be there so everything can be done but let us say there is a bucket of yours you only want that someone if accessing your particular s3 bucket they can only put object in that they cannot uh, delete it they cannot do anything other than uh, just putting the object so you can specify so where can you specify that you can specify it in action let us say if you are creating an EC2 instance, so you can basically specify that particular policy that let us say if there is a particular user, that particular user only has the permission to create an EC2 instance. The particular user cannot start it, cannot launch it and even it cannot terminate it. So that's things you can specify in the action. After comes resources. In resources, basically what you specify, you specify the ARN of the particular resource you want to use. Let us say if you are putting a particular policy upon a bucket. So in the resource, you have to specify the ARN of that bucket. 
if you are specifying the ARN of that bucket in the resource, then only the policy will be applied upon that particular bucket. Now once the policy is created, you can either attach the policy to the user or to the group. If you are attaching a particular policy to the group, whosoever users are present in that group, they will have the accessibility uh, based upon the policy that you have specified or whatever thing you have specified in the policy, they will be able to do. So in resources, what basically we specify, we specify the entity that can take the action on AWS resource. You can basically specify the S3 here and if you want to do something with S3. Let us say if there is a particular uh, policy that you have created in which you have specified that from a specific account ID and from that account ID a specific user only can access the bucket. That thing also you can specify in the resource. You can basically give the ARN and you can do the things. Now let's look into the policy how exactly is this policy looks like. First of all we have to give the version. Currently the version is 2012 slash 10 slash 70. So once you specify the version you come into the statement. Statement contains everything. It contains your effect, your action, your resources. So as you can see in the effect we have allowed, we have allowed it. And in the action what we have given? We have basically uh, given the permission of list bucket. So only that particular thing will be applicable, nothing more than that. And after that in the resources, we have given the ARN of the S3 bucket upon which the things is being done. So this is a policy with single statement. We can have n number of statement in a particular policy. So we can have more complex policies also. So in the policies, if you will see, we will be having a statement. In the statement, we can also specify statement IDs. Let us see if there are a more number of statements. So you can specify the IDs for them. In effect, we already know either you can allow the particular policy or you can deny it. In the principle, uh, you can basically give the ARN of the AWS user account or service which is allowed or denied access to the AWS resource. So you can do that thing in the principle. In the action, you can specify what exactly needed to be done. In the resource, you can specify what is the particular resource. Let's, let us say if you are using the S3 bucket, so you can specify that has three ARN and you will be able to do it. In condition, you basically specify a particular uh, condition or you can say a particular time when that particular policy will come into an effect. And in principle, you basically specify the ARN of the user. From a specific account, a specific user want to access it, you can specify the ARN there in the principle. If you want uh, a particular uh, user from different account want to do the things, you can also specify it. Now, if you will look into the IAM policy, so there are three different types of policies. First policy is AWS managed policy. What exactly happened in AWS managed policy? Basically, AWS create those policies and it is being available to us. Let us say if there is a root account, the root account, if you will go and look into the permissions, what exact permission does that root account have? Full administrator access. So that full administrator access is a particular policy which is AWS managed. AWS has already created it and it is there available. Similarly, we also have a particular uh, policy like uh, EC2 full access. DynamoDB full access. Sim so all of those services are AWS managed. Now comes uh, the policies which are customer creates. So what uh, can it be? Let us say you go into policy and you create a particular policy. In that policy you specify two things. Full access to EC2 and full access to S3. 
you create that policy and after creating the policy you attach it to the particular user and the third type of policy is inline policy let us say you are uh, creating a particular user so there uh, can be some of the policies which can get inherent basically while the creation of user only or you can uh, basically go into uh, the policy and there you can specify whatever things you require let us say if you are creating a policy in which the particular user can uh, only create the ec2 instance cannot delete uh, the ec2 instance cannot uh, terminate it cannot run it so those type of policies you can do it and those type of policies will be there under inline policies or you can say inline policies are those policies which are inherent policies so these are the three different types of policy that is being available now if you look into uh, examples allow user to access specific s3 bucket so you can uh, look into that json type of policy if you look into the uh, first one so there we have allowed the version once we have allowed the versioning after that uh, after sorry after after specifying the version we have given the effect allow what is the action that we have specified we have specified list all my bucket so that is what the things are being done in the second one you can see only two actions are been allowed list bucket and get bucket location so only those two things will be able to done nothing more than that that particular user will not be able to put the object or you can say uh, delete the object similarly you can create any type of policy and you can dictate what exactly needed to be done if you look to look into iam permissions as i already told you the root account has full admin access from the very starting but the case is not same with the iam user if a iam user is created by default that particular iam user will have no permissions you have to attach the permissions once you attach the permissions upon that only it will start working now let us say if you have already created a particular policy so you can uh, give them the permissions either individually or to the groups and once you give them the permission they will start working so now if i look into uh, iam permissions and they are uh, we get the permission policy in the role uh, we will be discussing about the iam roles in the upcoming sessions but now let us see if there is a particular role in role you can have permission policy or trust policy so permission policy is what uh, basically you give the permission to the user and what happen in trust policy in trust policy basically you uh, specify a particular condition uh, when exactly uh, a particular user will be able to do a particular thing when they can assume the role when is the particular specific condition they can start behaving in the way or you can say they can start using the permissions that you have specified so that is what happen in trust policy so when exactly do we use the trust policy let us say if there is a particular user of the same account and want to assume a particular uh, role different than its normal permissions so that we can do if a particular iam user is for different account then also we can uh, give uh, the particular trust policy to them we can also uh, go on for two other options if uh, another aws service needed to be uh, used upon or let us say if an external user uh, want to use the things let us say if you want to do the auditing of your particular account so you have to specify uh, the third party so that they can access the uh, particular things and they can start auditing but we, we need to specify when exactly can they assume the role for the account and after a particular time period they will not be uh, having the permissions to work with it so basically you can specify till how long will they be validated till how long uh, their credentials will be available because role 
enrolled we don't have the credentials for longer period of time how to create policies and attach it to our user and let us say if we have a policy and uh, we will see then how we can attach it it to our user group let us say if i am having a policy and if i attach it to the user group then what will happen whosoever users are present in the user group will get that access so we will look in that so let me show you if i'll move into the user so these are the three users that we have created dev1 demo dev2 demo and dev3 demo and here if i'll move into user group so you can see here in dev1 and 2 group uh, two users will be available and here if i move into users you can see dev2 demo uh, dev2 demo user and dev1 demo user similarly if i'll go back i will be having another user group that is dev3 group and here i am having only dev3 demo user so now let us see how to create a policy let me go here let me click on create policy so let us say if you want to create a policy of customized type let us say where you want to define what exactly your user will be doing so you can do that you can simply go into create policy after creating policy here you have to come and you have to choose the service let us say i want to give two permissions uh, to my user group they should be able to access ec2 and they should be able to access e s3 so how can I do that i simply have to type here ec2 you can see ec2 will pop up and here i can choose and here in the action let us say if i want to allow every action to my user group so simply you have to select on all ec2 action when you choose that you have to go down so here in the resources you have to click here so once you click on resources you have to click on all resources so select it after that click on add additional permissions now let us say we have given the permission for ec2 now let us give the permission for s3 so we'll select the s3 after that let us give all permissions after that let's click on our resources so here uh, let me choose all resources after that you have to click on next if you want to associate any tag with it you can do it and after that click on review so you can see whatever permissions you have given ec2 full access and s3 full access and we have not associated any tag with it so let me give a name to this dev1 dev2 policy policy so after that if you want the description to be given you can give or else you can simply leave it dev1 dev2 policy demo so let me give this name after that click on create policy so once you click on create policy your policy has now been created now let us see how to individually give the policy let us say if i'll move into user so here and let us let me first move into dev1 demo currently this dev1 demo is having no permissions so let me show you dev1 demo i have already logged in into this dev1 demo you can see here so let me refresh it if you will see i don't have any permissions to work on with if i move into any service i will not be able to access it you can see i am in s3 and it is telling uh, you don't have any authorized permissions let me go into let's say ec2 i was already in so let me go to now this time let me go into some any other service let us say lambda if i will move into lambda you will see i'll not have the permissions you are not authorized to perform similarly if i'll move into s3 you will see that i don't have that permission to work with you can see you will see that i will not be having the permissions yeah so i don't even have the permission to create the bucket so now let us do one thing let us give our dev1 user the permission so i'll click on add permissions you can simply come into user group and you have to click on add permission click on that after that you can select from attach existing policy directly and here you have to search the particular policy that you have created that is dev1 dev2 policy demo you can select it and you can just click on next add permission and the permission has now been given 
Now if I will go back here, so right now I, I am not getting any permissions. So let me, if I will refresh it, I will be able to see that I will be having all the permissions to work with S3. Now you can see, now I can even create a bucket. If I will click on create bucket, I will be able to create a bucket and I can do whatever I like. Let us, let me move into EC2. If I will move into EC2, here you can see I have the permissions. So that API error is now not visible. You can see I can even see how many projects, uh, how many particular you can say how many uh, instances are running. I can even launch the instance if I want. So here I will be able to choose the AMI. Here I will be able to choose the instance type that I want. I will be able to select the key pair that I want to have in. So I can basically do anything if I have the permissions. So similarly, if I'll go back here. Now, if I'll move into the user group. So here I'll be having dev2 user. So here if I'll move in dev1 and 2 user. So here if I'll move into dev2 demo. So this particular user don't have any permission. So this particular user don't have any permissions till yet. So now, first of all, let me log in into this particular dev2 user. So I will click on AWS Management Console login. Click on sign into console and let me log in first. Okay, so it directly came away. So let me log out from here. Click on sign out. I'll click on log back in. So let me log in for the dev2 user. Dev2 demo, I'll give the password. Now I'll just sign in. So you will see this particular user is not having any of the permissions till yet to work with. So if I'll move into let us say EC2. So this user will have no particular permissions given. Here you will see, yeah. So I don't have any permissions. So now let us do one thing. Let us go back and let's give the permissions not to the user but directly to the user group. So whosoever users are present in that group will be getting the particular permissions. So we will see that here if I will move back here let me go here let me select it go inside it out of that I will give the permissions this time not to any specific user but straight away to the user group. So I will click on add permissions I will click on attach policy so here I will select it I will hit enter you can see dev1 dev2 policy let me select it once I'll select it I'll come down I'll click on add permission now you can see policy attached to this user group now let us say if I'll go back I'll go back to the dev2 and if I'll refresh you will see that I have not attached the policy to my dev2 user I have attached it to the user group but my user is able to get the permissions. So this is how we can do if we want to give the permissions. Now let us say if I sign out from here, if you will see now my dev1 and dev2 what they can access, they can access only EC2 and S3 services only. So let us say if you want to give them the access of everything, how you can do that? You can simply choose the administrator access that is being present. So how to do it? So let me go back here. So in the user group, let me give the full admin access to this user, to this group. So I'll select it. Let me go inside it. And here, if I'll move into permissions, so right now it also not having any of the permission. Let me click on add permission. Let me click on attach policy. So here, if I'll type here admin, so now you will see administrator access has been enabled. So let me select this policy. This policy is by default present. I have not created it. Out of that, I'll click on add permissions. So policy attached to the user group. So now, if I log back in to the dev3 user, let me sign out from here. And if I will log in into my dev3 user, you will be able to see that particular user is able to access everything. Why? Because, because I have given the full admin access to that user. So let me quickly log in to that. So dev three demo let me give the password and let me sign 
So once I will click on sign in, you will be able to see whatever service I choose, I will be able to use it. Let me go to Elastic Beanstalk straight away. And I have given the full admin access to this. You can see, I will be able to create the application. If I will click on it, I will be able to create it. So once I choose the platform, everything will come up. If I choose it, you can see everything is coming up. Let me go to, let us say, VPC. If I will move into VPC, I will be able to work any of the services. Why? Because I have given the full admin access to the user. IAM roles. Now, role is similar to an user group which has permission policies attached to it. So, if this is similar, then why exactly are we not using policies and using roles? Let us say if there is a particular user and that particular user want to access a, a particular resource but for a very limited period of time and a specific task needed to be done and once that particular task is done that particular user does not need uh, to have that particular permission in that case what we can do we can create roles we can simply assign the roles to that particular user that particular user have to specify the uh, account id and the role name by going into switch to a roles option present in the AWS dashboard and they can do it. Let us see if there is a particular user who cannot access EC2 through the roles option we can made avail the EC2 option and let us say if there is a particular user who cannot access RDS or DynamoDB so we can uh, basically create the particular role assigned to them and let us say if the task for which they have been assigned is done now so simply we can terminate that particular role and they will be not able to access it and in the meantime if let's say a particular user is doing some work upon DynamoDB and earlier that user was having the access to the EC2 then we can uh, take back uh, that particular permission while the role is assigned and once they are done with their specific task again we can assign them with the permission and they can start working normally so that is what roles can do so now if we will move forward and if we will look this role can be uh, used in a much more wider sense also you can create a role and you can give the permission for using the EC2 instance of account 1 to a particular user present in some other account. Similarly, they can access the other services also. Let us say there is an organization and that organization in the one of their uh, particular offices situated in North Virginia, another one is there in Ohio and both of these particular organizations are having two different accounts. So we can do those integration and from one particular account they can get access to the other one. They can perform whatever task needed to be done. Let us say some optimization needed to be done. They can do it. And once they are done with that, we can simply uh, terminate the role. With creating role, we are uh, securing our environment or you can say securing our architecture or our account in much more better way. So that is what roles can do for us. Through the cross account roles, we have already discussed the thing. Not only EC2, all of the services they can avail. They can use it for a specific period of time to achieve their goal. Once the goal is done, simply we will terminate that role and they will be not able to use it. Now, how exactly can uh, the particular cross account roles can be worked upon? That can be worked upon using the identity federation. Now what exactly is that? Let us say if you are having a particular system there, you have uh, credentials of your Facebook and it is already logged in or you can say you are having the credentials of your Gmail. Now let us say if you are trying to access any of the website, it can be anything. So every time you will get an option of uh, not only website uh, to apps also you get an option of continue with 
जी मेल फेसबुक और सम अदर सोशल मीडिया हैंडल सो वट इज हैपनिंग देयर यू हैव ऑलरेडी लॉगड इन इन टू वन ऑफ द पर्टिकुलर प्लेटफॉर्म एंड दैट पर्टिकुलर प्लेटफॉर्म अकाउंट यू आर यूजिंग अगेन टू लॉग इन इन टू सम अदर वेबसाइट और ऐप सो इन द बैक एंड वॉट इज हैपनिंग लेट एस से यू हैव लॉगड इन इन टू योर जी मेल एंड इट इज दे आर अवेलेबल नाउ यू आर ट्राइंग टू लॉग इन इन टू एन वेबसाइट एक्स सो दैट पर्टिकुलर वेबसाइट एक्स विल हैव अ पर्टिकुलर से टू द जी मेल दैट कैन यू वैलिडेट द पर्टिकुलर यूजर इंटरक्टिंग विथ अ वेबसाइट एंड इफ जी मेल वैलिडेट दैट पर्टिकुलर यूजर देन यू कैन स्टार्ट यूजिंग दैट पर्टिकुलर वेबसाइट एक्स सो दैट इज वट हैपन इफ यू आर यूजिंग आइडेंटिटी फेडरेशन सो आइडेंटिटी प्रोवाइडर विल बी देयर हु विल ऑथोराइज यू टू वर्क अपॉन द थिंग्स basically what does gmail did gmail just authorized that yes you are a genuine user and uh, you can use it so there are a lot of benefits if we are using identity federation the first benefit that we get from using identity federation is that we don't have to remember our login credentials a lot of time all we need is just one login credential if you remember your gmail user id and your password you can basically uh, access other websites also all you are doing is just signing up using the gmail account but there can be a disadvantage for that let us say if you are trying to uh, move into uh, the website x and that website x data breach happened so the advantage that you will get for the time being is that your particular uh, credentials will not be exposed but let us say if the vice versa happen if the identity provider uh, you can say from the identity provider the data breach has happened then you could land up in the problem so that is the disadvantage so that is what identity federation do either you you can uh, justify your identity using the web through google or through your amazon.com or from facebook.com you can simply continue or you can use saml so what happens in saml 2.0 a single sign on process is being done and once you sign in into a particular account all of the other accounts linked with that particular account will be showed up and through that you can start using the thing so you can use microsoft ad or ldap for that now let's look in how exactly do we do this particular thing in our roles so basically you can specify a condition when exactly that particular user will be able to do the thing so here we can specify you can assume the role with web identity if you are uh, trying to access the thing using the amazon.com facebook.com or through google accounts you can do that so you can specify that in the roles that okay if a particular user is trying to access the account uh, through this particular uh, identity providers way so they should be able to access the account for the limited period of time we can give them the accessibility and once it is done we can terminate the role through this way what will happen the other user or you can say the particular uh, external user will be able to access your account for a limited period of time for doing any of the work like auditing or or even your account and once it is done you can simply take the particular permissions or role uh, back from them and you will be able to make your environment much more secured so you can simply create a role you can specify um, all of the action resources your principle and through that you can do the things so you can create the policies uh, by going into the particular by clicking on this create policy you can create the policy if you want to create from any of by choosing service you can do that or if directly you want to do that that also we have seen uh, by creating an administrator access similar to that you can also give the full access to whatever user you want you can simply select any of the service that you want to select to the user and you can straight away give them like let us say 
full EC2 access if you want to give the user you can simply do that. So in this particular session we will see how to create roles. So for creating role we will move into roles and once we move into roles here we will go and click on create roles. So once we click on create roles so here the role that we will be creating will be of custom trust policy type. If you want to create any AWS service type of role you can also do that. All you have to do is that choose the AWS service after that you can choose any of the use cases let us say EC2 if you want to choose after that you can click on next and let us say whatever permissions you want to give you can give that let us say if you want to give the EC2 permissions if I'll hit enter you can see Amazon EC2 full access will pop up in front of you you can select and you can give it but in this session we will see but in this session we will see how to create role of custom types. So I'll go into create roles and here I'll move into custom trust policy. So after that what I'll do I'll come into this principle here I will in the inverted commas I'll type AWS after that let us say if you want the particular user to switch the role then that user ARN you have to provide. So if I'll move here here it is open let me move into any of the user let us say to dev3 user I want to give it let us say if I move into dev3 demo user I can move into it and once I move into it let me copy this ARN of my user and after that I'll come back and here I'll paste it so I'll paste it here and once I paste it after that I can click on next so here if I'll click on next now then let us say if you want to give any permission to that user let us say once my particular user switches the role then that user should be only able to access RDS. So I can choose the RDS let me give the Amazon RDS full access so here I'll click on next and after that let me give a role name and let me give it a name as dev3 role dam and after that I'll you can see the permission that I have given after that all I have to do is click on create roles so I'll click on create role and once I'll click on it and now if I'll search the role here you will be able to see it so dev3 role demo now let me log in into my dev3 user I'll click on sign into console and once I'll do that let me quickly log in dev3 demo dev3 demo I'll give the password that, I'll click on sign. So right now if you will see my particular dev3 uh, user is having access to all of the services because I have given the full admin access uh, in my previous video so you might have seen that so uh, this particular uh, dev3 demo is having access to every of the service that we want to access let us let me go to DynamoDB. So this particular user has access to everything every of the service that is being available so I can create the table I can do whatever I want but now let us try to switch the roles so let me go into here let me go into a switch role so once I'll click on switch role so here I have to provide the account so let me provide that account and here I have to provide the role name so I'll go back I will take the role name so it's dev3 uh, role demo so I'll type down here dev3 role after that I'll click on switch role and once I click on switch role you will be able to see that I have successfully switched this role so now uh, let us say, let me go into this s3 if now I'll go and try creating the s3 you will see I'll not be able to do it why because I don't have the permissions I don't have not enabled the permissions for it now only permission that I have given here is for the RDS now let us let me go to EC2 so you'll be able to see I'm I will not be able to access the EC2 but the only service that I will be able to access is RDS so if I'll move into RDS you will be able to see that I am able to access the RDS I'll be able to create the RDS instance apart from that I will not be able to do any other things so here if I'll move into instance dimensions you can see I, I will be able to create it so this is how you can switch the role now let us say if I want to come back how I can come back I have to click on switch back 
Once I click on switch back, I will be switching back and then you will be able to see earlier in this role I was not able to access the EC2 but now if I'll move back, now here if I'll go into EC2 then you will be able to see I will be able to access it. So here you can see I'm able to access it. So this is how you will be able to uh, switch roles. Now this is how uh, IAM Federation will look like if we are using Web Identity Federation. Now what happens in Web Identity Federation is let us say if you want to use a particular AWS service you, you can use that uh, if you are logging in from some Web Identity Federation. What can be a Web Identity Federation? There are a lot of providers for that like Google can be there. You might be getting an option of continue with Gmail in some website. So those are uh, web identity federations. You also have seen uh, continue with Facebook, continue with Amazon, continue with Twitter. So what basically happen is they are the web identity federation provider. So what basically they do, let us say if you are trying to access a website, then the website requests the identity federation provider, web identity federation provider to basically authenticate the user. They will not have the credential but they will uh, just ask the providers to check whether the particular user is genuine or not, whether in your database this user is enlisted or not. If the user is enlisted then that particular user can log in and start using the particular services of the website just like some other users. Now let us see how exactly can this web identity federation work with a particular AWS service. Let us say if you have created a particular role, there in the role you have specified that a particular uh, service can be accessed using web identity federation. Now you have specified the thing in the policy. Now let us see how exactly are the things being done. Now let us say first of all you will go and you will authenticate yourself through any of the web identity federation from Amazon, from Google or from Facebook. So once you authenticate yourself, a authorization token will be generated. Once that token is generated, then using that web identity federation, you will be basically sending a request to the AWS account through which you want to access it. Then your role ARN that would have been specified earlier, that thing along with the authorization token, a request will be sent. And how are you going to uh, use this particular role? By assume role with web identity. This is the particular role which has been specified in your role section. So it will go into STS security token service. So it will uh, create a very temporary and a privileged user. And once that thing has been created, a temporary security credential will be sent and using that particular thing, you can start accessing any of the services you want. So just like we discussed in the rules that we, if a particular user want to access a particular service for a limited period of time, we can create the role, we can specify it, we can give the access to the particular user and that particular user can do. So this is how the things work with Web Identity Federation. Now let us see how exactly are the things being done when we use SAML identity federation. SAML is security assertion markup language. So what basically happen here is uh, you just log in into one of the account and after logging into one of the account all of the linked account you can see or you can say you uh, just log in into an account using single sign on there uh, the authentication and authorization is done. And once it is done, you can start using all of the cross-region platform services. So how exactly does it work? If you will see in the uh, particular principle, ARN of the SAML provider will be there. And in the action, you can see assume role with SAML. In the previous uh, slide, we have discussed about assume role with web identity. Now this time we are going to assume the role with SAML. So if any particular request is coming through the SAML providers, we can basically give the permission. So how exactly the things being done? Let us say if you are using any identity provider 
either it can be LDAP or Microsoft Active Directory. So there first of all you have to do the single sign on. Once you do the single sign on, then what will happen? A metadata of XML will be generated and after that your SAML identity provider uh, will be uh, start authenticating the things, roles should have been there, then the things will be mapped on to uh, the particular uh, AWS account and then from the security tokens you can start using the thing. Now the things will become more clear if you look in here. So what happened at the very beginning? First of all you will be interacting with the application. So there you will be authenticating yourself using LD API identity store or using Microsoft Active Directory. Once you do that what will happen? A SAML assertion will be created. Then the role ARN will be there and with that the SAML provider ARN will be there. Then you will basically send a request to assume the role with SAML. Once that goes to your STS security token services, they will give you a privileged and a temporary security credentials to log in. And once you log in into the particular AWS account, you can start using the thing that has been specified in the role. So this is how SAML Identity Federation works. Now if you will look into what exactly is the security token service that we have been discussing in this particular thing where basically our first point of uh, interaction start. So what exactly security token services are? They are nothing but uh, they provide you with a temporary security credentials so that you can basically log in, you can do the things and once the things are done, all of the uh, permissions will be taken back. So that is the work of security token service. So a limited or you can say uh, for a specific period, they will give you a privilege access for an IAM user. Now if you will uh, see uh, from the application or from the user, STS call will be made and then the security token services will be giving you temporary credentials. You can use that credentials and you can log in into the account and you can start uh, using whatever things has been specified to you. Now if you look into STS call, there are a few things. The first thing is assume role. So here what we specify ARN of the role and the normal duration that is there uh, is 15 minute to 1 hour by default. You can change it. So in assume role what basically do we specify? We specify what is the service that the particular user or the application can use. We specify that thing in the assume role section. Now let us say if I am uh, specifying assume role with web identity. So basically what I am telling that if a particular request is coming through the web identity providers then that particular thing will come into play. Now similarly if a SAML uh, identity provider through that way if I am getting a particular request so assume role with SAML will be taking care of the things. Now in get federation token and get session token what exactly uh, do we provide? In federation token uh, we uh, provide them with the temporary access key, security access key, all of those things we provide using that. And in the session key also we try to provide those set of things. Let's have a quick quiz question guys. And the question is what is AWS CloudWatch? Your options are a cloud based file storage service a monitoring and management service for AWS resources, a virtual private network or VPN service, or an email and messaging service. Please mention your answers in the comment section. So guys, IntelliPath offers an AWS certification course for solutions architect certified by NSCOM and it aligns with industry standards. Through this course, you can learn all the important concepts of AWS and upon completion of the course, you will receive a NSCOM certification. With this course, we have already helped thousands of professionals in successful career transition. You can check out the testimonials on our Achievers channel whose link is given in the description below. Without a doubt, this course can set your career to new heights. So visit the course page link given below in the description and take a first step towards career growth in the field of AWS. So CloudWatch is a monitoring service that is being provided to us by the AWS. 
In the CloudWatch, we can create alarms and we can keep a track of the uh, data that is being uh, created or generated by our AWS service. So we can also create notifications in the CloudWatch to get us notified if any event is occurring. For example, let us say if you have created an alarm and that alarm is based upon a particular feature or on a condition is if my account uh, is generating a bill above $100, I should get a notification. So if you want to create any particular system in which you can get notified what is the billing that your particular account is incurring, you can do all of those things using the CloudWatch. Apart from that, let us say there is a particular service. You want to check how many time uh, it is available, the logs that it has been producing, for how long was that particular uh, EC2 instance was running. So you can keep the track of everything using the CloudWatch. So in CloudWatch, you uh, basically uh, integrate the things. You can create alarms, you can create dashboard, you can create billing alarms and you can keep a track of everything that you require. Now if we will look into the things, here we are looking into the two terminologies. One is dimension, another one is statistics. So let us first understand what exactly is an dimension. So dimension uh, is a sort of a tag, you can remember like that. Or coming on to its def definition, what exactly it is. Basically, it is a name value pair that is the part of identity of a matrix. Let us say uh, there is a particular uh, matrix and you want to uh, find it out. So how you can do that? You can do it using the dimension. You can basically uh, assign 30 dimension to a particular matrix. Let us say uh, you uh, want to find out a particular uh, service uh, in the service like uh, issue 2 instance running. So what you can do, you can take the instance ID and you can uh, paste it and you will be able to find it down. So dimension acts like a tag for you and it's uh, allow you to find something or to track something much more easily. Now if you look into statistic, what exactly it is? In statistic, we try to uh, have a lot of data over a period of time. The data can be upon for how long is my EC2 instance running, uh, what is the bill that it is being generated. So all of those things is what we say statistics. In statistic, uh, we take into consideration a lot of things that are being uh, running in our account. So if you look into matrices now and namespace. Before understanding uh, matrices, we have to understand what is a namespace. So namespace is like a container for your CloudWatch matrix. Let us say if you are creating n number of CloudWatch. So where exactly will they be residing? They will be residing in the namespace only. So by default, you don't get any namespace you have to uh, basically specify namespace for each data point you publish in CloudWatch. Now let's look into what exactly is a matrix. So matrix are fundamental to CloudWatch monitoring. Matrices are the conditions upon whom you specify what exactly to monitor. So we'll look into it in more detail. So if you will look uh, all, all AWS services send matrices to CloudWatch by default. That is the uh, basic architecture in which it has been created. But you are not going to interact with all of the services. So you will uh, not require all of the matrices. So for that what you can do, you can basically customize the matrices. You can create the matrices which you want. 
and you can keep those matrices in the dashboard and then you can start tracking those things down. In uh, matrices only, you can have a particular matrix like CPU utilization. Let us say your EC2 instance is running and you want to check that what is the CPU utilization and you can specify the thing. That let us say if I am having a one instance and that particular instance CPU utilization goes above 70% then I should get a notification. You can do that. So what is the matrix or you can say what is the condition upon whom I should be getting the notification? If the particular uh, CPU utilization is above 90 I should be getting the notification. So that is what your matrix is. For your EC2 you can have n number of matrices like CPU. On CPU you can have on disk utilizations also you can have network interface. Similarly for load balancer we can have for EBS we can have and even for route 53 we can have. So nearly for every services we can have the things. Now let us look uh, into the resource matrix for EC2. Now in the CPU utilization basically you can specify uh, let us say if the load is uh, less than 40% then what actions needed to be done. Now based upon EC2 instance uh, network interface what thing can you have? So what exactly is the network interface? So network interface is the first point of interaction between your internet and your machine. So there uh, you have the uh, network connected. So there in the network interface you have the uh, public IP, private IP, elastic IP. So you have that there. And if you want to do the communication to the internet you can do that using the network interface card. So in network interface you can specify that how many networks are coming into your particular instance. Let us say if you specify that okay in bytes, okay if this uh, number of bytes network in is coming I should get a notification. You can basically start tracking down that how much is your machine interacting with the network or you can even do the opposite of that how much of time or you can say how much amount of particular uh, network out traffic is going. If data packets are coming you can keep a track of that using network interface card and if the network packets are going out so you can even put a count upon that. If you are having a machine definitely some disk will be there. It can be EBS uh, if it is your physical machine it will be RAM. So you will be having everything. Upon those also you can put a particular um, matrices if you want to know that uh, okay what is the utilization of my disk. You can look into that. How? By uh, looking into disk read operations. How many read operations have been done? How many write operations have been done? How many uh, disk reads uh, are been done upon the bytes? So how much data is my disk interacting? You can keep a note of all of those things. You can track it down. So then you can basically plan how exact uh, amount of data is coming and how robust you need to make your architecture. Similarly, if you will uh, look into the other aspects, you can have CPU credit matrix. In there you can have the options like CPU credit usage. So what basically is this mean? One CPU credit usage means uh, one virtual CPU uh, having 100% utilization for one minute. Or you can say one CPU credit usage uh, can be like uh, one virtual CPU running at 50% CPU utilization for two minutes. So upon those things also you can put a matrix. If you look into CPU credit balance, so what basically is it mean? This means that there is a baseline or you can see uh, there is a mean up till which we expect that every time our CPU will be performing in that range. But let us say if our CPU is not performing up till that range because the load is not there. So what it will do? It will save its capacities. And when it will require that particular capacity if the load is more. So you, it can use those things in a burst. So those counts also we can have in CPU credit balance. Suppose those things also you can keep a track of the things. Similarly for EBS also we can have a lot of things. 
रीड बाइट राइट बाइट रीड ऑपरेशन राइट ऑपरेशन और हाउ लॉन्ग वॉज इट आइडल बिकॉज लेट एस इफ ए पर्टिकुलर डिस्क इज देयर विच इज आइडल फॉर वेरी लॉन्ग पीरियड ऑफ टाइम सो वट बेसिकली डज दैट कन्वे टू मी दैट द डिस्क इज नॉट इन दैट मच यू सो आई एल नॉट एलोकेट मोर डिस्क और यू कैन से आई एल नॉट एलोकेट मोर स्टोरेज ऑप्शंस फॉर डूइंग द थिंग सो दोज थिंग्स ऑल्सो आई कैन कीप ए ट्रैक ऑफ आई कैन सी हाउ एग्जैक्टली आर द रिसोर्सेज इन माई पर्टिकुलर अकाउंट बींग यूज एंड आई कैन डू दैट इफ आई स्पेसिफाई those things in the matrices now for similarly for s3 also we can put matrix we can uh, look into how many get request it is get how many put request has been done basically how many times you are reading the things how many th times you are uh, uploading the object how many times uh, you are trying to um, basically download let us say if there is a particular object in your particular bucket and you are sharing that link of that particular object public url to someone and that particular people is downloading the things those things also you can keep a track of how many exactly uh, times number of objects are there number of objects you can keep a track of well, how much bulky is your particular bucket in bytes you can keep a track of it so that will uh, basically give you a good picture that what is the storage that you have been using and how much will you be requiring the storage in the future so those things also you can specify in the resource matrices similarly for dynamo db also dynamo db uh, is a no sql database that is being available there upon those things also you can keep a note how many times the queries have been done in the query what exactly the things have been done let us say if there is a particular data set available in which i am having a column for the employee named as holiday so i will be running a query and i will be looking in that how many of them took holiday on a specific date i can check those things and you can keep a track of all those those things using the matrices using the cloud watch so if you specify the things like that okay if the number of holidays or the employees goes above this particular number of days i should get a notification you can get it and you can uh, track the things much more properly so that is what we do in cloud watch so similarly for auto scaling group also you can have the matrices you can keep a track of let us say instance are running in the auto scaling so you can specify if my cpu utilization goes above this i should get the notification you can specify uh what should be the minimum size of your group what should be the maximum size of your group how many number of instances should be running every time in the group desired capacity you can specify those things how many instances are about to roll out in the pending state you can look into all of those things if we look into the architecture then there are services that are been constantly you are using upon those aws services we can have matrices matrices upon a different service are different or ec2 we can have n number of services n number of matrices like cpu utilization disk utilization network interface card all of those things for ebs also we can have different sort of things how many write operations have been done how many read operation are been done what is the total uh, capacity of the data that it can read similarly for s3 we can also specify uh, that uh, how much of data is available there how much of data we are uh, trying to read how many times the things have been downloaded and based upon those things you can get a statistic once you get a statistic you can either do two things either you can uh, look that particular statistics in the console directly by creating a dashboard you can create a dashboard and you can look into that or you can do one thing you can uh, get the notification for those things you can basically give your uh, 
email and you can receive a report for that. Now what exactly is in CloudWatch dashboard? Now dashboard you can say is an uh, interactive representation of the data of your particular services or resources that you are using and what data does it show about the services it shows the particular data based upon the matrix you chose let us say if you have created a particular matrix or you can see if you have created a particular alarm based upon the condition that if my account will incur a charge above $50 I should get a notification then that particular pictorial representation will be available to you if you make a dashboard for that so there you will be able to track down that uh, what is the particular charge that currently your account has incurred and whenever it will go past it you will also get a notification for that or you will be able to see it in the console only if you create it now let us say if you have created a particular alarm based upon a particular criteria that if my cp utilization is above 60 percent then i should be uh, basically doing something i should be either increasing the instance or i should be getting i should be decreasing the instance or i should be getting a notification so for that you can create a dashboard and you can keep a watch upon that so basically dashboard are you can say are the uh, pictorial representation of the thing you can in your dashboard you can have different types of widgets selected you can have different types of graph you can have a, a stacked graph you can have line graph you can have number graph if you are choosing a number graph what will it be showing it will be showing the things you in number similarly for line graph things will be in, uh, in line wise manner you will be able to see all of those things in the cloudwatch dashboard now this is how a particular dashboard will look like you have to create an alarm after that you can add it into your billing sorry add it into your dashboard now let us say if you have created an alarm in the alarm section you can see the billing option is there you go there you create a billing and you add it into a dashboard you can look in that that a demo billing alarm is there currently the uh, estimated charge are above 400 dollar so whenever uh, your particular account will go past above 400 dollar you will basically get a notification for that if you have enabled but you can see the things using the dashboard similarly you can create alarms you can see uh, in this particular dashboard picture two alarms are there so you can see the other alarms that we have created are also there in this dashboard you can uh, go to action you can add number of widgets you want and you can also customize the things based upon the date let us say if you want to get a, a view for past one week what was happening in your account you can simply go there you can cost customize it and you can do it you can create your own dashboard if you feel like it. now let us look into what exactly is in cloudwatch alarm let us say if you have created a matrix matrix based upon uh, how many network in is happening and you specify that after that you uh, decided to create a alarm based upon that that if let us say you give a number and if you say if this particular number is exceeded i should get a alarm so then the alarm you will be able to get similarly you can put the alarm on different thing like cpu utilization or till now whatever matrices we have discussed based upon everything you can have a alarm you can create alarm you can keep it and you can uh, monitor those things so after creating the alarm you are having two options either you can see that thing 
in your particular application or you can say in your dashboard if you want in your AWS dashboard you can see it or else you can uh, integrate the uh, notification service then you can receive the notification using HTT, HTTPS protocol in the email and all. So now if we will go here, alarm state are basically the three state that you will get. The very first state that you will have is okay. Let us say if my particular I have created an alarm based upon the matrix CPU utilization. I have specified that if the CPU utilization is above 50, I should get a notification. Now let us say the particular CPU utilization is now 40. So the alarm state will be for mine is 40. So it will be showing me alarm state okay. Now let us say if the CPU utilization is 70 now. So then the threshold that I have specified previously is now been breached. So it will uh, show me that alarm basically means the threshold has been crossed up. So that is the one I'll get. And there is the third state that I'll be getting is insufficient data. Might be matrix not available or missing data. As you all know, let us say if we are have created a CPU utilization, then it is going to take some time. You can specify it either one minute or five minutes. So during that period, what it will do? It will try to gather the information and in between gathering the information, it will show you insufficient data because it is collecting the data right now. And once that particular time period, whatever we have specified is done, then it will uh, show us two results that is either OK or it will be an alarm. So CloudWatch is basically used for monitoring our AWS resources and the application that we run in the real time. So if you will come into CloudWatch, then there are two type of dashboard. Either you can create your own dashboard that you want or you can have a dashboard of custom type. So if I'll move into custom type dashboard, let us see what we get. We will be having all of the resources that are being available. Let us say if I move into EBS. So here I'll be having uh, this dashboard automatically availing uh, me everything, the volume read bytes and whatever thing it has to show it will be there and let us say let me move into another you can say to another resource so if i move into ec2 let us say so here you, you will be able to see everything like the cpu utilization on an average and all so these are the things that we get if we choose a aut uh, automatic cloud watch so now let's try creating a particular dashboard of custom dashboard so let me click on create dashboard so after this you can give a name let me give it a name as demo dashboard so after giving this dashboard you can click on create so this board dashboard can help you in a lot of ways uh, how let us say if you want to uh, track any of the resources its usage or the charges that it is incurring you you can basically check that using this dashboard so these are the widgets uh, in this particular way you can keep a watch upon the resources that are been running in your particular aws account so here after creating it if i'll come back to dashboard you will be able to see the dashboard that we have just created at right now that is demo dashboard so after this, let me go inside it. So here you get an option of adding widget. So let me click on add widgets. So let me choose any of the one. Let me go for this tagged area. So after this, it will ask you uh, from which data source would you like to create the widget. Let me choose matrix. So in the matrix, you can choose from any of the resources that is available. Let me choose uh, billings. So in the billings, let me go with buy services. So here, uh, as per the charges that is being incurred, uh, it will show you up. So let me go with Amazon EFS. So if I choose Amazon EFS, and after that I click on add widget. So here, you will be able to see that for the time being, nothing is there because for past three hours, nothing is running. So let me make it one week. Then we shall see. 
then similarly you can keep a watch of everything that it the charges that it will incur similarly let me uh, create another widget as you did and this time the widget that i'll have will be line so let me again go to matrices and here this time uh, let me go with backups so if i choose backups i have all the options let me go with by resource types so here uh, let me choose efs and after that let me click on create widget so now you can see no data is available but if something will uh, start coming up i'll be able to see it similarly you can add uh, widgets of any of the way you want you can add the widgets of bar you can go to matrices and here let me this time select ec2 so in the ec2 if you want you can go with per auto scaling group also i went with per instances also but for that you need an instance so let me see if anything is running or not no for the time being okay so let me choose the other way out that is as per by auto scaling group if you will be having some auto scaling group you can choose from that but let me go back to all and uh, let me choose from ebs if i choose from ebs i can choose from per volume matrices so these are the volumes that were in use so let me choose any of the volumes let us say by matrix of burst volume so if i'll choose it here and then if i'll click on create widget we'll be able to see this particular widget coming up similarly let me add another widget and this time let me go with number so with number if i will go with billing again by services and here let me choose amazon ec2 after that let me click on create widget so you can see the widget has been created right now and this is the estimated charge that is going to be incurred so this is how basically you can start uh, using this widget so there are a lot of different uh, widgets also available to you that you can choose and start working upon so basically this will give you a very good idea about uh, the things that are been running or the things that can charge you and after that let us say if you want to save the dashboard you can click on save dashboard and once you do it uh, you also get the option of renaming it and you also get the option of share dashboard so if i will click on share dashboard so here if i'll go on this if i'll click on start sharing so basically you can provide the email address to whom you want to send it after that you can confirm it and it will go or you can go to this option also share your dashboard publicly here uh, you can click on share and after that you can start sharing the things so this is what you can do if you are having the demo uh, the dashboard along with you you can basically start estimating the charges that are going to incurred so you can do all of those things and if you will move into actions then you can see a lot of other things also you can do using the dashboard let's have a quick quiz question guys and the question is what is elastic load balancer in the context of cloud computing your options are a service that automatically scales your compute resource based on demand a service that distributes incoming traffic across multiple instances to ensure availability and fault tolerance, a service that stores and manages data in a scalable and durable manner, or a service that manages security and access control for your cloud resources. Please mention your answers in the comment section. Just a quick info guys, IntelliPath offers an AWS certification course for solutions architect certified by NSCOM and it aligns with industry standards. Through this course, you can learn all the important concepts of AWS and upon completion of the course, you will receive a NESCOM certification. With this course, we have already helped thousands of professionals in successful career transition. You can check out the testimonials on our Achievers channel whose link is given in the description below. Without a doubt, this course can set your career to new heights. So visit the course page link given below in the description and take a first step towards career growth in the field of AWS. So for this, uh, what I have done is that I have already running an auto scaling group. So I have created this auto scaling group and upon this auto scaling group, we are going to create an alarm. So let us see uh, how to create it. So I'll click on create alarm. After that, I'll click on select matrix. 
So here if I'll move down, then upon EC2, I'll be having my alarm. So I'll select that. Then it will ask me, okay, on what parameter are you going to put the alarm on? Whether it is on per instance matrix. Uh, so if you would be having some instance running uh, already, then it will come up here. So other than that, uh, you can go with by auto scaling group also. So here, uh, let me find out the auto scaling group. So yeah, so this is the auto scaling group. Uh, so upon any of the matrix, you can create your alarm. Uh, you can create it upon CPU utilization. Let me go on with uh, network in. So basically, this is the auto scaling group, uh, alarm auto scaling group, and this same auto scaling group I am choosing here also. And the matrix upon which I'm putting it is network in. So after that, you have to click on select matrix. So here it will come up this dashboard will pop up in front of you so the metric name will come up the auto scaling group uh, name will come up and here you can choose this period uh, let me choose it one minute because if i'll choose less than one minute it will not allow me to do after that you can specifically specify what is the particular threshold upon which you want to put the things so for me uh, let me put in 40 here so after that if i'll go and if i'll click on next so if you would be having an sns then you can have it but uh, right now i'll be not uh, doing on with sns so i'll just remove it after that you can click on next here you can give the alarm name. let me give it a name as alarm network so if you want to give the description you can give it and after that you can click on next. so once you click on next a uh, preview will be created and here you can go on with that and here if i'll click on create alarm and if I'll refresh it, okay, you can go to alarms, and it will be, yeah, so the alarm network. So it has been uh, successfully created. So this is how you can create the thing. And after that, if you will move into action, so here you will get an option of adding it to your dashboard. So you can simply add it to the dashboard. This is the dashboard that we have already created, demo dashboard. So you can select it, and after that, you can just click on add to dashboard. So if you will do that, so your particular alarm will be uh, added to the dashboard so you, then you can go on to the dashboard and you can see how to do the things similarly you can create this type of alarm for cpu utilization and for whatever matrix you like how to create a cloudwatch alarm for the billing purpose so first of all we have to come into cloudwatch and after that we have to move into billings so once we uh, move into billings so here we will get an option of creating the billing alarm so do remember uh, we can create only one alarm for the billing purpose in an account so let us say if you want to create two account two particular billing alarm then you have to delete the previous one then only you will be able to create a new one so let me click on create alarm once you will click on create alarm then you will see uh, somewhat this type of dashboard coming up the matrix name is estimated charge and the currency upon which the things are going to be is usd and the period uh, is 6 hours uh, but let me make it one minute so if i'll make it 30 seconds let us see you will see it will not allow you because the minimum number of seconds that you need to give is one minute so let me give it one minute so after the one minute passes away and if the charges are above a particular limit or below a particular limit then only it will start uh, sending you the particular uh, messages or your alarm will be triggered so after that uh, i'll Keep the threshold type as static and after that I will get the estimated charge. Let us say if you want to uh, create that, let us say if a particular uh, barrier is being crossed or you can say a particular number of charges is being crossed by your account, then you want to get the alarm. So for that you can create that. So let me keep the threshold type as static and the charge that I'll keep here is let us say $400. So what I'm specifying here is that if my account uh, particularly bears uh, a USD of greater than 400, then my alarm will be triggered and it will let me that, okay, your account has crossed the 400 limit mark so that I'll be become more cautious and I will start using the particular AWS account and its resources and its services more judiciously. So after that, let me click on next. Once I'll click on next, uh, if you are having uh, any of this SNS topics, then you can attach it. But for the time being, I will not do it anything. So I'll click on move. So after that, you can also add any auto scaling actions if you require. 
I don't require it. After that, I'll click on next. So after that, I have to give the alarm name. Let me give it alarm name. Demo billing alarm. So after that, if you want the description to be given, you can give it. You can click on next. After this, a preview page will come up. You can basically go through it. You can see static. Whenever estimated charge is greater than 400. After that, let me click on create alarm. So if I'll create uh, the alarm, now you can see that if my account will uh, have a charge of more than $400, then only this billing will be triggered and it will be let me know that okay, the particular charges has crossed more than 400 Let us say if I would have created any SNS topic in which uh, I register my email address, then I will be also getting the uh, particular message on my email or on the mobile number. If you get registered so we'll look more into sns in the following up topics so for the timing you can just go on with how to create the billing alarm so now if i'll move back into billings and see if i'll go on creating a billing so this time i will not be able to create this billing alarm why because because for an account uh, the billing alarm that is being uh, currently supported is just one so let us say if you want to create another billing alarm what you can do simply select it and after that you can move into action and here you can delete it once you will delete it then you will be able to create the new alarm if you want so other than other than that what you can do you can even add a dashboard you can even add the dashboard for it if you want so select a dashboard i have we have already created this dashboard demo dashboard if you want that dashboard you can keep that or if you want to create a new dashboard you can also create it after that the widget type you can keep it either line number stacked whatever you want to keep it uh, you can keep that and after that you can click on add to dashboard so once you will click on add to dashboard now if you will go to this dashboard you will be able to see the demo billing alarm is also now coming up earlier we are having just uh, four of this but now we are also having another dashboard being attached to it so if i'll move back into all alarms so right now it has not been triggered yet because my particular account has not crossed this particular mark so if this particular mark will be crossed up in future then it will let me so what exactly is an access analyzer to understand the thing we will be looking into an example and we will then try to make sense of whatever thing we are about to discuss let us say you are creating a policy in that policy, you want an external user to have some accessibility. Who is that external user? That particular external user can be anyone. But that user does not belong to your account or that user does not belong to your organization. And let us say if you have wrote the policy and after that, you are there uh, clicking on save changes. You want to... Uh, apply the rule or you can say apply the policy then at that time access analyzer will come into picture and it will let you know that look you have given entirely uh, whatever permissions you have given it will highlight it let us say if you have given full accessibility of your account to that particular user so access analyzer will give you a suggestion that look you have given the full accessibility permission to your account have you done it intentionally or have you done it unintentionally let us say you you have done it unintentionally then you can simply revoke those things and you can protect your account or your organization in a very good manner let's take an, a more example to understand let us say you are typing a policy in the policy, what do you uh, want to have? You are granting accessibility to an external user to access the bucket. In that, if you have given the full permission, then access analyzer will tell you that you have given the full permission to the particular external user. Are you uh, sure about the things? Have you done the things intentionally or in unintentionally you have done the things? Let us say if you have done the things unintentionally, 
you can change those things maybe your intention was that that particular external user should be only able to uh, put the object nothing more than that not get not do any deletion of the bucket not should not be able to create any bucket should not be able to view what are the other contents inside the bucket so you can restrict those particular thing and you can make your particular account more secure so that is where access analyzer helps us if you give full permission to a particular user not belonging to your organization not belonging to your account it will give you suggestions that you have given the full accessibility are you sure about the things if you are just intentioning to give that particular user to have only put the object in the bucket you can just specify that particular exact permission that this particular user should be able to put the object nothing more than that if you can specify this particular thing then you are making your account much more secure you are restricting the user to do any other malicious thing that particular user is intending so that is how you can secure your environment much more better way now let us look into apart from this thing what other things it can help us one thing that we have discussed is it will identify resources in your organization and account that are shared with external entities so it will give you suggestions that are sure that you want to give the full accessibility permission to that user or if someone is not belonging to the your particular account and you have what whatever permissions you have given so it will tell you apart from that let us say you are typing a particular policy and there in the policy you did some grammatical error let us say the particular uh, policy that you have wrote is not in accordance to the json format editor format so there you can get the suggestion of this is the thing not correct you need to rectify it so whatever changes required to be done you can then do it by the help of access analyzer apart from that based upon the aws cloud trail logs it can also give you suggestions that this are the things that are happening in your cloud trail logs if you want to give a particular iam user any policy be sure about the things recently let us say in the cloud trail logs uh, some particular uh, event is occurring at that time do you want that particular iam user also to have that accessibility because if the iam user is having the accessibility to that then the iam user will be able to figure out what is happening in the cloud trail and based upon that that particular user can uh, figure out some confidential thing or if a particular user is there who is doing something so based upon the aws cloud trail log you can see what that particular user is doing and after that let us say if you are giving any permission to the user then it will tell you that this particular user has been doing this thing so do you want to give this permission also to that particular user so that is what you can do using the access analyzer it can help you to secure your environment or secure your account in much more good manner after this let us look into what exactly iam access advisor do so iam access advisor what exactly it it, it will do it will give you basically advices depending upon the activity of the users you can see the aws identity and access management access advisor uses data analysis to help you confidently set permission guard rules by providing service last accessed information for your account organization unit and your aws organization managed organization so what basically it will do it will check what were the last accessed information of your account it will look into that that last time let us say you accessed a particular service and you are using that service so based upon that it will give you whatever suggestions it needed to do so now let's look into an example so that the thing will become much more let us say arnav desai is there 
as a security administrator for example corporation he works with several development team and monitor their access across multiple account to get his development team up and running quickly he initially created multiple role with broad permission that are based on job function in development account now his developers are ready to deploy workload to the production account the developers need access to configure aws however arnab only want to grant them the access to what they need to determine the permission he uses access advisor api to automate a process that help him understand the service developer accessed in last 6 month using the information he authors policy to grant access to specific service in production so what exactly is happening arnab was there now arnab's developers team want to deploy a particular workload to production account there can be different account now there is a in one account the developers were working and now in the production account developers want to uh, deploy a particular workload or a particular project to, you can say whatever now the two accounts are different one is developer account another one is production account now let us say if you give full admin access to the developers in the production account then they can do anything so that is not the right way of giving any permission to the user so what you can do then you can go into development account you can check in the last 6 month what were those services that the developer team were accessing you can check out of 200 plus services let us say if they are accessing only 6 to 7 services you can keep a note of that and you can allow the development team having the accessibility of this 5 or 7 services in the production account if the developer go into production account they have the accessibility to this 5 or 7 services they can work upon them and once they are done we can take it back so what were the services they are being using in their development team we will uh, not go and find it manually but we can automate it how we can automate it using the access advisor so that is what access advisor how to create iam access analyzer so basically iam is a global service but if i will move into the access analyzer here you will be able to see it is based upon a particular region so this particular resource is regional basis now uh, why exactly do we use this access analyzer let us say if you are having a s3 bucket which is public or shared so you can basically trash it out if you are having an access analyzer so if now i'll move into my x3 management console here you also get an option of access analyzer for the s3 so basically this is uh, powered by our iam access analyzer and it is entirely free of cost so now we shall uh, see that uh, how to create our s3 bucket and uh, how iam access analyzer can access the thing if we have made some changes in the s3 bucket so now let me go on and create a bucket so let me give it a name let me give it a name let us say demo 1 1 2 3 4 5 and demo 1 and uh, the aws region that i'll choose here will be my ohio so after that uh let me make my acl enabled and let me also not block any public access after that i'll acknowledge it and here after that i'll click on create bucket so similarly uh let me create another bucket so let me go to create bucket and this time the name i will give here is demo 2 1 2 3 4 5 demo 2 1 2 3 4 5 so i am also residing uh, this particular bucket in the ohio region only after that let me enable the acl and let me also unblock all the public access after that i'll click on uh, create bucket so now uh, basically i have made uh, two of my bucket so now uh, let me make it public so here if i'll move into permissions here you can see objects can be public so let me make it so let me go down to here let me click on this object ownership here uh, let it be acl enabled let me cancel it so let me go to this access control list let me click on edit 
and here let me grant this particular options if you want you can also give the other permissions but I am good with this two only and after that I will click on I understand the effect of these changes on my object and bucket after that I will click on save changes. Similarly you can now see uh, the access has now become public so now similarly I will do the same thing for my other bucket also you can see the access has now become public. So now uh, let me go inside it and now let me move into permissions and here I will also make it as public. So here I will move into access control list after that I will click on edit and here I will make it public after that I will acknowledge the things and after that I will click on save changes. So now uh, both of my buckets are residing in Ohio and I have made both of them as public. So after that I uh, will move into IAM uh, management console. Here I will move into access analyzer and uh, after that I will move into analyzers. So here I have to create the particular analyzer. So let me go to the region where my bucket is there. So my bucket is present in Ohio so I will have to make an analyzer in the Ohio region. So I will click on create analyzer. So I can basically give a name. So let me give it a name as demo one analyzer. So after that uh, the zone of trust that I will choose here will be the current account. Upon my current account I want to see the thing so I will choose it. And after that I will click on create analyzer. And once I do that so now basically my analyzer will be creating and you can see these are the two buckets that we have just created demo 1 and demo 2. And because all of those are uh, having a publicly accessible because you can see all of the access are public. So I will basically get a notification for this two. And if you will move back and if you will see here I am having you can see four of the things as public. These two buckets are also been public. But why I am not able to see it because these two buckets are present in North Virginia region and the analyzer that I have created is present in Ohio. So let us say if you want to see uh, analyzers for every of the region then you have to go and create the analyzers one by one individually. So now uh, let us say these are the two buckets of mine demo 1 and demo 2 and now these are you can see has been finded out by the access analyzer and you will see it in the active. So now uh, if I will click on it here I can find all of the things like the finding ID updated minute status and shared through bucket ACL you can basically see each of the steps so after that you have two of the options to take one is intended action let us say if you have made your uh, particular bucket as public now the question come when do we make our bucket public let us say if you want to go for static web hosting then you can make it public let us say if you want to have any public downloads then you can make it public or you can also have a cross uh, account sharing in that option also uh, you can make your particular account public. So if you have created your bucket and if you want that to be public only. So uh, what you can do you can, can just click on archive and the things will be done. So let us say if there is an another option let us say if you have done in the, any of the things uh, unintentionally then you can simply click on not intended and you can simply go to S3 console and you can change the permissions that you want to do. So now uh, let us say if you want to do the things uh, you can also do the things that uh, archive the thing here also in the S3 bucket also. So how you can do that you have to go to access analyzer for S3 and here you have to particularly select the region in which you want to do the things. So I will be choosing Ohio because both of my buckets are present in Ohio. So once you will do that uh, you will be able to find out this two the bucket that we have created. So let me uh, select my first bucket and I am saying that okay I want to archive it basically uh, I want this particular bucket to be public and I acknowledge the things that I have done it. So you can click on archive and after that you can simply click on confirm and once you click on confirm you will be able to see demo 1 uh, was successfully archived. So this is how you can archive the things. So now if I will go back here and if I will move into archive rules, so right now I don't have any rules. So let me go to access analyzer and here if I will go to archived, you can see demo 1 has been archived. 
so now uh, let me go back to access analyzer let us say if for this bucket you don't want uh, to do the archive let us say this bucket has went publicly by mistake so what you can do you can simply block all the public access so this is basically what happen uh, when you have uh, this particular amazon s3 uh, administrative power if you are having it so simply you can block all the public access you can just click on this particular option you can click on block all public access and after that you can confirm it so once you confirm it then you can see the changes has been successfully done so now if you will see here in the result you can see this demo 2 is now uh, showing in the result because we have blocked the public access but this particular uh, demo is now been archived so it will be there uh, for more uh, further of the things let us say for, uh, for coming days you don't do any changes after that it will move into your result once uh, 90 days is being passed so this is how you can do the things you can also unarchive it if you want similarly if you go to unresolve and you, if you select it and if you go into actions so here also you can have an option of exporting it so whatever options you want to do you can do it now let's first look in into what is IAM policy simulator now let us say let's take an example to understand the things in much more proper manner let us say if you are having a user named as user1 and that particular user1 does not have any permission now you want to basically know that if you associate any particular uh, permission to that particular user how will that user will be behaving but you just want to test the permission before giving it the accreditation so how you can do that for that you are having IAM policy simulator so in that IAM policy simulator what will happen you can basically select your user and after that you can uh, give whatever permission you want and then you can see how exactly will that particular user will be behaving if you attach any permission let us say you attach any permission to your user in the policy simulator so that particular policy will not be uh, visible in the real world it is entirely and just an environment where testing is being done so that is what IAM policy simulator is in the IAM policy simulator you can even create new policy you can even update the policy that is there and you can test how exactly will it behave you can do a lot of changes there and you can see how will the things be done so that is what IAM policy simulator is so whatever changes you will do it will be uh, not replicated in the real world but yes you can see how exactly will that particular thing will be working in the real world so now before looking into the uh, benefits of this let's look into another thing what exactly is boundary in IAM policy simulator or you can say uh, you can create boundaries and you can give the boundaries to your user and it will work upon so let's understand what exactly is a boundary let us say you, there is a user one and to that particular user you have given lot of permission you have given the permission to EC2 you have given the permission to IAM you have given the permission to S3 you have given the permission to RDS but then you came up then you set a boundary upon that user so what boundary will tell you boundary will tell you okay that particular user might be having uh, accessibility to four services but boundary will define how many number of services actually that particular user can use so that is what the concept of boundary is it will specify even if that particular user is having some uh, permissions so in the boundary you can uh, restrict the permissions you can specify how much permission can that particular user will be using so it doesn't matter even uh, if that particular user is having a uh, four permission so you can specify in the boundary how much out of those four that particular user can use and then you will be and then that particular user will be working upon that particular thing now if the boundaries uh, are there those things also you can check in in the IAM policy simulator if you attach any particular uh, let us say if you are doing any test 
in the IAM policy simulator. There, your user is having only access to uh, EC2 and uh, S3, and then you uh, try to give uh, to you basically try to check whether your particular user is uh, having the access uh, to SageMaker or not. So it will basically uh, it, it will say that you don't have the permission because the permission has not been given implicitly. So those sort of things you can do using the IAM policy simulator. So now if you will uh, look into IAM policy simulator benefits, then there are a lot of benefits. It gives agility to the developer. How exactly? Let us say there is no environment for doing any testing. So then it is going to take a lot of time for the developers to figure it out how exactly will a particular permission will be behaving for a user if they assign it. But if they have the IAM policy simulator, then they can work the things very faster. So that is the first advantage of IAM policy simulator. Application monitoring and auditing will be also easy because in the IAM policy simulator, you get the option of even uh, tweaking or you can change the available policy and you can see how exactly are they being performed. You can add even more functionality to that particular user and you can see how exactly will the things be done. You can software as service integration can be done very easily. You can see how the entities are behaving in between though them and you can get a good view. Okay, this is how it is going to behave. And for AMI and machine learning, let us say if you are integrating um, in your software any AI or ML and you want to check how will it impact the user, that thing also you can do in the IAM policy simulator. So those are the benefits of having IAM policy simulator. Now let's look into CloudWatch event bridge. So if we will uh, look in here into the CloudWatch event bridge. So what exactly it is? CloudWatch uh, basically send events to the CloudWatch event bridge. And when are these events being sent? When anything occur to your alarm. What thing? The things can be creation of your alarm deletion of your alarm, updation of your alarm or uh, let us say if some changes has been made to your alarm. So all of those things will be messaged or you can say will be passed via CloudWatch to your CloudWatch event bridge in the form of event. And let us say if any modification is happening, based upon that modification you can put some rules. Let us say your alarm has now been triggered. Let us say. So then you can set up some rules that you should be getting notification where your alarm is triggered. So you can do that if you are using the CloudWatch event bridge. So CloudWatch event and event bridge are uh, you can say both are of uh, really comes with really similar feature but your CloudWatch event bridge has some more features. Apart from that Amazon Event Bridge is serverless event bus that makes it simple to connect application using data from your own application, SaaS application and AWS services. So how it can uh, makes it simple? Because let us say if your application is there, it is running and you are having, uh, you have put some alarm upon that. That alarm is triggered and your CloudWatch conveys the thing to the event bridge and from there you will, uh, you can get the notification and you can do whatever changes is being required. And CloudWatch uh, takes the responsibility of conveying whatever change occurs in the alarm to your CloudWatch event bridge. What is an IAM policy simulator? So for accessing the IAM, simula IAM policy simulator, you have to search it uh, here in the web browser. After that, select the first link that comes up. And from here, you will basically get an URL. Access the thing. So after that, once you select it, you will come into IAM policy simulator. So here, uh, if you will see what exactly is an IAM policy simulator, basically we can test the policy that are being attached to our IAM users or groups or roles in our present in our AWS account. We can do all of these things using our policy simulator. We can even add uh, new policies to our existing user and we can check uh, how are they behaving. So uh, as this policy simulator uh, is in, you can say, will not apply all those rules that we 
specify or all those policies that we specified to our user so we can basically try it upon our user and we can check how does it actually behaves so we can also do those things so now uh, if i'll go back to here okay if you'll go to the users you will able to see all of these users and the same users are also present in my i am policy simulator so let me select uh, this particular user this are this is the user that we have created so if you will see in its policy you will able to see that we have allowed two permissions one is s3 full access and ec2 full access so now if i'll go into select service and here if i'll type here ec2 and here if i will select uh, any of the actions uh, let us say let me choose any of the action it comes up here uh, allocate host uh, accept transit gateway accept vpc peering all of these are under the ec2 only and here if i will uh, choose create subnet create snapshots create security groups and here after that if i will run the uh, simulator you will be able to see all of the permissions are being allowed why because we have given the full uh, ec2 access to this particular user similarly uh, if we will go back and here if we will choose this particular user this particular user is having full admin access so uh, this particular user should be able to access all of the services that are being uh, present over our aws account so let me play the result uh, let me choose uh, a particular service uh, let me choose here athena so if i will choose athena here and after that uh, let me select any of the action batch get named query batch get prepared statement and let me choose every of the thing so after that if i will uh, run the simulator you will be able to see all the permissions are being allowed why because it has the administrator access in the administrator access you can go in and you can see effect is allow action is star and resources are star so basically it can access everything that it want to have Similarly, even you can create new policy and you can test how exactly is the particular user behaving. So this particular thing that you will create here will not be applicable uh, directly to our user. So you can try it out and you can test how exactly the things goes on. Now well, let me go back. So if I will uh, select a particular user, uh, let me select this particular user, Siam. So if I will uh, select the particular user, you will be able to see this I particular user is having an IAM policy of Amazon EC2 full access. So if I will uh, clear the result here and now if I will move into the particular service and let me select here EC2. So after uh, selecting the EC2, so if I will uh, go into select option and if I am selecting allocate host, allocate uh, DHCP option and uh, similarly create key pair, create snapshots create security groups, create route table, create route a and if after choosing all of this, if I am running the simulator, you can see the permission has been denied implicitly, even though it is having Amazon EC2 full access. Why exactly is this happening? Because we have attached a permission boundary policy. So in this permission boundary policy, what is happening? Basically, we have set the maximum permission that an entity can have. Though it is having this Amazon EC2 full access, but still we have uh, led the specific rules upon what it can access and what it cannot access similarly if i'll go back here into policy and if i will uh, choose the particular policy that is devops boundary you can see this is the particular uh, statement that uh, has been given here and you can see the effect is deny and a lot of things has been blocked even though we have given the full permission so let me show this particular policy to you so this is devops 2 boundary so let me uh, select here devops uh, to boundary so if i'll go inside it so you, you will be able to see ec2 the limited right so this is what happened when you have a, a particular permission boundary policy attached to your user let us say what exactly is an aws cloud trail let us say if you are having an account and there are two user user one and user two your user 1 has uh, created an instance right now. Simultaneously, your user 2 has created a load balancer. After some while, your user 1 is interacting with RDS and your user 2 is interacting with IAM. 
now whatever your users are doing you can uh, basically see all of those things in the cloud trail so aws cloud trail is a service provided by aws that enables operation and risk auditing governance compliance for your aws account now we have seen few things like operation risk auditing governance and compliance how exactly can it do is do all of these things because cloud trail will be looking into the actions taken by user role or aws service so it will check whatever the users are doing it will see what your roles are doing if in your role you have allowed some external user to interact with your account that thing uh, in the cloud trail it will be visible and the events uh, that you do not only in aws management console those only visible but the events that you are doing in the command line interface software development kit api application programming interface whatever you are doing all of those things we can uh, you can basically see in cloud trail now let us say in the cloud trail you want to see something for that either you can use the default option that is being given to you you can uh, basically cloud trail will be giving you information of all of those things by default or what you can do you can create your own insights and then you can even start looking into it so if you will uh, make your own insight then you will have much more grip using the that particular insight option you can uh, basically take out whatever uh, data is being generated in the cloud trail to the aws s3 there you can store it and uh, after storing it you can look what your users are doing if they are uh, doing any creation of the instance you can see if they are deleting an instance you can see if they are starting an instance you can see of a whatever service whatever things they are doing you can look all of those things and all of the data you can store in s3 in the cloud trail you also get a very you can say good feature that is of data lake now what exactly is in data lake if you will uh, see let us say just like you create your insight you can create a data lake once you create data lake what will it happen let us say if you are having a lot of data set and uh, you want to see that in the last month what exactly did your user one did you can see all of those things how you can basically run an sql command a sql query you can run and you can see it and data lake will made you available with that particular option now if you will see the benefits of cloud trail then it improves your security posture how exactly because you will uh, be able to find it out what exactly one user is doing and what and who has done the particular uh, activity that you want to see or if from any rules some roles some changes has been made you can also track those things down after that uh, you can even follow let us say if something uh, comes up against your account then you can uh, basically prove your genuinity by giving the data present in your s3 you can give that and you can make them sure that your particular user or your roles has not done any of the tweaking maybe your account has got compromised or maybe due to some other issues some problem may come up after this you centrally controlled program you will look in capture and consolidate user activity and api usage across aws account and regions on single central control platform so in a one particular place you are basically able to get every information that you want so you don't have to move to so basically on a single platform you can acquire all of the thing that you need so you don't have to move to different sort of platform or to different services to figure out to get the things you don't have to move individually to every services to see who is the user being using it or who is that uh, in which particular region is the things are being done you can simply move into the cloud trail and you can get details of everything whatever your users are being doing so now let us discuss about aws config 
So what does AWS Config will do? Basically, it will display a detailed view of the AWS resource configuration in AWS account. This includes how the resources are related to one another as well as how they are previously configured, allowing you to see how the configuration and relation changes over the time. Let us say there are two services that are been integ uh, integrated or you can say interacting with each other, your EC2 and your Elastic Load Balancer. So that particular relationship, you can track it down in the AWS Config. So AWS Config uh, gives you a lot of uh, benefits. Continuous monitoring is one of that. And once you monitor it, then you can start accessing the thing. You can do the assessment of that. You can uh, take the insight out of it. And you can look in. Okay, this should not have been done or this is how we can improve the things. You can uh, basically look onto those things. And if you are monitoring the things, then you will be able to know what are your organization or your enterprise guidelines, what is the standard that your particular organization has set up and whether you are following that or not. So let us say if any two services needed to integrate it, then there will be some uh, standard operating procedures for doing all of those things. If those things are not being uh, followed properly, you can keep a note of all of those things and you can do those things. So if you are doing all those things, then your security will be improved. So your security analysis and in resource administration, you can add, you can start looking in how your resources are being used and how exactly are they secure. Because if you are following a standard operating procedure for doing all of the things, so you will be able to do the things in much more better and in safe way. So if we will uh, see uh, elastic load balancer, uh, what exactly it do? Let us say if uh, any traffic is coming to your particular website or to architecture, then the distribution of the traffic is entirely dependent upon your load balancer. So load balancer uh, will uh, distribute the traffic and it will send the traffic only to those instances which are healthy. So with this uh, load balancer will increase your availability and the fault tolerance of your particular application. Now if you will uh, look into the elastic load balancer, then uh, elastic load balancer is the single point of contact for your client if any of the request is coming to or if any of the request is going out of your architecture then it has to uh, first of all uh, reach the load balancer then only either it can go out or it can come in so uh, elastic load balancer even scale itself for necessarily to handle the load so that is what elastic load balancer basically do it basically monitors the traffic and those traffic which are uh, having the particular rules specified which are able to pass the uh, particular protocols which has been specified it will let only those particular traffics to either come in or to go out of the architecture so that is what uh, elastic load balancer will do so if we will uh, see uh, primarily there are uh, four types of load balancer classic load balancer is there network load balancer is there, application load balancer is there and gateway load balancer is also there. If you will uh, see classic load balancer has now been deprecated. So it is uh, not available. Uh, recently AWS uh, basically you can say retired classic load balancer out of its services. So now majorly we are having uh, three types of uh, load balancers that is a network load balancer, application load balancer and the gateway load balancer. Now, uh, if we would see the when the classic load balancer was operating, it was operating at the layer seven of the OSI model. So basically, uh, the amount of traffic that it can handle was not that much enormous. But yes, at that time when it was launched, it was doing pretty much uh, good work. Now, uh, if you will see uh, into the application load balancer. Now, this is the uh, you can say load balancer which is still in use. Uh, it functioned at the seventh layer of the OSI model. Uh, let us say if uh, you are interacting with a website or uh, your architecture or your website does not uh, require heavy usage of the traffic. You are in not in need of high performance 
uh, for your particular uh, architecture the amount of traffic that is coming to your architecture is not that huge then definitely you can uh, go on with the application load balancer so it will uh, whatever the load balancer will do uh, all those feature is being there in the application load balancer so it will uh, direct the traffic it will check the particular uh, traffic is following uh, the particular protocols or not so the only thing that application load balancer will do is that the uh, it will uh, not give you a high performance or it will not be able to handle enormous uh, traffic if it comes up so let us say uh, if you uh, want to handle a particular website where enormous traffic is coming then what you can do you can definitely uh, choose a network load balancer so network load balancer will provide you high performance and it can even uh, handle a lot of request you can see that uh, it can handle million of request per second and maintain low latency so the latency also that uh, you will get will be pretty low so you can expect a good performance out of the network load balancer so uh, ideal for the load balancing uh, tcp traffic and support elastic and static ip so that is also the thing with the network load balancer now if we will uh, move in then we will be able to see another type of load balancer uh, that is gateway load balancer now if we will uh, see to the gateway load balancer uh, what it does uh, from the uh, previous two load balancer that is application load balancer and our network load balancer is that gateway load balancer uh, can help us uh, to deploy or scale or manage uh, our third party virtual appliances let us say if there is any third party virtual appliance then for that purpose we will be using gateway load balancer uh, you can basically test you can find out what is the problem or even you can buy the virtual appliances from the third party vendor directly in aws marketplace and after that you can integrate it with the gateway load balancer and you can see what exactly it is doing uh, also gateway load balancer uh, gives you the distributing traffic across the virtual appliances while scaling them up or down based upon the demand so it will check the demand and it will then do the scaling up uh, and with this uh, what uh, gateway load balancer is do is that uh, it eventually decreases the potential point of failure in the network and it also increases the availability now if we will uh, see these are the benefits of our gateway load balancer that we have already discussed that is deploy third party virtual appliances more quickly we can scale them up it increases the availability and uh, in gateway load balancer uh, the another feature that is not present if you look into the previous two is that gateway load balancer works upon an endpoint so if you are using an endpoint so then uh, what you will be having is a sort of a private network or you can expect a private tunnel to be available this particular endpoints are being provided to you from the aws so the availability the security and the reliability will be uh, you can say is far more superior as compared uh, to the other uh, things that you will be getting from the network load balancer or from the application load balancer so the connection or you can say that you will get uh, for the gateway load balancer will be far more superior so if you are uh, getting a particular end point for working then you can expect that uh, the connection will be not hampered if gateway load balancer is working then it will be majority of the times it will be available for you so you can uh, do whatever work you wanted to do now if you will look into the steps of creating a gateway load balancer it is pretty much easy you just have to go to uh, create a load balancer there you will get an option of gateway load balancer you have to click upon that you can give a name to that and once you do that then you can um, choose the client for communicating it is has to be ipv4 address uh, you have to select the service provider uh, vpc and you after that you can select all of the availability zones uh, so that uh, majority of the times the gateway load balancer will be available and it will be sending the traffic to the uh, particular instances after that you can uh, choose a target group uh, upon which your traffic will be routed and uh, the protocol that you need to specify in your target group is going to be Geneve uh, protocol uh, because upon that only gateway load balancer work after that you can review the things and you can simply uh, create a load balancer so creating this particular gateway load balancer will be uh, far more available as compared to network load balancer and application load balancer because of the endpoint because endpoint is like a private network that is being sponsored by the aws and why exactly is aws providing you that point because uh, aws charges you more for that particular option how to create an application load balancer 
and how exactly does it work so before that what we have to do we have to create instances for that so uh, let me create an instance so let me name it as ubuntu apl application load balancer and uh, for that i'll choose the ami as ubuntu type after that i will choose uh, keep here so let me do the things quickly after that i'll move into edit option and here in the security groups i will make it all traffic and after that i'll go down and i'll click on launch instance but the number of instance that i require here will be 2 after that i'll click on launch instance okay so these are the two instances that are currently in pending state so let me do few things here i will name it uh, i'll i'll rename it so that things will become more clear i will name it as apache 2 why exactly am i naming it as apache 2 because i will be running apache 2 web server in it and here in this machine i'll be launching nginx so these are the two machines so now it will take time before uh, they become available to us so in the meantime what we will do we will go into load balancing options and we will explore so in this particular demo session we will look in creating a application load balancer so if i will click on create load balancer here at the first i have to give the load balancer name and the another thing that i have to give here is the target group either you can create the target group here or you can have a target group and just associate it with your load balancer so we will do the last option so let me create a target group now what exactly is a target group you need to understand now before that you should be knowing what does this load balancer work is do load balancer has primarily two work one is to check whether the traffic coming on is following the protocols or not let us see if a request has been made whether that request is having valid permissions or not so that thing our load balancer will check and the second work that the load balancer will do is that routing the particular traffic only to those instances whose health checks are fine so now let us understand why are we in need of this target group let us say if i am having 100 number of instances right now or what i have did i have only launched two instances but let us say in real time scenario i am having 100 number of instances so if i will associate 100 instances with my load balancer then my load balancer have to do a lot of other work uh, and it will not be able to work in that much efficiency and its efficiency will decrease so for better management of this instances what idea we came up with we came up with something known as target group so what will this target group do basically we can associate our instances with this target group and then the target group will do the health checks of our instances and this target group will be associated with our load balancer and if any request or you can say if any particular traffic needed to be routed then load balancer will be doing it through the help of target group so let us create a target group but before that we'll be waiting so that our machines are okay so now our machines have also got the status check passed so let us go and let us associate our machines with target group so here i'll go in and i'll click on create target group so choose a target type so we will be going with instances because we will be attaching our uh, instances with our target group so here i need to specify the target group name so let me give it a name as uh, application target group application target group and here the protocol that it needed to be chose is http why because upon this only it is going to check whether our instances are running fine or not if you could uh, recall then while creating our particular instance i have allowed all traffic so if you allow all traffic by default http will be also enabled so you don't need to do anything and the vpc that we will choose will be default type 
because we are having our machine in this VPC only. After that, you can also see the health check protocol is going to be HTTP. So we'll keep it whatever it is. After that, I will click on next. So let me remove the underscores. Let me give the hyphen. After that, I'll click on next. Okay. So now this number of instances are been uh, running. So what we will do? We will select those instances which we have launched. Okay, so this is Ubuntu Apache 2 and Ubuntu Nginx. So we'll click on that and we'll then click on include as pending below. So now these two things are there and after that I'll click on create target group. And now my target group is available. You can see application target group. After creating this, what I'll do? I'll go to load balancer and here I will create a load balancer. The load balancer that I'll create is application load balancer. I have to give a name. Let me give it a name. Application load balancer. So after giving the name, the schema that I'll have is internet facing and the IP address will be IPv4. The VPC that I'll choose is default. And after this, I want the mapping to done to each and every subnet. So that in what whatever instance uh, or in whatever availability zone will be my instances in, they will be attached to it. So I'll select each and every one. After that, I have to choose the def security group. By default, default is there, but I will choose the security group which is being attached with my machine. Okay, so 21 was the security group that is being attached with my machine. After that, what I have to do, I have to choose a target group. This is the target group that I have created. So I'll choose it. And upon this listener, what it is trying to signify that how will the traffic will be routed? Let us say if some traffic needed to be routed. So to where it should be routed? It should be routed to target group. From target group, it will be moving on into the instances in a round robin manner. After this, what I'll do, I'll go down and I'll click on create load balancer. I'll click on view load balancer. Now it will take time so that uh, only after that the states will be uh, inactive. And if we go down into our target groups and if we will refresh it. Now here if I'll choose the target group that we have just created. So now the health checks are been also been performed. So we need to wait. So till the time what we can do, we can go back to our instances and we can launch uh, the web servers that we want. So first of all, let us go to Ubuntu Apache 2. Let me select it. Let me click on connect. After that, I'll move on into connect. So before installing what I'll do, I'll update my machine. sudo apt get update. So, so this is an Ubuntu type A my machine. So I'll type this sudo apt get update and it will basically update everything. So after the updation, what I'll do, I will install the Apache default web page here. So if I'll go back here and if I'll take the public IP and let us say if I'm pasting it here and now if I'll hit enter then nothing will come up because we are not running our default web page. But now let us say if I install our default web page, how to install it? sudo apt get install apache2 and if I hit enter. So now my apache web page is running. So if I will go back here, if I will refresh it, you can see apache default web page. Similarly, what I will do? I will go back. This time I will install Nginx. I'll click on connect. After that, I'll click on connect. So here, if I will take this instance public IP and if I'll paste it here, you will be able to see uh, nothing coming up because we are not running our default web page. So here, let me update my machine first. 
so after updating my machine i will install nginx here so why i'm exactly having two different web server because i need to uh, show it uh, in the application load balancer is that if i will take the dns name of my application load balancer and if i will refresh it then in the round robin manner it will distribute its traffic to two different instances so that thing i want to demonstrate so let me install here nginx so now my nginx is also been installed so now if i'll refresh it you'll be well able to see the nginx page now let's do one thing uh, let me go to ec2 here and then let me go to application load balancer so if i'll go back to application load balancer i'll go into load balancer this is the load balancer that we have just created the state is active and in the target group if we will go if we will move into our target group and we can see the health checks has been also been passed and both of our machine are healthy now if i will go back to the load balancer and if i will take the dns name from here if i will take it and if i'll paste it here and if i'll hit enter you will be able to see this time apache is coming if i'll refresh it nginx will come so in the round robin manner now our application load balancer is sending its traffic okay so let me take the dns name again okay so maybe due to internet connectivity issue that was the problem that we are facing but now you can see it is coming in round robin manner so our application load balancer what it is doing it is sending the traffic to to two of our instances which have been registered and in one instance i am running default apache web page in the other i am running nginx so you can see when i am refreshing it it is sending the traffic in a alternate fashion so i am having two of my instances already running in one i am running apache 2 web server and in the another one i am running nginx so now let us go and create a network load balancer so i will basically associate those two load balancers uh, sorry those two instances with my target group so now the question comes up is when we will be using application load balancer and when we will be using network load balancer let us say if the traffic that is coming to your website or to architecture is more then you should definitely go with network load balancer and if the traffic is less then you can go with application load balancer moreover if you need more high performance then definitely you can go with network load balancer you can see here also ultra high performance can be provided to you from your network load balancer now let's click on create after that we have to give a load balancer name let me give it as network load balancer only network load balancer after that the scheme i'll have it as internet facing the ip address i'll keep it as ip before only then the vpc that you should be going on is default because the machines are also running in the same default vpc only so i'll choose all of the uh, availability zones in the mapping after that if you will come here then you can see in the protocol uh, it is going for uh, port 80 so basically uh, in your machines you should be allowing uh, all traffic in that all of the ports will be getting covered up so i have not created a target group so we have to create a target group i'll click on create target group so a new tab will open up now i'll be creating a target group for network load balancer so the basic configuration choose a target type i'll choose it as instance after that i'll give a name network load balancer target group here the protocol that is being given by default is tcp so i'll not do any other changes i will keep it as tcp only after that the health checks will be also performed on tcp so in your machines you should be enabling all traffic or if you want only specific thing then do allow tcp after that i'll click on next yeah so here uh, whatever machines will be running they will pop up so i'll choose the two machines that are of mine that is ubuntu apache 2 and ubuntu nginx after that i'll click on include as pending below after that i'll click on create target group so successfully i have 
created my target group. Now it will take some time for all the health checkups. But in the meantime, let me associate this target group with my load balancer. So I'll select the target group. This is the target group that I, that I just created. I will have it. After that, I'll go down and I'll click on create load balancer. Okay, you already have a OK. So let me create another one. Network load balancer demo. Let me give it a name. After that, I'll click on create load balancer. So now my load balancer is also ready. Okay, I have created it. Now it will take some time uh, for coming up in the active state and uh, the health checks will also going to take some time. In the meantime, uh, let us explore what we have in our EC2. Okay, if I'll go back here, then in this instance, if you will see, I'm having the VPC that is default and in the security group, you can see the VPC is default. That's why I've selected default VPC in both of my target group and in the load balancer. And if I'll move into security, you can see launch user 21 is there and all traffic is being enabled. Similarly, if I'll go into Nginx, there also the security group that is, is being attached is launch user 21 only and the VPC is also default. So this thing you need to keep in mind if you are trying to launch and load balancer. So it will take time. After that only it will be having all the health check passed up. Now you can see the health checks has been going on. Similarly, here also it will be in provisioning state. Once the provisioning will uh, change into active state, then I'll take the DNS name and then I'll paste it there. And after that, we will see that network load balancer will be transferring the particular traffic into our EC2 instances and um, in my machines I am running in one machine I am running uh, Nginx and in the other I am running Ubuntu as my default web servers. So we will be able to see it but the traffic will not be routed in round robin manner as it was happening in network load balancer. Now we shall wait and once the things are in available state then we will move on. So I waited uh, for a few more minutes and right now you can see the health checks have been performed and after that you can also see my load balancer is also available. Now if I will take the DNS name and if I will paste it in the web browser you will be able to see either Nginx or Ubuntu will pop up but it is going to take some time. So if I will hit enter it will take time uh, to come up. Okay, It came quickly. Now if I will refresh it Nginx will not come up directly. So the things are not done here in round robin manner. So I need to refresh it a lot of time. Then Nginx will appear. Yeah. So let me keep it on refreshing. Then a time will come when Nginx will pop up. So let me paste the thing again. Now let me keep on refreshing it. Yeah. So now Nginx came up. Load balancer architecture, wetted routing and connection training. So if we will uh, see the load balance architecture, what it basically does, let us say if you are having a particular website, then it will uh, reside uh, at the top and whatever request will be coming uh, depending upon the healthy instances, whether if any instance is healthy or not, it will check it first. And if any instance is healthy, then it will start sending the particular uh, traffic to those instances. So uh, instances can be present at uh, different availability zones. So it will check uh, in what particular availability zones those are uh, available and uh, depending upon that it will uh, start sending the particular uh, traffic to those instances and the instances will be handling those traffic. Now uh, we get an option of uh, you can say traffic management in the uh, load balancer that uh, is what we say either blue green deployment you can say or you can also say it as wetted routing. What basically it does, uh, let us say if uh, 10 number of uh, request or you can say 10 traffic is coming to your website. So basically you can define uh, to whom majority of traffic should go. Let us say uh, if you want a majority of your traffic to go onto a particular target group. So you can uh, define those things 
uh, in the load balancer so that option you will get uh, if you are having two target groups so you can define that majority of traffic uh, where it should go so that is what uh, we are having in weighted routing uh, we can specify which target group or which instance should get a majority of the traffic and which should not get the majority of traffic so by this way you can uh, make uh, the particular decision of managing a website uh, much more betterly because you will be knowing where is your majority of traffic is going so this is how a uh, weighted uh, routing will look like now uh, the blue green deployment is just a terminology that has been given to the thing uh, so it's all about uh, sending your particular traffic to whatever target group you want and how much you want now if we will uh, look into cross join uh, load balancing uh, by default uh, cross join load balancing uh, distribute the traffic to the instance in their only availability zones so uh, they don't go beyond their availability zone so if we will uh, enable this cross join uh, load balancing from the particular name it is pretty much self explanatory that what it will do it will uh, not bound uh, the sending of the traffic only to uh, its zone only so it will uh, go out of the zone and it will start sharing the particular traffic uh, based upon the loads the particular instance having the smallest load will also get an uh, you can say uh, everyone will be getting a minimum or you can say everyone will be getting a specific load no one will be having much more load and no one will be having very less load so everyone will uh, come to a mean where uh, the particular uh, traffic will be distributed in a very appropriate manner in a very systematic manner so that none of the instance will go down so now uh, let's look into what exactly is in connection draining uh, let us say uh, if you have registered your instance uh, in your target group now due to some issue your instance is not behaving properly or the health check in the health check your instance is unable to pass the health check now that particular instance needed to be removed from our architecture so that process of removing the uh, particular instance from our architecture is known as connection draining so you get the option of uh, doing connection draining uh, in your particular load balancer you can do that so the best part about the connection draining is that let us say if you are doing the connection draining then during that time your particular architecture will not go down because uh, other uh, target groups will be available to maintain the particular you can say flow of the state of the architecture so you uh, basically remove that instance only which is unhealthy and uh, once you do it again uh, that particular instance will be removed you can look in what exact problem was there you can try fixing it and then you can do the thing right now i am having two machines ubuntu nginx and ubuntu apache 2 in this i am having uh, my default web server as apache and here i am having default web server as nginx so let me show you that so if i select this nginx ubuntu nginx machine if i take the public ip of it after taking it if i paste it here and if i hit enter you can see nginx page is visible to me similarly if i go into apache take the public ip address of it and if i paste it here you can see apache 2 default web page is coming now let us see how to do the routing so what we will do first of all we have to create a target group so let me create a target group here so the target group name that i'll give here is target group 1 after that i will keep it as default vpc only because my machine is present there here i will click on next after that i am having two machines but i'll re register only one machine in it let me register only ubuntu nginx after that i'll click on include as pending below after that i'll click on create target group so i have successfully created a target group now what i'll do i'll create another target group so let me create a target group target group 2 and this time i'll register nginx with it so i'll click on next so here uh, i'll be getting so what i'll do i'll choose nginx this time okay let me check what was the thing that we have done okay so here uh, we have okay we have done the nginx so this time what we will do we will choose the ubuntu so let me go to create target group and this time i'll choose ubuntu after that i'll move into next 
and here I will choose Ubuntu. Ubuntu Apache 2. Nginx is already done, so this time we are choosing Ubuntu. After that, what we will do? I will click on create target group. So now I have created two target group. Why exactly have I created it? We will be looking into it. After that, I will go into load balancer. And here I will click on create load balancer and I will be creating an application load balancer. I will click on application load balancer. Here I will give the name application load balancer. After typing it down, I will give the VPC as default only because both of my machines are present there only. After that, I will choose every availability zone that is being specified over here. So after choosing all of the availability zone, I have to give the security group. So I'll check in what security group is my machines are available. So if I go to Apache 2, so if I go to security, then I can see launch user 23 is attached. If I move into the Nginx and if I check what is the security group here also launch user 23 is attached. So what I have done, I have attached one uh, security group with both of my instances. If you are having two different security group, you can just go uh, check and select that. After that, if you want to give the default security group, you can keep it or else you can remove it. And after that, uh, you will be choosing a target group. Let me choose the first target group only. After choosing the first target group, what I'll do, I'll go down and I'll click on create load balancer. And now my load balancer is being created. Now uh, we will be doing the things upon this listener. You can see in the description, we'll be getting DNS name and all. But here uh, to do the weighted routing, we will look into listener. So what exactly is listener do? Basically, it is a process that check for connection request. Okay, it will check for the connection request to whom do we need to send the traffic and by what amount we can specify those things in our ad listener. So if I select it and if I go here to edit. So here uh, we can do the weighted routing thing. And if you want to add the rules and where you can do that, you have to uh, select your listener and you can go to view slash edit rules and you can do the things here. But right now, let us do the thing here only. So I'll select my listener. After that, I'll click on edit. So here, what I will be doing is that I have attached my first target group. So now uh, let me choose the second target group. And once I choose the second target group, this thing will be enabled, weights. Okay. So now what is this thing telling me that let us say if two requests are coming, one request will move to target group one in which I am having Nginx and the second will move into Ubuntu. But now let us say if I don't want that, if I want a majority of my particular request should move into Nginx, I can choose that. I can choose that and here I can make it two. So let me make it two. So what exactly is happening? Let us say if two requests, sorry, 10 requests are coming, then eight requests will move into my Nginx, which is being present in my target group one. And other two requests, let us say 10 requests comes up, eight requests will move into target group one. In target group one, I am having Nginx. So that web, web page I'll be able to see. And the other two times only, I am going to see Ubuntu. But let me tell you, uh, this is not entirely specific that okay if i am doing uh, 10 number of refreshes then i should be getting 8 and 2 sometimes it can be 9 or 1 or it can also be 7 or 3 but yes majority of times you will be able to see target group 1 and in target group 1 uh, what have we registered if we will go and if we will say the things in target group 1 we are having nginx so if i move into target group 1 uh, here you can see nginx is there and in the other target group i am having ubuntu so let me do the things after uh, doing it, after giving the weights, you can click on save changes. So now the changes are been saved. So now let us go back to our load balancer. So the load balancer of ours is also active. You can see application load balancer. If I will take the DNS name now and if I will uh, paste it here and now if I will uh, start refreshing the thing, you will be able to see, okay, the first time Apache came second time nginx came third time nginx came fourth time nginx came fifth sixth okay yeah so majority of times you will be able to see nginx and uh, for least number of times you will be able to see ubuntu 
So you can see majority of times nginx is coming up because in the target group one it is being registered. Okay. Yeah. So if I am refreshing after five or six times uh, Apache is coming and after that again nginx will be there and nginx will be continuing for more number of times. So this is what we can do if we are uh, having a wetted route in our application load balancer we can do the things using that. So now uh, as we are able to see we if we keep on refreshing it now Ubuntu will come for lesser number of times and nginx will come more number of times. Now uh, let us try to change the rules. What we have seen we have went into listener we have edited it the particular weights. Now what uh, we shall be trying and doing is changing the rules. Okay, It is taking a little bit longer time. No worries. Let's go back. So let us select this listener. In this listener only we are going to work. So what we will do? We will go into view and edit rules. And here what we will be doing is we will be adding a rule. So let us understand what is the significance of this rule. Let us say this is my DNS name, correct? But if I will type here something, let us say sub or something like this, you can see it is telling uh, not found because it is has it has nothing to actually sue. So what we can do if I again give that thing, so it will come back. So let us do a thing. Let us say if I type something after this particular DNS name, then should something should come up. So how to do that? We can do that using rules. But before that, let us do one thing. Let us take any of this machine. Let me go with uh, Apache. Let me select it. After selecting it, let me connect it. So once I click on connect, I will uh, update my machine. So let me update it. Yeah, so it came up. So let me update it. Updating my machine, what I'll do. I will uh, move into the particular directory where my default web page is being located. So where it is located? It is at var forward slash www slash html and I'll hit enter. So here if I'll do ls you will be able to see index.html page is running and this is the particular default web page for Apache. So here I will do a tweak. What exactly will I do? First of all I will create a particular directory. Let me create a directory with sudo mkdir. After creating a directory, I'll give it a name. Let me give it a name as server, server1. And let me create a directory. Now if I'll do ls, I'll be able to see server directory, server1 directory is present here. So now let me move into here, cd server1. After moving in, what I'll do, I'll create a particular HTML file. So how to do that, sudo nano index.html okay i'll be giving the same name because this is by default will be coming up whenever any direction will happen so after doing it what i'll do i'll hit enter so this particular thing will open up let me type something here this is this is re directed page so after typing it what i'll do i'll save it and i'll come out of it now what I have done, I have moved into this var forward slash www.html. I created a directory. I moved into directory. I created a particular index.html file. Now let us specify this rule in the rule section. So what I'll do, I'll add a rule. I'll click on insert rule. After that, I have to give the condition. What condition I'll do? Basically, I'll provide your path. And in the path, what I'll do, I'll specify forward slash after that, I have to give my directory name, again a forward slash, after that, just click OK. After this, what action am I doing? I am basically trying to forward it to my target group 2. Why I am choosing target group 2? Because my Ubuntu uh, web server instance is present in target group 2. After that, I will select it. So after doing that, I will click on save. So once I save it. I'll go back to here. If now I will type here server1 and forward slash and if I hit enter. So if I will refresh it, you can see this is redirected page. 
so as uh, the things happen in the previous uh, one also if you refresh 10 times not every time it will come up sometimes uh, error page will appear but majority of times you will be able to see it so if i'll refresh it i'll be able to do it yeah so after sometimes it will stop at the beginning it might give you error but once you save it this will be done now what exactly is an uh, sticky session we will look into that let us say uh, if a particular user is interacting with your application and due to uh, some problem that particular user is uh, logged out of that particular user of that particular application you can say now let us say if that particular user is coming to the application uh, in a specific time period or let us say after uh, whatever time that particular user is coming back to that particular application of yours or to that website so that particular uh, user should be uh, in the same uh, you can say same dashboard or it should be in the same process or it should be in the same step from where that particular user has been logged out so now how to do that thing then we get the solution from sticky session what exactly sticky session do sticky session basically binds our user with a particular session so let us say if the particular uh, traffic is coming uh, so the traffic has been generated by the user and that particular user through that traffic is interacting with the machine and somehow the connection got lost now let us say if that particular user is again trying to establish the connection then that particular user should be uh, taken to the same instance with which that particular user was interacting and to the same step where that user was present so to do those thing we are having the sticky session so sticky session will bind that user to the particular session or to the particular instance where it was uh, working so that uh, we can improve the better uh, experience we can have we can provide them better user experience so we can do uh, this particular feature enabled uh, by going into the target group so there we get the option of uh, doing it so basically in the load balancer because target group is attached to the load balancer so we can uh, do the things now uh, if we will look into the sticky sessions so what are the advantages of using the sticky session first of all uh, the let us say if a particular user is interacting with your website and that particular website is running on a machine now that particular user has been logged out uh, because uh, your machine uh, your particular website will be hosted on uh, many of the instances uh, because um, they will be available all the time so there will be lot of availability zone in lot of availability zone lot of machines are being uh, running let us say for the first time your user was interacting with the application and it got logged out and at that time that particular user was interacting with the instance number one now whenever uh, for the second time if the user is again trying to log in and again trying to access the website if that particular user is being directed to an another uh, entirely another machine then what hap will be happen at the first uh, then at first the data needed to be transferred from instance one to instance two and after that only we will be able to provide that user at whatever step it was so there was uh, the data exchange thing was happening so that thing we can reduce if we are using the sticky session and uh, let us say if that particular user was on step number two so whatever uh, data we have already stored in step number one again we will be not storing that straight away from where that particular user was logged out we can start the things and after that our ram cache utilization will be also improved because that particular user is trying to access the website again in a very limited uh, period of time so that thing also we can do so now uh, how exactly to enable this ticket session you can go into the target group and you can enable it now if we will look into the types of uh, sticky sessions uh, then uh, there are basically two types of sticky sessions one is duration based and one is application controlled in duration based what exactly happen uh, based upon a particular duration we will be specifying uh, for how long the sticky session will apply let us say uh, while enabling the uh, particular sticky session we say that okay for five minutes our sticky session has been enabled so if that particular user uh, is in coming back to our application in that specified time period then only that user will be able to move into the same step where that user has been logged out and what is application uh, based um, sticky session your application will be creating a sticky session for that and application will be managing it so that is what application based sticky session are and let us say if this sticky session are being used then for that for managing the things we have to create cookies 
so if we are creating the cookies based upon it this sticky session will be working so if you are enabling a sticky session feature what you can do you can bind a user session to a specific target okay so that is the particular feature that sticky session will give you and uh, what is the particular uh, help uh, that we get if we are enabling sticky session is that uh, we will be able to provide uh, much more better you can say uh, services to our customer the sir the experience that the customer will get will be much more good if you compare if you don't enable stickiness okay so if you will see uh, see then uh, sticky sessions are of uh, different types okay there is a combination of sticky sessions that we get one can be duration based one is application based and uh, there can be a by default no stickiness uh, associated with your target group whenever you go and create any target group by default uh, this particular feature of sticky session is not enabled so you need to enable it and uh, in this session uh, we will be looking into our duration based uh, stickiness and we shall be looking in uh, exactly how it happens okay so what exactly we will try to do uh, we will launch uh, two of our instance okay after launching two of our instance in one instance we will be having our default apache 2 web server in the another one we will be having our custom based web server and once we will associate two of our instance to a target group then we will uh, uh, associate a load balancer with our target group after that we will take the public dns of our load balancer and try to uh, access the two of the pages that is associated with my instance and after that we will see what happens when we enable stickiness and what does uh, happen when we don't enable stickiness okay so uh, if you will see stickiness is very helpful let's say uh, you are interacting with a website and suddenly due to some error you got logged out but now let's say in a specific duration you again came back to the same uh, you can say website so you need to be on the same staff where you are previously so that particular feature can be made enable to you if you are having a stickiness uh, property associated with your application okay for that you can use your application based stickiness but uh, in this demo we will be using the duration based so before uh, doing the things uh, let me launch instances and then we shall see how exactly are we doing the things okay, so let me give it a name let me give it a name let's say shub out of this the ami that i'll choose will be ubuntu and now i have to choose my key pair so i'll choose my key pair and uh, here uh, the security group uh, that i am having is launch wizard 9 now i will allow https and http because the health checks that will be performed uh, from the target group will be on this and i also need this http and https to see uh, my web servers okay after this i'll specify the number of instances that i require is 2 okay and after this what i'll do i'll specify 2 and after this i'll click on launch instance okay so now my machine will get launched okay it got launched okay. so if i'll refresh yeah so it is two shub the first one and the second one okay, so let me give it a name let's say shub default web page okay shub default web page so right now if i'll move here shub custom web page okay and i'll save it so right now the status checks i don't think that they would have got passed yeah so right now one is my default web page another one is my custom web page so in the meantime uh, till the time it is getting initialized okay till the time it gets the status check passed what i'll do i'll move forward i'll go into target group and i will associate two of my instance with a target group i'll click on a target group and here i will let me give it a name let's say shub target group okay shub target group so the protocol that it is using is port 80 for the checking of our 
instance okay whether our instance are responding properly or not after this i'll have the default vpc because i have launched my instance in this vpc only health checks also you can see it will be based upon http okay, so after this let me go to next so now here uh, my instances will be visible these are the two instances of mine that i have created so default web page and custom web page so i'll select this two of my instances and i'll then click on include as pending below and now i shall move down and i'll click on create target group and uh, now my target group is available okay you can see it might not have got uh, initialized okay so because we have uh, not given any load balancer and uh, the health checks would also be going on right now well, yeah you can see the health check is not till yet passed it is still you can say unused health status okay so right now what uh, let us do one thing uh, let me go back and see if my machine is available or not okay so still it is initializing yeah so now uh, two of my machines are available so let me first go into this shub default uh, web page okay i'll move forward i'll then click on connect i'll go to connect option okay so here it is my terminal so what i'll do uh, i'll first update my machine okay so i'll then hit it yeah so now my machine uh, has got updated now what i'll do i'll install the default uh, apache 2 web server so how to install it sudo apt install apache 2 okay after this i'll type minus y so that wherever any condition is required and that whether you want to install it or not it should go on yes i'll hit enter and now my default uh, web page of apache 2 is now available so let me copy it uh, let me go to here let me paste it this public ip and now you will be able to see my apache 2 default web page okay now what i'll do i'll go back okay I'll go back to my instance so let me close this session now uh, if i'll go into my this sub custom web page i will now move into this i'll click on connect now what i'll do i'll click on connect so here uh, in this machine what i'll be having i'll be having my custom web page i will not have the default apache 2 web page but i will have a web page of uh, whatever type i want whatever content i want i will be giving that okay so but before that uh, let me update my machine okay so first of all i'll update my machine yeah, so now my machine has got update so what i'll do now i will first so i will first of all install the apache 2 okay so let me first install the apache 2 web page okay so now my apache 2 web page for this machine for my custom uh, web, uh, custom default web page is also now available if i will take the public ip and if i'll paste it here and if i'll hit enter the default apache web page is now available but what i'll do i don't want uh, this uh, default apache 2 web page but i want a web page of somewhat uh, having my content so what i'll do first of all i will move into the directory where i'm having this file okay so i'll move to there okay i'll move to there and now here if i'll do ls i'm able to see a index.html file this is the file uh, which is being displayed over here so what i'll do first of all i'll uh, delete this file how to delete it you can type here sudo remove index.html and you can hit enter now if i'll do ls you will be able to see there is nothing to show up because this file doesn't exist if i'll now go upon here and if i'll uh, refresh it you will be able to see there is no file so what i'll do now so i will now create a file uh, of same name sudo nano index.html index.html and I, I will then so let me uh, this file has opened now uh, this file is, has been created and now it is open so let me type somewhere like uh, something to it this is a sticky session demo and let me save it 
Okay, so I have, I have made that changes. Now what I'll do, if I'll refresh this page, you will be able to see the content that I have put there. So now we are done uh, with our whatever configuration we needed to do with our machine. Now let us move into our load balancer. Let us do few configurations there. And then we shall be looking at how exactly do we do the things with sticky sessions. So now if I'll move into target group, I have to create a target group. I'll be creating, sorry, I have already created a target group. So all I will be creating is a application load balancer. I'll go to create option and here I'll give a name. Let me give it a name. Let's say Shub. Okay. So let me give it a name, say Shub. So one, two, three, four, Shub, okay. And uh, after giving the name, I will have the same VPC in which my target group, my machines are available. And after this, I'll select, I'll select all the mappings to the availability zones that have been present. Okay, I have selected it. Now, I will associate the same security group that I was having with my machine. And I was having launch wizard nine. After this, I will be selecting a target group. Now this is the target group, should target group. I'll select it. And after selecting it, what I'll do, I'll click on create target group. And now I have been successfully able to create my, sorry, create my tag, uh, load balancer. Now, right now it, the state is in provisioning. Okay, so I'll wait till the time it's get active. Okay, it will take few moments and then it will be available. In the meantime, let me check what is the status of my target group. So this is my target group. Yeah, right now also it is initializing, no worries. It is still in provisioning state, so I shall wait. And once uh, it will be active, then we shall move forward and we will look into the things. So what basically we are going to do, uh, we will be using this DNS name and we will be able to see two of our uh, web pages that we made. Okay. One is our custom web page that we made and the other one is having my default page. So till then I shall wait. Okay. So I'll wait for a few more minutes. And once it is uh, active, then we shall move forward. Okay, let me check if I'm able to access the things in the provisioning state. Let us see. Yeah, so the yes, so the things are coming. So let us see. I think now it has got active. Okay, so what I basically did is uh, I took the DNS name. Okay, yeah, it has got active. So what I did, uh, I have got the DNS name. Okay, I took the DNS name. So one, two, three, four, Shub. Uh, and uh, I have pasted it here. Now, uh, if I will uh, refresh it every time, in a round robin manner, the things will appear to me. Okay. But now let us say, uh, if I want uh, only this particular thing to pop up uh, in front of me, or if you want a particular session uh, to get associated, what you can do? Uh, we will then uh, look into our stickiness uh, behavior. Okay, we'll move into stickiness session and we'll be able to do. Okay, so it is, uh, you can say it is a very helpful uh, for the server that maintain the state information in order to provide continuous experience to client. Okay, so if we will move into target groups, okay, this is my target group, I'll move into here. So if I'll move into attribute, so here uh, in the attribute, we have this option of stickiness. Okay. So what we'll do, we'll move into edit. And here uh, you can also see the load balancing algorithm that we just discussed. It is round robin. Now what I'll do, I'll go into the stickiness option. And here I get two types of stickiness. One is load balancer generated cookie. Another one is application balanced cookie. So if you want to use the stickiness, okay, cookies will be there to manage the things. So what I'll do, I'll enable it and it will ask me, okay, what stickiness duration you can want to have. You can have in seconds, you can have in minutes. So let me go with, uh, you can say an R, whatever option it suits you, you can go with it. Then you can click on save changes. Now 
I have now enabled stickiness if you will able to see I have refreshed it once okay this particular session came up now it is coming okay, it might take some time and after this okay now it has got uh, the stickiness session is now being applied now if I will try to refresh the thing okay you will be able to see I'm not able to move into uh, my another web page my default web page I'm unable to move okay so that is what happened when you enable uh, stickiness okay so and uh, if you want to see the cookies are been managed how can you do it you can go to inspect and here you have to move into application and here in the cookies you can see the cookie having on public DNS name of our uh, you can say load balancer so this is how the cookies are being managed okay so now uh, if I will keep on refreshing it will uh, the stickiness property has been applied for an R so I will be uh, binded to this session only but now what I'll do let me go back right now the stickiness is uh, on right now what I'll do if I'll go back and if I disable it and if I now save the changes okay and if now I'll come back now if I'll refresh after some time I'll be able to see the default web page okay it will take some time to make the app changes happen yeah so now the things came up okay so now I'm able to access my default web page so auto scaling uh, you can say is a process in which uh, you can basically scale up or down the number of instances depending upon the load upon your particular instance when I say load upon your instance the load can be anything it can be your CPU utilization it can be your network in or network out or depending upon the different matrices you can basically specify that whether you need to increase the number of instances present in your architecture or not so the auto scaling group uh, enables you uh, to particularly automate your website uh, how exactly does it uh, gives you that particular feature because let us say if you uh, enable auto scaling group then what will happen then you, manual intervention to that will be uh, very uh, minimum so auto scaling uh, groups will be doing their task you just need to specify everything and once you specify it they will be start working upon it let us say uh, your AWS auto scaling um, is monitoring your application and uh, the, the particular scaling is able to uh, predict that what performance is it showing whether uh, the particular performance of your instances are good or not and uh, based upon that also it can simply uh, roll out the new instances so that option auto scaling grips you so you can basically uh, scale in or scale out uh, whatever resources you have generally we uh, create the auto scaling uh, for the instances and here we get two types of the auto scaling the one is vertical and one is horizontal so what exactly is vertical and horizontal we'll be discussing in after a few more slides so auto scaling uh, will automatically uh, enables you to scale in or out the instances whenever it require and uh, so dynamically it will be doing everything so the load upon the particular uh, architect can be managed in much more better way if we are enabling auto scaling now let us see what exactly is in vertical and horizontal scaling so what happens in vertical scaling is that we will be having one single machine and we just increase the capacity of the machine by adding more resources what can be the more resources we can add more uh, cpus we can uh, give more storage option to that single machine only so if you look into what are the advantages of doing the uh, vertical scaling uh, it is that uh, we will reduce the software cost as we will be not getting a more number of instances but we will be having only one instances and upon that we are just enhancing its uh, capabilities and uh, let us say if we are doing it then uh, very few efforts we will be putting in it but uh, there are uh, major disadvantages with it uh, what is the first major disadvantage as we are having only one machine so the downtime can be very high let us say if our machine goes down then recovering it will uh, take a time because lot of the resources are there and as we are using just one machine and we are ha giving it enormous capacity so uh, the risk for hardware failure 
also increases. Now, if we will look into uh, horizontal scaling, what exactly happens in horizontal scaling is that uh, we are adding here more number of machine of same time to the existing pool of resources. So there in the vertical scaling, we are having only single machine and that single machine uh, capabilities we are increasing. But here we are increasing the new uh, machines to it. So if we will uh, look into the advantages of this particular horizontal scaling, then the very first advantage is that the fault tolerance uh, will be there. That basically mean that your particular uh, architecture or your website will be highly available. Uh, and also the latency will be very less because there will be a lot of machines. So the uh, load can be shared more properly and the data will be available in more number of machines. So you will be able to betterly uh, manage the customer uh, user experience you can say that and uh, but what are the disadvantage of using the horizontal scaling the first major advantage disadvantage is that uh, you have to pay uh, more the cost will be increasing because we are adding new machines and apart from that the another disadvantage with this type of scaling is that uh, implementation of the particular architecture is not that much easy so now let us see what is the life cycle of the auto scaling let us say uh, if you are having an auto scaling so what basically it will do either it will uh, scale out or scale in the instances let us say if you are having an ec2 instance and it is about to get launched so it will be in pending state let us say from the pending state uh, it has moved uh, into the in service state then after that what will happen a health check will be performed if the health check uh, is well and good so it will be able to be in service or if the health check does not pass so it will uh, move into the terminating state and from their terminating state it will uh, where go into the terminating weight and from there it the particular process will be started and after that it will be terminated let us say if it is in the in service but it is not being in that use so then we can basically give uh, enter it into the and standby and we can there uh, keep it in the standby till the time we don't require and once we will require it uh, then again we will make it into the pending state and then we will decide whether to bring it or not let us say if uh, there is a particular machine which is there in the pending state for a very longer period of time we can simply uh, take it into the pending weight and from there we can just keep it till the time we don't require it and whenever we will require it we will bring it again into the in service let us say if there is a particular instance uh, which needed to be detached so we can basically detach it and once we detach it again it will be available to us from the ec2 instance if we will uh, require it then again we can use it so this is what the life cycle of the auto scaling goes on we will be uh, scaling out scaling in the instances and in between that whatever things are there like terminating terminating way terminating proceed those things we need to take care of so if we will see uh, the auto scaling components then let us first see uh, the groups so in auto scaling group what exactly do we specify we specify our ec2 instances and there uh, we also specify that uh, what needed to be the maximum number of instances that our auto scaling group can launch what can be the minimum number of instances that our auto scaling uh, will be keep running uh, depending upon the matrices and what is the desired number of instances that should be running let us say if you created a auto scaling group at the beginning when the auto scaling group will be created uh, whatever will be the desired number of instances those number of instances will be launched at the very first go only and then depending upon these policies that you define they will be either a maximum number of instances or minimum number of instances or instances in between now uh, let us look uh, into the configuration template so what exactly is in configuration template uh, basically this uh, place and blueprint for uh, the release of your instance let us say if you are uh, releasing your instances then you need to have a lot of information about ec2 all of those information will be uh, there in your configuration template now what exactly do we have in scaling uh, options you uh, get lot of uh, options in the scaling option what are those either you can uh, manually scale uh, your auto scaling or you can dynamically do it or you can even do the uh, scaling based upon the demand or a particular schedule so we'll be looking into it uh, so let's move forward so uh, in auto scaling uh, groups what exactly do we do uh, we basically specify that uh, how many number of instances uh, will be there uh, whether the policy needed to be attached 
or not and depending upon those policy uh, our instances will be started our instances will be terminated everything will be done as per the policies we have to attach the configuration uh, launch configuration or you can say launch templates with the auto scaling groups and if all of these things are integrated then only our auto scaling uh, group will be functioning uh, we can also integrate our load balancer with our auto scaling group that option will be also looking in so here if we will see into the uh, configuration template as i already told you uh, let us say if you want to launch a particular machine so you need to have a lot of uh, information about the machine like what exactly will be the ami what will be the instance type uh, what key pair is it going to use what security group uh, does it need to have in uh, which vpc it should be launched in what subnet uh, it should be available so all of those information we contain in our configuration template so if you will look uh, there are two ways of creating a configuration template either you can create it from the scratch or uh, you can create it from an ec2 let us say if you are creating it from scratch then what you can do you need to have an image id instance type and the storage uh, devices you need to allocate it and once you do that you will be able to create it uh, other way is uh, directly from an ec2 instance you can do it you can uh, take the ami out of it and after that uh, you can provide the other options like instance type and storage options and you can uh, do it but one thing to note here is that let us say if you created a launch configuration then you uh, cannot modify it once you have created it so you need to be uh, careful while creating your configuration template because based upon that only whatever auto scaling group will be launching the instances those instances uh, features will be contained in configuration template so you need it to be very sure when you are launching any instance so now uh, if we will look into the scaling uh, policies and allow uh, let us say if you want to create a policy then uh, for the proper functioning of that policy you have to create alarm so the alarms you can create it in the cloud watch so basically uh, whenever a specific uh, target will be met up those alarms will be triggered and upon those uh, alarms uh, triggering your auto scaling uh, groups will be working upon so now uh, let us see what exactly happens in the scaling policy you can basically specify uh, let us say if you have created an alarm that if my cpu utilization of my machine is above 70 percent for a uh, continuously five minute then uh, there the alarm needed to be triggered and then you can specify okay if the uh, particular you can say if my cpu utilization of my particular instance for five minute is above 70 uh, percent then once my alarm is triggered then my auto scaling group are needed to work either it can increase the number of instances or it can decrease the number of instances and uh, for that only we have already be describing the how many number of minimum instances maximum instances and the desired number of instances our uh, auto scaling group can launch so now uh, if you will see there are uh, ways of um, scalings uh, you can either go for a schedule scaling or you can also go for a demand scaling uh, what happens in schedule scaling uh, you can basically specify that okay at this particular time on this date i should be getting more number of instances or i should be decreasing the number of instances you can calculate it let us say if any uh, website is there let us say amazon.com is there then if festive season is about to come uh, if it is about to start from today uh, 2 pm then um, i'm pretty much sure that the load upon my particular website is going to increase so i need to uh, need more number of instances for managing the load so what i can do uh, exactly at 2 pm uh, i can launch more number of instances so the load will be properly distributed then the other aspect is the scaling based upon the demand so what exactly is that mean we have already discussed it that let us say if my cpu utilization uh, is uh, enormous then based upon that i can even roll out or i can even uh, take back the instances so those ha things happen in demand uh, there are other matrices also upon which you can decide whether to roll out the instance or not to roll out instance like cpu utilization is there network uh, input is there network output is there so upon those things based upon the demand uh, of your particular instance or per upon your particular architecture you can do that so we have uh, seen this scaling policies uh, already that uh, we can specify if the cpu utilization is above for a particular uh, period of limit uh, then what needed to be act on either you can decrease or you can increase so this is the uh, pictorial uh, representation of that let us say if your particular uh, uh, instance uh, so, uh, upon your instance the cpu load is above 80 so you can uh, increase the number of instances and uh, let us say if the 
particular uh, load upon your instance is below 50 you can decrease it so this that is how you can do the things and you uh, have the option of either doing it manually or you can even do it dynamically so you can just specify those things in the auto scaling group and auto scaling group will be doing it so now uh, let us discuss about uh, the different types of uh, scalings uh, like we are having a few different type one is simple scaling and we will be also having step scaling so if we will uh, look in what exactly is the uh, difference in between uh, both of this scaling uh, pretty much they are s same uh, if you will see whatever options you get uh, in the simple scaling you also get those options in the step scaling basically this is the way in which you needed to either increase or you decrease your number of instances so uh, the both of the things are pretty similar but uh, the only thing that um, the only difference you can say that comes up is that uh, let us say if you are using simple scaling then what will happen the policy must wait for uh, the scaling activity or the health check replacement to complete and the cool down period to end before responding to additional alarm let us say if you have uh, specified uh, that okay if the uh, cpu utilization of my machine is above 80 then i should be uh, you can say i should be running more instances i should be launching more instances but let us say if at that period a particular condition is going on let us say cool down period if the cool down period is going on till the time it does not end uh, it will not launch the number of uh, new instances so what will happen uh, let us say at that time you are you are getting a lot of load and the cool down period is not over till yet then it can impact the uh, efficacy of your particular you can say uh, architecture so that is what happened in simple scaling simple scaling will wait for the cool down period to end and what exactly is the cool down period um, basically cool down period ensures that auto scaling group does not launch or terminate any more instances until a specified period is complete so all the scaling activity will be suspended for a particular period of time so if your auto scaling group is uh, in that period you can say in the cool down period so it will either not launch or it will not uh, delete the number of instances so nothing will be done and at that time let us say if the cpu utilization is increasing then also it will not work so it can not be a uh, advantages for you it can be a disadvantage for you so but uh, that same thing we don't have in the step scaling we can simply specify okay if uh, the particular cpu utilization of mine is above 60 launch two instances if the cpu utilization of mine is uh, above 80 launch three instances so th that option you get in step scaling so basically in stepwise manner you can increase it and here you don't uh, wait for the cool down period uh, and all of those things so step scaling is far better if you compare with simple scaling now let us see uh, how exactly is an uh, instance terminated so if we will see here l let us say uh, if you have uh, launched a particular instance then it will check that uh, instance in multi az so uh, first of all let us say there is a particular uh, option has come up to uh, let us say to launch more number of instances or to delete uh, more number of instances so uh, how exactly will it delete it it will select uh, in which az most number of instances are running and in that az which of the instances is having the oldest launch configuration which of our uh, which of the machine will be having la oldest launch configuration those machines will be targeted and those uh, machines uh, will be started to delete so here we can get a better picture of the things let us say uh, at the very beginning it will check a multiple instance using the oldest launch configuration let us say there are two instances and both of my instances are the oldest so what it will do it will select any of the one randomly and it will de delete it but let us say if there are uh, five of my instances and two of my instances are having the oldest then from those two oldest it will check okay which instance is going to get built in the next star so upon that it can uh, choose and it can terminate the one which is going to get built but uh, let us say both of my instances are uh, you can say are in the same uh, phase then again it will check which is uh, you can say which is far more closer to the next billing hour and whatever uh, will be there uh, based upon that it will choose let us say both of my instances are in the uh, you can say in, in the closest next billing hour also then it will select anyone from the random and it will simply delete it so this is what uh, we uh, have uh, also been given over here and uh, this is what uh, it will basically check the oldest launch configuration and uh, the next billing hour and uh, uh, if everything uh, if both of the options are having equal number of instances then it will delete any of the one randomly. 
So now if you will uh, see into the auto scaling pricing, then there is no additional fee for that. Uh, only the number of instances that you will be launching and for the whatever hour it will be running uh, for that only you will be going to get built. How to create an auto scaling group? So for creating an auto scaling group, the very first thing that you require is an launch configuration. So we will be creating at first a launch configuration. After that, we will move in into the auto scaling group. Then we will be creating an auto scaling group. But before creating auto scaling group, we need to understand what exactly is an launch configuration. So launch configuration is an instance configuration template that our auto scaling group will use to launch our EC2 instance. So for understanding the particular thing, you need to understand what exactly uh, our auto scaling group do. Let us say if uh, there is a lot of load upon our instances, then based upon our load, auto scaling group will either scale up or scale down our EC2 instance. What does it mean? Either auto scaling group will uh, launch uh, more instances or will it decrease the number of instances. So for either uh, rolling out more instances, it need to have the information regarding the instances. What sort of information it needs? It uh, needs the detail of AMI. It needs the detail of key pair. It needs the detail of our security group, instance type. So all those things auto scaling group require. So for that, we need to specify all those information here in the launch configuration. Launch configuration will contain all of this information and when we will uh, attach this launch configuration with our auto scaling group, then it will uh, start launching uh, the new instances and based upon our situation, it will also decrease it. So uh, if we are trying to create launch configuration, then we need to specify an AMI for that. So uh, already I am having a machine running here. This machine is of Uber having Ubuntu AMI and in the security group I have allowed SSH and I have given the key pair. The instance type is t2.micro. Apart from that, I have not changed any other thing. So what I'll do, I'll select this machine. After that, I'll go into instance state. Uh, I'll move into action and from here I'll move into image and template. Here I'll create an image. I'll give it a name. Uh, LC launch configuration AMI. If you want to give the description, you can give it. Uh, let me give it configuration AMI. After that, I will simply click on create image. So now it will take some time and my AMI will be then available. This is the AMI, LC AMI that I have just created. Right now, the status is in pending state. So let me give it the name. LC AMI. And I'll save it. After that, what I'll do, I will go into launch configuration. And here I'll click on create launch configuration. After that, I have to give the name. I will give it name as launch configuration after giving it a name launch configuration and demo after that I will choose the AMI so this is the AMI that we have just created so let me select it after that I have to choose the instance type I'll click on choose instance type and here I will choose tutu.micro and why I'm choosing tutu.micro because it is available under free tier eligible criteria. So after that, uh, I'll uh, not give any IM instance profile right now. I will not do any other changes in security group. You can uh, go with whatever security group you want. And if you want to allow whatever rules, you can do those things uh, if you can simply click on add rules and from here you can choose any rules let us see if you want to grave all traffic you can choose it and after that you can either go on with 000, zero, zero uh, or you can do whatever you want so right now I don't require it but if you require you can do that and here I have to choose a key pair 
which I'll click on choose a keep here. I'll choose the keep here that we have created. After that, I will click on I acknowledge that I have the access to select this particular private key. And without that, I won't be able to log in into my instance. After that, I'll click on create launch configuration. So now my launch configuration I have created successfully. After this, what we will do, we will go back to EC2. And here we will click on auto scaling groups. And now we will be creating an auto scaling group. So here I'll click on create auto scaling group. I will uh, give it a name auto scaling group only. After that, here it will ask you to choose a launch template, but I will switch to launch configuration because we have created a launch configuration, not a launch template. So here I'll select a launch configuration. So this is the launch configuration that we have just created. So let me select it. After that, all of the things will come up, your security group, your instance type. Based upon this, your auto scaling group will roll out the number of instances that you require. After this, I'll click on next. So I'll go with default VPC only and in the availability uh, subnet. Okay, so here I will choose all the subnet that is being available to me, 1A. I will choose the default ones only, default us east 1a after that i'll choose us east 1b of default us east 1c of default because all my machines are there and uh, whatever security groups everything is of mine it lies in the default only so i will select 1d i'll select 1e after that i'll select 1f so i have given everything okay in 1b don't require it so 1a 1b 1c 1d 1e 1f after that i'll click on next so here it will ask you a uh, health checkup grace period the amount of time until ec2 auto scaling group perform the first health check on the instance so your particular auto scaling group will also do a health check upon your instance so let us uh, not give that much of time let me go with uh, 10 seconds only after that i'll click on next so right now i'll not create any scaling policy so here uh, i'll do one thing in the configure group size here i'll choose now uh, here you can choose let us see if there is a particular load upon your instance then now here you can choose that okay if the load upon my instance is more than let us say 60 percent so how many more instance should you roll out those things you can choose here minimum uh, at minimum how many instances do you require every time to be available let me go on with two and the desired that i'll choose here is let us say four and the maximum capacity or you can say the maximum instance that my auto scaling group can roll out i'm telling is six okay so from here you can choose that based upon the load upon your instance based upon your cpu utilization uh, how much do you want to specify the things so after this I will click on next and here I'll click on next after that I'll click on next once again so here the uh, summary comes up you can view everything if any changes required to be done you can do that after that you can click on create auto scaling group and now your auto scaling group is being launched so now uh, if I'll go back to dashboard and if I'll see right now only one instance is running okay ubuntu machine but after some time you will be able to see more number of instances will be running and who is rolling those instances out it is none other than your auto scaling group because we have specified some criteria okay we have basically specified that okay uh, the minimum number of instances that will be always available will be two the desired uh, is four and the maximum that it can roll out is six definitely will be not uh, able to see the six number of instances rolling out because uh, we don't uh, will be we will not be putting that much pressure upon our auto scaling groups or you can say upon our instances so we will not be able to see it but definitely we will be able to see that more number of instances will now get rolled out you can see at the beginning we are having just one instance running but right now four new instances has been uh, got rolled out you can see right now all of those are in initializing state 
and here if you will see they are from different availability zone and if you will go here and if you will see the security group name auto scaling security group and the key name that it has been rolled out is under this SUV North Virginia one demo key upon that it has been rolled out. So this signifies the fact that our auto scaling group is now running and it is rolling out new instances. Okay, so after some time those all of the instances will be available. Let us say if I delete a few instances running here, then again it will uh, roll out more number of instances. So uh, once the auto scaling group will be kept running, it will keep on launching the instances. So let us say if you want to stop uh, the rolling out of these instances, what you can do, you can simply uh, delete your auto scaling group and after that no more uh, new instances will be rolled out. So if you will uh, see uh, auto scaling group uh, what exactly it do it either uh, in, uh, adds or removes our particular resources based upon our requirement and what does load balancer do load balancer has the work of uh, distributing the traffic uh, only to those ac2 instances which are healthy now let us say uh, there is a particular architectures of ours and uh, if we have placed the uh, elastic load balancer ahead of auto scaling group so what it will do, uh, basically it will uh, ensure few things, uh, what exactly uh, will it ensure. The very first thing uh, that it will ensure is that uh, whatever uh, particular traffic will be coming into the particular elastic load balancer. Uh, so it can, uh, you can say it can inform the auto scaling that okay, if uh, more number of traffics are coming, then uh, be ready because if the number of traffics increases, then the load will also increase and if the load is increasing then auto scaling group needed to uh, roll out more number of instances. So uh, let us say if the auto scaling group is having this particular information it does not necessarily uh, will roll out but it will just have the information so auto scaling group have a prior knowledge of the things. Auto scaling group will only launch the new number of instances or it will only decrease or you can say terminate the instances once uh, the alarm will be triggered once the scaling policies will be coming into play but if elastic load balancer is informing uh, the information a uh, prior hand then auto scaling group can act uh, far more smoother and far more quickly if the particular uh, action arrives. Similarly, if uh, less traffic is there, then also elastic load balancer can inform the auto scaling group, okay, the particular traffic is less. So you need not to uh, uh, roll out more number of instances. So those things elastic load balancer can uh, tell to the auto scaling group. And let us say if there is an auto scaling group and uh, let us say if it is terminating the number of instances, then what it can uh, basically uh, inform elastic load balancer that the traffic that you are facing is also low. So if we are having uh, this two particular thing uh, in action, so what is happening, then our architecture uh, works far more smoother and uh, we can even uh, integrate uh, those things and the efficacy of our particular architecture or our website will be increased. And as elastic load balancer sends the traffic only to the healthy instances, so auto scaling group can uh, also make sure that uh, whatever instances have been rolled out whether those are healthy or not. And elastic load balancer will also look in uh, to distribute the particular targets evenly so that uh, the load is not uh, increased upon one instance and it is very less upon the another instance. Let us say if more number of traffic is coming to your website then your load balancer can alert your auto scaling group that more number of traffic is incoming so the load upon the instances will increase so after getting the alert uh, auto scaling group can get a better picture that yes i need to enroll more number of instances and si similarly if you can say auto scaling group is not under that much of load or if your instance is not under that much of a load so it will uh, start terminating the instance and then auto scaling group can let load balancer know that the particular traffic that is coming through you is also less so basically auto scaling group and load balancer will work in hand to hand and the elasticity and the performance of the architecture or you can say of the website will increase these two resources can be also used uh, you can say uh, independently there is no dependency upon it but if you will use it both it together then it can definitely uh, increase the efficacy of our website so uh, let us see how to do the thing so i am just having a particular instance running this is um, a machine ec2 machine of ubuntu ami 
so in its security group i have allowed all traffic so let us go and let us connect it so i'll simply go into connect and here i'll connect it so i'll uh, first of all i'll update it i will update it so after updating it i will uh, run a default apache web page in this machine yeah. so after this i will install the default apache web page so now what will happen is that the default apache web page will now get installed here and now this is done so now uh, let's go back to our ec2 management console okay and here so what we will be doing we will have to create our load balancer and we have to create an auto scaling group so let us first create an auto scaling group for creating an auto scaling group uh, we require a launch configuration in launch configuration what we have to give we have to give the instance details like the ami key pair instance type so let us create an ami for that so i have chosen the same machine i'll click on create image and let me create a image for it so launch configuration ami after that if you want to give the description you can give it uh, ami for auto scaling auto scaling so after this uh, if you want to give any other options you can give it but for me it's fine no need to give anything after that i'll click on create image so now the image uh, image has been created you can see creating currently creating the ami from the instance id so if i'll go to here you can see the lc ami is available so let me give it a name ami for launch config after that i'll save it and now uh, let us go into our launch configuration and here uh, let me create a launch configuration so here i'll give it a name launch configuration after giving it i have to choose the ami and here lcmi that we have just created i will select it i have to choose the instance type so let me choose the instance type that is going to be t2 dot micro so i'll select it after that i'll click on choose and here uh, if you want to give any other options you can choose it but i don't need to you can select uh, an existing security group if you want or if you want you can do the changes if you want to happen let me select all traffic anywhere ipv4 you can see either custom ip or anywhere ipv4 i am happy with any ipv4 after that i have to choose a key pair let me select from an existing key pair and after that i have to acknowledge it and i'll click on launch configuration and now the launch configuration is available so what i'll do now i'll go back and now i will uh, create auto scaling group so here i'll click on create auto scaling group let me give it a name as auto scaling only after giving it uh, we have created a launch configuration so we'll click on switch to launch configuration and we will select the launch configuration after that i'll click on next so here i have to choose the availability zone i will choose the default availability zones one a after that uh, one b one c of default one d of default one f of default and and one e of default one a one b one c one d one f one a after that i'll click on next so here uh, it will ask you uh, to attach a load balancer right now i will uh, not do it so let me do one thing let me give the grace period as 10 seconds only so after this i'll click on next i don't want to give any policy i will simply now click on next next i uh, if you want to do any uh, review of it if you want to go through it you can go through and after that you can click on create auto scaling group so now my auto scaling group is also ready here i have not changes or i have not given any 
other particular specification for my machines because in this demo we are looking into how to integrate the two services to be more specific two resources so we'll look in that so i will now be creating a target group so let me create a target group and here i will give it a name as target group i will not do any changes here simply i'll go down i'll click on next and here i am having this ubuntu machine so i'll just register this and this particular machine has been now uh, uh, got enrolled by the auto scaling so i'll not do any changes just i will simply select it i'll click on include as pending below after that i'll click on create target so now the target group is available so now let me go down and now let me go to load balancer so here i'll click on create load balancer i will be creating an application load balancer so let me choose the application load balancer you can give a name let me give it a name as application load balancer only application load balancer so after that uh, i will do the mapping to all availability zones i will select one by one to every availability zone and one f okay you can select the security group that you want to have you can keep the particular security group that is with your machine also so if i'll go back to here and if i'll go back to my instance and if i will check what is the security group it is being attached with i'll go back to my security and here you can see launch wizard 22 you can associate this so let me select launch wizard 22 out of that i have to select the target group i'll be selecting the target group and after selecting the target group i will click on create load balancer so now the load balancer is ready so now let us go and let us see how we can integrate this two resources so if we will uh, go to auto scaling group here So here our auto scaling group will be available. Yeah. So this is our auto scaling group that we have created. So let us select our auto scaling group. After that, go to edit. After moving into edit, if you want to change these things, that also you can choose. If I make it as desired as two, maximum as five, you can do that. But the main thing that we are here to do is to select the load balancer. So here uh, we can choose the load balancer. So I'll go with application load balancer because we have created an application load balancer. After that, I have to select the target group. So this is our target group. Target group. I'll select it. After that, what I'll do? I'll simply go down. Don't need to do any other things. Just click on update, and we have successfully uh, created, or you can say we have successfully attached our load balancer with auto scaling group. So this is what we wanted to achieve. in this particular demo and we have done it and now we shall wait uh, once our load balancer will be uh, available then i'll take the dns name i'll paste it in the web browser then we'll be able to see the default uh, apache page that we have installed then we'll be look forward to it then we shall wait now once it will be active we'll be taking the dns name we'll pasting it in the web browser and then we will be looking in it so right now i think the status is yeah so it is also the changes has been now reflected back we can see everything that we have did we have can see the load balancer target group that we have given if you want to edit it you can edit it the health check uh, grace period that we have given you can check each and everything that we have given here so now we shall wait okay i waited for few more seconds and right now it is available so let me take the dns name here after taking the dns name uh, let me open another so so here if i'll move in here and here if i'll paste it that particular dns name we should be able to see the default web page so with this we are done uh, with the integration of load balancer and auto scaling group so uh, what exactly is in route 53 so route 53 is the aws uh, provided uh, service which uh, is there to manage the domain name system let us say if you are having a domain uh, let us say www.aws.com uh, so let us say if you are having this domain so if any particular people is typing this particular domain name then they should be redirected to your website or to the instances that is being running 
So how you can do that? That thing you can do if you are having this route 53. And why is the name uh, route 53 being given? L let us say if uh, we are having SSH protocol. So then uh, the port uh, assigned to SSH is uh, 22. Similarly, HTTP, uh, the port assigned is 80. Similarly, for the DNS, uh, the particular port that is being assigned uh, is 53. That's why the name uh, Route 53 is, has come up. So Route 53 is uh, also highly available and uh, scalable domain name system which has been powered by the AWS. So now if we will uh, look into uh, what exactly uh, does it do. Uh, let us say if we are having a particular thing like www.amazon.com. Now what does uh, .com stands for? So you can think uh, .com being like a top level. So you can uh, think that .com is the top level domain name. So uh, basically that is the name that is being given. Now what exactly is Amazon? Amazon is the domain name that is being uh, provided. Now what exactly domain name system do? Uh, let us say if a particular uh, IP is there with you. Let us say for google.com the IP that we are having is 121.121.0.0 uh, 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 slash 16. So if we are having this IP uh, name, so IP number, then remembering all of this IP number, just think like uh, thousands of websites are there. And if I want to access uh, someday Google, I want to access someday Twitter, I want to access someday YouTube, I want to access. If I want to access all of those things, remembering the IP is not an easy option for me. But yes, I can remember the name. I can remember Google.com. I can remember YouTube.com, Twitter.com, similarly Facebook.com. So what basically domain name system do, basically it maps the particular domain name to the IP because IP is what? IP is the address. If you want to use a particular uh, uh, service or you can say a particular website, then you first need to reach there. How to reach it? Uh, through the address. And what is that address? It is nothing but the IP address for computing uh, purpose related task for our computers. Uh, if you want to access the computer, how you can do it? You can do it using the IP addresses. So that is what our domain name system do. Basically, it maps a domain name to the IP address. Now, if we will uh, see, then there are few things like root server. What exactly root server do? Root server will basically have the information about the top level domain. It will have the information uh, what is the logs that have been produced or who uh, is using what sort of uh, top level domain. So all of those information will be there in our root server. And what does a top level domain do? It keeps the information about the authoritative name servers. Now, uh, what uh, our name servers contain, it contain the information about the IP address for our individual domain. Or you can uh, even remember name servers are nothing but they act like an availability zone. If one availability goes down, then we are having other availability zone. Similarly, if one name server goes down, uh, then we can have n number of name servers. So for one particular domain name, we can have five to six name servers and they will be acting like the availability zone. If one goes down, other will be there. To basically manage the things. So now uh, here it is a pictorial uh, representation of how the things are being there. Let us say if you are having a particular root server, so what it will have? It will have the information about the top level domain. In the top level domain, we are having .com, .edu, .org, .gov. All of those things are a uh, top level domain. And under the top level domain, we get uh, the actual domain like uh, you can say uh, intellipat.edu. Uh, or intellipad.com or uh, Indian government dot uh, Indian uh, government dot gov. So all of those things have been uh, there if you choose the domain. So now how exactly uh, you can host a website? First of all, you need to have a particular uh, domain name available to you. So you can either go for to free norm and you can get a free domain name or you can either go to other paid uh, providers of the domain name like godaddy or hostinger.com you can basically get the domain name and uh, after that you can come to route 53 link it uh, with the uh, route 53 you can basically provide the name servers and then you can start using your website now if i will uh, look into the dns uh, literature uh, then we are having this authoritative name server so what basically uh, does it have it has the uh, particular components like a name c name and alias now, what exactly is an uh, A name? If we will uh, look into it, uh, basically it maps the domain name to the IP address of backend. 
okay so let us say if you are having a particular address uh, you can uh, say 101.202.30.40 uh, then i let us say if i am typing this address then where should i be directed i should be getting that particular domain so who does this mapping sort of thing this mapping has been done by the a record now uh, if we will uh, move forward then here we can see the uh, c name uh, what exactly it do basically it maps one name to another a uh, name instead of the ip let us say uh, earlier uh, there was facebook.com but now it has been changed to meta.com but whenever if you will go and if you will type uh, facebook.com then you will be redirected to the meta so how they are being able to do it they are being able to do it using the c name because uh, there are many people uh, right out in the world who does not know that facebook has changed its name so basically the Less, not to lose the user because uh, not every user is accustomed with whatever the organization is doing let us say if there is a particular website which was uh, hosted in 1980s and now after uh, 40 or 42 years the name has been changed those people will not be aware of it so we need to also take care of that so that our particular um, uh, you can say user base don't go away from it so what we can do uh, we can basically map one the old uh, particular domain name to the new domain name and then we can map that new domain name to the ip using the a record now then comes the alias name uh, what exactly does it do it is also similar to cname but with a little difference what is the difference let us say if there is a particular uh, you can say a domain name like apple.com but you don't uh, want that apple.com to be visible to the world so you, what you can do you can give a alias name to it instead of apple.com you can uh, give uh, anything like uh, vegetable.com and whosoever will be typing those vegetable.com it will be redirected to the apple.com so that is what we are having in dns literature so now uh, let us understand about what exactly is an, a network latency and a network bandwidth now uh, when we will uh, say about the uh, network latency what do we uh, basically mean basically uh, we mean the delay that is being uh, occurring so uh, let us see if there is a particular data uh, in the youtube and you are trying to access it then the amount of time it it takes to load uh, then uh, you can say it is the network latency you let because uh, if you are using the particular data or if you are trying to access a particular data which is present over youtube how exactly are you able to access it first of all when you are clicking on a particular video then what is happening uh, that particular data is being retrieved from the server and then uh, it comes into your uh, particular location and once it comes to the local servers then it is being delivered to you so whatever time has been taken uh, from uh, your particular clicking on that to uh, coming that particular data from the servers to your local server and then from the local server to the particular your phone or to other gadgets that you are using so whatever time it takes in between is network latency now what exactly uh, is the uh, bandwidth now bandwidth you, you can say is the capacity of uh, your particular data so either you can say bandwidth as your capacity or you can say uh, it is the you can say the measurement of amount of information that a particular uh, computer network or the internet connection that can send in a particular time so let us say uh, your particular uh, network can send uh, 100 mbps per second so that is what it is going to be the bandwidth for your particular uh, network how to use route 53 so route 53 is a globally managed dns basically domain name system we know that dns uh, is basically used so that uh, the client can be redirected to the particular servers through the url so dns uh, contains uh, rules and records so that it can properly direct the client to whatever website they want to reach dns actually operates on uh, port number 53 just like ssh operates on 22 and http operate on 80 similar to that dns operate on port 53 that's why uh, amazon come up with this name uh, route 53 so uh, before uh, doing the things we what we will be doing is that we will be creating a hosted zone we will be getting a domain name and then uh, we will do all of those things but before doing that what we need to have we need to have an instance so i have already created an ubuntu instance so let me connect it and here i'll click on connect and after connecting it what i'll do i will uh, run default uh, web page in it okay, so uh, let me update my machine first so after updating it what i'll do i will install default web page in it 
So why I'm installing default web page? It is because I will be then uh, creating a target group. I'll be registering this instance in my target group. And through that target group, I'll be creating a load balancer. And that load balancer DNS, uh, I'll be actually associating it with my route 53 and after associating my load balancer with route 53 i will take that domain name and i'll paste it uh, in the web browser then i'll be able to see the particular uh, uh, default web page that is running here so let me install uh, apache 2 apache 2 i'll hit enter and now uh, my apache 2 will get installed now let me go back let me go straight away to the target group let me create a target group so here I will create a target group. So let me create a target group. I'll not do any other changes because my machine is at default VPC only. So I'll go here. This is the particular machine that is running. I will select it. I'll click on include as pending below. After that, I'll create a target group. So after creating a target group, I'll create a load balancer. I'll basically create an application load balancer. I'll click on create load balancer. I will create an application load balancer. So here I'll uh, give the name Appi application load balancer. Application load balancer. I'll give it a name. After that, I will map it to every availability zone that is being available. And after that, I will choose the security group. I'll go back to my instance. I will check what is the security group that is being attached with my machine so i'll go into security i'll launch wizard 23 is being attached so i will give launch wizard 23 okay so here it is i'll select it after that i'll choose the target group that i just created i'll select the target group after creating that i will click on create load balance so now uh, my load balancer will be created so in the meantime Let's go to Freenom. So you can uh, try creating an account in Freenom because if you are having an account in Freenom, then you can get a free domain from the Freenom. But uh, getting an account and getting a an, uh, free domain from Freenom is not that easy. If you want to uh, get a domain name, then either you can go for some paid uh, domain name providers like uh, you can go to Hostinger or you can go to GoDaddy and there you can get the name. Let us say if you have created a Freenom account, how to get it you can go to services and you can click on register a new domain and here you can uh, type a particular domain uh, if i am typing here let us say and if i am searching here the availability so it, if it will be available then i should get it yeah, so it is available so what you have to do you have to click on this checkout you can see that basically this is free of cost you can basically check this you can click on checkout after that you can from here you can choose the period that is of two 12 months free after this you can click on continue and if you click on this continue then you have to give the permission and you have to click on complete order once you do that then you will be getting this particular domain but I will be not doing it because I already have a domain. So once you get this domain, you have to come to my domains. And once you come to my domain, uh, like this, a particular domain will be visible to you. So I already have this domain, shub.tk. So I'll be using this particular domain name for the purpose. Okay. So after this, let me go back to here. So, okay. So my load balancer is still in provisioning state. So in the meantime, let me go to here, go to route 53 and here, what do we have to do? We have to create the hosted zone. Okay. But before creating hosted zone, we need to understand few things. Uh, let us first create it and then we will look in. So I have to give the particular uh, domain name. So I will go back to here. I will take this DNS uh, domain name. Let me click on manage domain. So this domain name, you have to copy it. Once you copy it, you have to come back to here, paste it here. After that, if you want to give any description, you can give it. And the type that I will choose here is publicly hosted so that it is available to me from all over the internet. And after that, I'll click on create hosted zone. So once you click on create hosted zone, 
then what you will be getting you will be getting the name servers and start of authority record so now let us understand what is this start of authority record basically it stores the information about your name servers about the uh, from particular servers from where your data is coming the soa will contain that information and what is your name server name server is basically your top level domain server that direct the traffic to the content dns okay so that is the work of your name server or you can also think like name servers are like availability zones uh, we will be looking in that uh, how to use this basically name servers that we have been given so what is the significance of this name server you can have this name server you can take it and you can paste it in your particular uh, route uh, in your domain name and then it will start redirecting the thing but before doing that what we have to do we have to create a record so now think the thing comes that what is a record so if we will go into creating a record here the record that we will be creating will be a record so what is the uh, particular use of this a record a record basically stands for address record and this address record is used by the computer to translate the name of a domain to an ip address so that is what the use of your particular a record so let us say if you uh, directly want to connect your particular domain name with your instance then how you can do that you can just come to here and all you have to do is to paste the public ip of your machine so if i will go here this is my machine that is being running let us say ubuntu if you want to connect it how you can do it using route 53 you just have to take the public ip address you have to copy it and after copying it you can take it and here you can paste it and you can do the things okay but in this uh, particular demo we will be not doing it what we will be doing we will be trying to uh, connect our out 53 with our application load balance so here you have to first of all you have to select this alias option after that you have to click on route traffic to so where we will be routing our traffic we will be routing our traffic to application load balancer we have to select that after that we have to choose the region basically route 53 is a global service so we have to choose the particular region where our load balancer is available so mine is available in north virginia so i'll select it after that i have to choose the load balancer so this is the uh, load balancer that is being available so let me show you if i'll go back here and if i will refresh it you can see this is the application load balancer application load balancer having this thing and if i go back here so this is the one application load balancer 140 uslb the same is also visible 140 elb all is also visible here so i will select it after uh, selecting it what i have to do i have to click on create record now the record is being created once the record is being created what we have to do we have to copy this name servers one by one we have to copy this name servers one by one and here we have to go back to our domain we have to click on management tool and here we have to go into name servers after moving into name servers we have to click on change name server once we click on uh, change name server okay so it didn't came up uh, let me click on again okay so here let me go for the custom name servers after that we have to paste the name server one by one i will select it i'll come back here i will paste all the name servers that is being given to me i'll come back to here after this i'll click on change name servers okay so the you can see the changes have successfully saved so now if i'll take the particular name server and if i'll paste it here then i should be able to see the default apache 2 web page that i have installed in my machine so that thing we can see so this is how our route 53 works routing policies 
So the very first routing policy that we'll be discussing is simple routing policy. So what exactly happens in here? So we'll be having a single uh, server performing all of the desired uh, operations that needed to be done. But if you are using a simple uh, routing, then there are a lot of disadvantages that you can face. You uh, cannot basically choose the uh, options like uh, the weighted routing or you cannot go for the latency uh, based routing. You cannot uh, do if you are uh, using the simple routing policy. Apart from that, if you are using the uh, simple uh, routing policy, then you also get, get a particular uh, uh, thing that uh, if your particular single server goes down, then uh, it will be very tough for managing the things uh, apart. So now if we will look into the uh, other routing policy, that is the failover routing policy, what exactly happened here? So there will be, uh, you can say, two servers working simultaneously and whichever servers will be healthy, to them only the uh, routing will be done. Let us say if my first server is healthy, then to that only it will be uh, routed. And if my second server, uh, now if my first server is not healthy and now my second server is healthy, so it will be basically uh, sending the particular uh, routing to that only. So you can say it is a sort of a active and passive routing that is being done here. Now if you will uh, work, uh, look into the uh, routing policy that is of weighted type, so what exactly do here? Let us say if there are uh, two of my machines, so I can basically uh, signify that okay to whom majority or you can say to whom the uh, particular traffic should be uh, routed. Let us say if three traffics are coming, I can basically route two of my traffic to the first uh, instances and the last one I can route it to the uh, other one. So you can basically give a weight, okay, if 10 requests is coming, uh, six should go to my first uh, instance and the other four should go to my uh, last instance. So that is what you can do. You can basically put a weight upon the things. We have also uh, seen this particular thing while doing the uh, load balancer. So now if I will uh, look into the another routing policy that is depending upon the latency based. Let us say uh, if there is a particular user trying to access a particular website from Singapore. So uh, now it sends a particular request to uh, access the particular website. Now uh, let us say there are two servers running. Uh, one is running in Mumbai and one is running in North Virginia. Then the latency will be calculated from which particular server if we are sending the data will take uh, you can say more time. Let us say if the particular data is taking a lot of time from the Mumbai and uh, if then we will check uh, okay what is the other closest particular server that has been available who can send the data so then if we come up to the north virginia and see that okay it can provide faster accessibility of the data to the user then we will be choosing that option so that is what we do in our routing policies we will check where we are getting the less latency and upon that only we are going to work so now if we will uh, look into uh, particular routing policy and our last uh, routing policy that is geolocation uh, routing policy. So what exactly happens here, uh, we can basically put, uh, uh, you can say put a case that okay, if any of the particular, uh, from a particular location, if the particular request are coming, then to whom it should be directed. Let us say if the particular request uh, is coming from the India, then it uh, should be only going uh, to the particular IP address. We can specify if any of the data is trying to uh, access any data in India, then all of those requests should either go to the uh, Delhi, uh, you can say Delhi region or it can go to the Mumbai region. So that thing we can specify in geolocation. So basically we can bind a particular user to the uh, servers that we only want. Let's have a quick quiz question guys. And the question is, what is auto scaling in the context of cloud computing? Your options are a feature that automatically resizes your computer monitor display, a process for automatically adjusting the font size in an application, a cloud computing service that automatically adjusts the number of compute resources based on traffic and demand, or an automated tool for optimizing website content. Please mention your answers in the comment section. Just a quick info guys, IntelliPath offers an AWS certification course for solutions architect certified by NASCOM and it aligns with industry standards. Through this course, you can learn all the important concepts of AWS and upon completion of the course, you will receive a NESCOM certification. With this course, we have already helped thousands of professionals in successful career transition. You can check out the testimonials on our Achievers channel, whose link is given in the description below. Without a doubt, this course can set your career to new heights. So visit the course page link given below in the description and take a first step towards career growth in the field of AWS. 
uh, how an application can be deployed on an architecture or cloud like AWS. So we will not be getting into coding today. We what we will be discussing is if we have an application at hand and if we have defined some features that we want how to enable those features using a cloud infrastructure like AWS. So that is something that uh, you know we would be going ahead with today. Okay, all right guys, so let's get started now. So first thing first, let's discuss what we are going to do today. So we are basically going to discuss the website architecture on cloud, uh, you know, which uh, probably Netflix will have when they have, you know, deployed their application. So let's get started. So let me just share my screen with you guys. Okay. So, uh, guys, what we will be doing today is something, uh, you know, on the lines of this. So, what we are going to configure is we are going to have a URL, you know, a URL like this, which every one of you will be able to go to, and you will be able to see the website that we will be deploying on the cloud. Okay. So, for example, uh, you know, let's take the example of Netflix.com. You would see when you go to Netflix.com, you're automatically routed to the Netflix website, right? You do not know where that server is hosted. You do not know, uh, you know, about the nitty gritties of uh, how it is working. But you, all you know as a user is, if I go to a particular URL, I can see the website on the browser. So similarly, uh, we are also going to do, uh, you know, the same thing today. I told you the output, but I'm going to tell you what goes behind, you know, making uh, an architecture like that possible. What goes behind you going to a URL and then able being able to access a server is something that we are going to discuss today. Okay. Now, if you talk about, uh, you know, the cloud architecture at a very high level overview, this is what, uh, you know, what we are going to accomplish today. So uh, from the security point of view, all our web servers, all our databases that we are going to deploy today are going to exist in a network which cannot be accessed, uh, you know, by internet. So this network, this this particular rectangle that you see over here, it will not be able to access by the internet. That is, you and me from our computer, we will not be able to access these servers. Okay. Uh, then we are going to create a network which will be accessible by the internet, right? And that is where we go, are going to have a component like load balancer, right? What does a load balancer do and everything? I'm going to explain you in a while, right? But this is the network architecture that we are going to deploy today. So we are going to have a part of a network which will not be accessed by the internet. We are going to have a part of the network which will be accessed by the internet. And then we are also going to have, you know, a component which is going to be a URL with which we will be able to access our servers. Okay. Now, there is a very important thing to understand over here. And that thing to under, uh, understand is, uh, you know, how basically, uh, you know, uh, why, why security is important when you are dealing with applications which exist on the internet, right? For example, uh, you can have all the security in the world for your application. It could be password encrypted, right? It, it could have, uh, you know, a key, a key pair which can be, uh, you know, attached to it. But some way or the other, there's always a hack to, uh, you know, uh, access some machines, right? So, how we as cloud architects, how we as application architects can ensure that something like hacking, something like phishing, something like, uh, you know, somebody else taking over your application does not happen when you are dealing with the application which is, uh, you know, available to the whole wide world, right? People like you and me, probably we will not be able to understand, uh, you know, when something is password encrypted, like for example, your laptop, if it's password encrypted, people like you and me cannot go ahead and, uh, you know, get inside your system. But there are security researchers which, uh, you know, exist out there. There are people who are technically so sound that they can actually hack into your system, even if 
you have a password uh, you know attached to it now when you think about it as an architecture's uh, you know as an architect's mind the first thing that you might want to solve is not giving access to your system to anybody on the internet okay now what does that mean so let's say uh, if somebody is able to crack the password of a server what if i don't give the access of the server to that person itself in the first place so in that case he will not have access to the server itself and he will not, not be able to crack the password also okay uh, now how do you stop someone from accessing a particular computer or a server right what if you cut the internet uh, uh, you know uh, internet connection to your computer if someone is trying to hack your computer and that person does not have uh, you know physical access to your computer all right how will he hack it if you cut the internet connection off of your server how will someone go ahead and hack it so that is my point over here so to solve that uh, or to or to basically be relevant to what i just said what we are going to do is all our applications all the websites servers that we are going to have all the databases that we are going to have we are basically going to deploy it in a network which is not going to have internet access okay so now, now the next question that you might ask is then how will we access uh, a network which does not have internet access from outside right for example if you go to netflix.com you are able to see that website right why website because you have or that website or the server which is having that website has internet access correct okay? so how will we ensure that we do not have access to a service but at the same time if somebody wants content from us also able to deliver that on the internet is something that we are going to solve using this cloud architecture okay so uh, we are going to have a component which is going to be called as an aws elastic load balancer okay which is going to be in a network which can be accessed from the internet and then we are going to have a url which is going to point to this load balancer which we are going to have uh, you know deployed in a network which can be accessed by the internet okay now you might have multiple questions right now so uh, before we move on to the next slide i would like to address those questions but if it is about how will we do it i will be telling you in a while but if anything is not clear with respect to what i've just told you please let me know and i'll be answering all your queries any questions Any questions, guys? So, as I is saying, so we have to get to both network and also to the server. So, no, as what I meant was that our website is going to exist on these orange icons that you see. These are nothing but servers that we are going to deploy today. All right and these servers will be deployed in a network which is not going to have internet access okay i will show you how that is possible using cloud but these will be basically part of a network which will not have internet access so that people from the outside are not able to access them all right and uh, at the same time when we go to this url we would want to access these servers and this url will obviously be on the internet right so it might sound a little confusing because uh, you know you guys do not have background on cloud right now but it will be more clear as we move along okay so everyone has an idea about what we have to accomplish today So Devishi is saying customers use website by NAT gateway. No, Devishi, that is uh, wrong conceptually. What you are saying, uh, in order to use a server which is a second rectangle, 
Asan is saying. Yes, so the second rectangle is basically going to be a network which will not have internet access. So Ganesh is saying difference between cloud and server. So Ganesh, uh, cloud is nothing but the company which has infrastructure on it, which has their own infrastructure, right? When I say infrastructure, they have millions of servers uh, on their side. Now what you can do is on cloud, you can deploy a server, right? So on cloud, when I say, so let's say AWS has millions of servers with them. Now you tell AWS that I want one server. So that server, you are basically uh, using it on AWS cloud, right? So cloud is nothing but the company who owns millions of servers, right? And you as a customer, what you do is you go to their website and you request for one or two or hundred servers out of those million servers to use. Okay, so that should be the difference between cloud and server. Uh, so Venkata Raghunathan has a question, how safe are our projects in AWS? So it depends on Venkat how well you deploy your architecture. If you have a sound knowledge of what you're doing, then I don't think it should be a problem of uh, how safe your projects are on AWS. Uh, Vignesh is saying, in general, how many VMs are required on real-time scenario to host a service or website like Netflix? Well, uh, it doesn't depend on the number, uh, Vignesh. For example, let's say you have a 16 GB machine, let's assume, and I have an 8 GB machine, uh, and I'm talking about RAM. So the kind of applications or the kind of uh, concurrent applications that you can run on your machines is obviously more than what I can run on your machine since you have a 16 GB machine, right? So how many VMs are required? It all depends on what is the kind of configuration that they are running on each servers of theirs, okay? And it also depends on the kind of traffic, you know, which is coming on to their servers. So let's say uh, their application that they run for each customer their application needs around 16 to 20 mb of ram so in that case you can do the maths that let's say if they have an 8 gb machine right and they have uh, let's say around 100000 users concurrent at every time who are watching the netflix platform what is the kind of what are the kind of servers that they would need okay uh, Hari Krishna is saying if there's no network connection, then how we are going to access them? Exactly, Hari Krishna, you are bang on. So there is a way to do that, and I will be explaining it to you how you can do it. Uh, Nagaraju is saying not accessible server we are keeping in DMZ cloud or on prem. So Nagaraju, everything is going to be on cloud. Nothing is going to be on our system or on premise. Right, so that is something that we are going to go ahead with today. Uh, so Amit is saying, when you say not accessible by network, it can still be accessed by LAN. Yes, Amit, it can be accessed within the network, but it will not be able to access from outside the network. That is something that we are going to discuss. Uh, so Ayush is saying, can I use this link from any device? Uh, which link are you? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Uh, Ashish is saying, do you mean all the servers in the second are in DMZ or inside firewalls? Uh, so uh, Ashish, everything is going to be on the cloud, right? Uh, everything is going to be inside firewalls. So everything that you deploy on cloud has a firewall attached to it, right? Uh, but we are not going to control it via firewalls. We are basically going to convert it via, uh, you know, networks. So we're going to understand that how. So Ganesh is saying if they don't have internet connection, how they're going to work. So Ganesh, I'm going to show you in a little while. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Vijay is saying server down means, Vijay server down basically means that uh, your know, server is not working. That means that is what server down means. Uh, so Raju is saying thanks for the introduction. Can we start the lesson? It's 8 p.m. already. So Raju, as soon as the questions stop coming, I will be going to start the class. But it's important to clear everyone's doubt, right? I cannot just go ahead. Uh, 
Devishish is saying which databases big companies like Netflix use. So Devishish, uh, let's hold on to these kind of questions. If there is anything that you want to understand from what I've just told you, please go ahead and ask. If not, we can just take these questions at the end of the session as well. Okay, so Anaga is saying if you want to access these servers from second rectangle, uh, then how can we access? So Anaga will be telling you that in a minute. Uh, Ujwal is saying how can you auto scale? I'll be showing you Ujwal that also in this session. Uh, uh, Ujwal is saying auto scale on CPU metrics or how we can use business or other metrics. So Ujwal, it usually is the CPU metrics, but let's hold that question because not everybody will be able to connect to what you're saying. Okay, guys, so if there are no more questions, uh, let's go ahead and start. So what I'll be doing is, first of all, uh, let me go ahead and show you how a network like this is possible, where you do not have internet connection in one part of the network, and you have internet connection in the other part of the network. Okay, so first of all, guys, uh, for, for guys, for people who are completely new to cloud, let me give you, uh, you know, a brief intro of to what you have to do. So first of all, you have to go to a website called aws.amazon.com, okay? Now, what is this website? This website is basically a cloud provider, okay? This this AWS is a company which gives you, uh, gives you these service of cloud, okay? Now, what is cloud? Cloud is nothing but it's, it's a company which rents out, uh, uh, you know, uh, systems. For example, right now, you are watching this session probably on a laptop or a desktop or a mobile okay so let's assume you're watching it on a laptop or desktop now that desktop or that laptop is owned by you right so now let's say tomorrow you want to uh, you know launch a website now your system configuration has around 16 gb of ram let's assume and you have around uh, i5 or i7 cpu so the kind of website that you're launching will be used by a lot of people obviously now when people use that website obviously since it's hosted on your laptop your laptop cpu percentage will go up because your laptop now has to process a lot of requests and soon your laptop will completely be used it will have 100 percent cpu usage it will have 100 percent ram usage right and then you will have to buy another laptop so that you can uh, you know distribute the traffic which is coming onto your laptops for hosting your website okay but if you have to buy another laptop that basically means you will have to invest around 60 to 70 thousand rupees again right and then only you can divide the traffic uh, you know among the two laptops that you will own now the problem over here is let's say money is not a problem for you problem over here is that it will take a day or a two for your laptop to come second of all you will have to manage everything that you will have to have a 24 7 internet connection working at wherever you're working from right you will have to have 24 7 electricity so that you know your laptop is always charged it's always working your internet is also working if an internet uh, if electricity is required to the modem right so all these things you will have to ensure and while you're managing all these things you are actually not able to work on your application itself right so that is exactly why you know a cloud provider was introduced or you know a cloud provider as a business was introduced now what a cloud provider does is it says that if you don't have money to buy a server or if you don't have money to buy a system what you can do is I have millions of systems with me. You can ask me for the configuration that you want and I will give it to you. You don't have to buy it from me. You just have to pay me the rent for using it, right? And that is what, you know, the cloud platforms are. So cloud platforms, they basically gives us, they give us systems to, uh, you know, rent from, right? And you can rent them on a per hour basis, right? And the per hour basis, price is as low as uh, you know three or four rupees per hour okay so that is how cheap servers are for you when you take it from cloud 
apart from that cloud also gives you the guarantee of having 24 by 7 uptime which basically means they will take care of their electricity needs they will take care of your internet needs they will take care of uh, you know ensuring that the hardware is not getting any kind of fault for example let's say your laptop which from which you are hosting the website right tomorrow some short circuit happens in your laptop and suddenly you know your website is now down so these kind of problems will not come if you are using cloud servers because they guarantee that they will ensure that their hardware is up and running 24 7. so that is why companies use cloud that is why companies are using uh, cloud platforms for deploying their applications why because they do not want the headache of buying hardware maintaining it ensuring the infrastructure around it right so that is what cloud is now having said that what we are going to do today is again we are not going to use my laptop to uh, host a website i'm going to use a rented server from aws where i'm going to deploy my website and we are going to deploy an architecture like this using the cloud resources using resources which will be given to us on rent nothing is going to be owned by us okay now you would have a question over here all right so if you are saying that they will charge me on a per hour basis so if i want to practice this on my system will i be charged if i want to go to aws and i want to deploy uh, you know let's say some servers will i be charged so not at all so whatever we will be doing today is not going to cost you at all so aws as a cloud platform it gives you a very uh, good deal for all its new customers what it says is when you first sign up on aws you get access to a free usage that aws grants you so aws says if you are launching a server which has one gb ram and one core of cpu then i'm not going to charge you for it you can launch it for free right and we are today going to try and be under that free tier and deploy our application so that everyone who is there in this session can plan it uh, can can actually run their uh, application can try it out whatever you are trying in this session and understand how cloud usually work without even getting charged for a single rupee okay uh, so this is an introduction to what cloud is guys so any questions that you have with respect to what is cloud you can ask me right now if not let's go ahead and then i'll show you how you can use cloud to deploy servers any questions all right if there are no questions let's move ahead so first of all you'll have to sign up on aws i'm gonna skip that step uh, i'm pretty sure everyone knows how to sign up uh, or create an account on a website do that and when you do that you can then sign up uh, or you can just sign into your aws management console okay so let me just quickly log in and when you have signed up on the cloud this is how you know your dashboard is going to look like this is how your dashboard is going to look like these are all the different kind of services that aws offers and we are going to make use of some today to do what we have to do all right great so now that we are on this management console the next thing that i'm going to do is i'm going to choose a service so when you want to deploy any kind of server if you want a machine from aws uh, the kind of service that you have to make use of is called elastic cloud compute right so the short form of this is ec2 so you will have to make use of a service called ec2 so ec2 you can choose you can go to all services under compute you will find the ec2 service just click over there and this is the management console that you will get okay now my job is to deploy a server i will do that but first i need the network that we were talking about uh, you know since the past 15 20 minutes we need the network ready first where we will be deploying our servers okay so the ec2 service is for deploying your servers now for get, getting your network 
uh, or deploying a network on cloud, uh, there's again a service, and that service is called VPC, which is called Virtual Private Cloud. So we are going to type in VPC, and you will get isolated cloud resources kind of a service over here. Just click over it. And here you can deploy the kind of network that you want. Okay. So now let me, you know, brief you about what we are going to do. So first of all, uh, whenever you talk about networks, guys, networks, uh, the word network is a very, can be a very big architecture. But networks have subparts to it as well, which are basically called subnets. So if I have a, let's say your office network, uh, so you guys must be working in offices. You might be in colleges. So your office will have one network. Then in that one network, you will have, let's say, a network for the HR department. You will have a network separate for the developer uh, department. Then you will have a separate network for, let's say, you know, your, your leadership team. So everyone will have different access to the different part of the network, and every network will have its own access. Okay. So first of all, let's deploy the big network. Let's deploy a network for our whole application, right? And our whole application, I'm not restricting it to say that this, this whole network will have internet access or not. This is the, the overall network that we are deploying right now. And inside this network, then we are going to create subparts where we are going to, you know, uh, 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 de define the functions that each subpart can have. For example, some parts will have internet access, some parts will not have internet access. So that is something that we are going to do now. Okay. So first, let's go ahead and create a network. Uh, for example, let's create a network for your office. So let's call this network as Netflix. Okay. This is where all my resources are going to be. So I am going to name it as Netflix, and let me give you know an address. Uh, so every thing that you deploy on a network has you know an ip address for example right now if you're accessing the internet you your computer has an ip address why because you are connected to a network which is called internet similarly if you are connected to your office network you also need to have a separate ip address which will make you recognize on that network okay so now what we're going to specify in this ipv4 cidr block is the range of ip addresses that i'm going to have that is let's say if you your computer connects to my network what is the kind of ip address will it will be assigned to you so let's say i i uh, specify over here that anyone who's trying to connect to this network will have an ip address which will look something like uh, let's say this so this is the range that i'm specifying over here uh, so here in this range, so your IP address will always begin with 10.1 and then this number will change according to, you know, what your uh, network uh, configuration is. So this is the range that I'm specifying over here and this range is where my application is going to be deployed. In. Okay, so let's click on create and what you have now done is you have created an office network or you've created a network for your uh, application okay now inside this network i'm going to create subparts okay because some resources i want to give internet access and some resources i do not want to give internet access so let's see how we can go ahead and specify that okay so i have created a network called netflix now inside this network let's create some subparts so for creating the subparts to a network what you do is you create subnets Okay, so I'm going to click on subnets. So let's create some subnets uh, for my Netflix network. So I'll click on create subnet. Uh, let's say what I'm creating right now is for, uh, uh, you know, a network which is going to have internet access. So let's call all the networks which will have internet access as public and all the networks which will not have internet access as private okay so let's call this network as public and uh, when you're deploying servers in aws you can deploy it in many data centers okay 
so right now what we are dealing with is the oregon region so oregon is basically a place in the us where aws has many data centers and how many data centers are there uh, there are almost four data centers that you can choose from so let's create you know a public uh, subnet in 2a uh, data center okay and let's call this uh, public subnet as 2a and this net this uh, subnet will be deployed obviously inside my main network which is netflix so let me select that right and it is going to be deployed in the 2a data center and let me call uh, let me uh, specify the ip address range which is going to lie obviously between this particular ip range that i specified earlier this will be the ip range where i will have uh, you know uh, my my resources will be uh, assigned the ip address from okay so let me specify it as 10.1.1.0 uh, slash 24 so these numbers that you see slash 16 they basically denote a range 20 if i specify something called as slash 24 that's a smaller part of uh, you know a range which is slash 16 right for example if i specify so just assume it like this if i specify slash 16 there are going to be around 65000 ip addresses that i can give using this range okay now when i specify something as as small as slash 24 i will have an ip range of around uh, 256 to 5 uh, 256 servers okay so this is what uh, you know this number means uh, so more on this you can actually understand later because uh, you know if i try to explain you how ip addresses how ranges work it will take a little more time but uh, and it's easy to understand you can just google it out and you will understand it but for you for your uh, understanding i'm telling you that this range is a part of this particular ip range okay and this range we are assigning to our public 2a sub part sub network okay so let's create it and mind you guys i'm not defining you know the features of this network yet i'm just defining that i am creating these inside my main network okay so i just created public 2a which is basically a part of my netflix network and it is deployed in the 2a data center all right similarly let me create one more sub network let me call it as public 2b this is going to be a part of the 2b data center it is going to also have internet access it is going to be a part of my netflix uh, what do you say it will go, going to be a part of the netflix network right and the range is going to be 10.1.2.0 slash 24 okay let's go ahead and create it okay so now what we have done is we have created two sub parts in the data center 2a and in the data center 2b now let's go ahead and create private subnets which are not going to have internet access so let's create them so let's call this as private 2a it's going to be part of my netflix main network it's going to be a part of the 2a availability zone and this is going to basically have this ip range okay now similarly let me create a private 2b as well slash 24 and let me go ahead and create it okay so okay there's a small change over here that i'll have to do so once you have deployed it guys you can verify if you know it has been deployed in the correct uh, data center or not for example private 2a has been deployed in 2a data center that is great but when we talk about uh, public 2b it has again been deployed in 2a data center itself so what i can do is i can delete it quickly and i can create public 2b once more 
okay so let me create public to be and vpc is going to be my netflix network it's going to be part of my 2b network and this is going to be 10.1.2.0 slash 24. okay so now i have private 2a i have private 2b i have public 2a i have public 2b deployed and these should be now in the respective data centers if i've named it 2a it's in 2a if i've named it 2b it's in 2b if it's in 2b it's in 2b and 2a is also there in the 2a data center great so i have my network deployed now let me go ahead and define their functions so what i've decided is my public uh, subnet will have internet access and the private will not have internet access okay so what i'm going to do is first i need internet connection to my network so how can i give internet connection to my network to these public subnets let me go ahead and tell you so for example if you need a wi-fi at your home or if you need uh, internet at your home what do you do you contact an internet service provider they basically uh, you know bring a modem to your home and then you that modem you connect to your wi-fi router and by connecting to your wi-fi you're able to use your internet right similarly if i want to give internet to my network what i'll have to do is first i will have to go ahead and request for something called as a internet gateway so let me create an internet gateway let me call it as netflix network internet gateway let me create it okay so it has been created and now you see it in a list so i have created the internet gateway now i will attach it to my netflix network so here you can see you can find something called as attached to vpc let's click over here uh, let's select the VPC that we want to connect to which is Netflix. Let's select it and let's click on attach internet gateway Okay, so my internet gateway is now attached to my network Okay, but still The resources that are going to be in my network. They will not be able to access it The reason for that is whenever you deploy a resource in a cloud it is not directly deployed in the main network that you created it is always is deployed in a sub part of the network which we uh, which is basically nothing but the subnets that you created so the subnets that you have deployed you have to configure them to connect to this internet gateway okay now internet gateway is part of your network but your subnets are not knowing about that internet network so uh, In a simpler way, if I were to tell you, you have Wi-Fi at your home, but you are not connected to your Wi-Fi. So your laptop does not know if it can connect to that Wi-Fi or not. Okay. So what I'll be doing now is I will go ahead uh, to something called as route tables. So route tables basically specify which IP addresses can connect to a particular resource in the network and which ip addresses cannot okay so let me go ahead and show you guys how the route table is basically going to be configured so right now uh, there is one route table which is automatically created for your netflix uh, network let's call this route table as the internet route table so whichever subnets or whichever part of the network are going to be connected to this route table will have internet access and let's create a route table which is called non internet route table right and let's also deploy it in the netflix network only so this route table that i have created over here is going to have all the resources which do not have internet access okay so to this inter, uh, non internet route table let's uh, go ahead and attach the subnets 
which will not have internet and to this internet routable let's attach the subnets which are going to have internet okay so first let's attach subnets to the internet routable we'll click on subnet associations and here as you can see there are no subnets attached to it as of now we'll click on edit subnet associations and we will attach all the public subnets where we need internet to this route table okay so now the route table have been attached uh, sorry the subnets have been attached to this route table and now what you will do is you will specify a route to the internet gateway in this route table and then what will happen is all the subnets which are connected to this route table will be able to see that internet gateway or in other words who whichever laptop is at your home will be able to connect to that wi-fi okay so let's click on edit routes let's click on add a route and here let's say everyone in this network should be able to connect so when you have to say everyone you give a destination or ip address like this okay so all the ip addresses which are there in this subnet should be able to connect to my internet gateway which is this right and let's click on save routes so now what have what have we done let's revise so we connected two subnets to this route table which basically i named them to be public subnets and these pub public subnets i have given a property to them that they can connect to the internet by using an internet gateway okay is everything clear till over here guys any questions that you have okay so samiran is saying are you using the free tier account yes samiran so, so this is not a free tier account samiran but all these settings that i'm doing right now they're all going to be uh, you know a part of uh, what do you say uh, it is going to be a part of uh, the free tier so you don't have to worry about it whatever i'm doing you can also do and you will not be charged whatever you have to do uh so ahsan is saying even if you are located in a different region in the world is it still 10.1 ip address so ahsan uh the network that i have deployed it's basically deployed in the oregon region so this is the region that i am working in right now i'm working in the oregon region so in oregon region the network that i have created no matter which data center that you connect to if you are a part of my network it will or you will always have 10.1 ip address uh, so nagraj is saying public 2b is not assigned availability zone so i did that uh, so raju is saying clear explanation okay great raju uh, hari krishna is saying did the internet rule table got created the moment we had created an internet gateway uh no uh, so hari krishna uh, uh, whenever you create um, you know a network automatically a default route table is created for you right but you can uh, go ahead and create more route tables which can be attached to your network as well okay ujwal is saying how can we connect the public and private subnets good very good question ujwal i'll tell you in a little while so hari krishna is saying how to know that cid is which cid is ranges we can use so you can follow the same formula which i which i told you krishna when you specify a subnet uh, an ip range with which is ending with slash 16 that means you are specifying the range of 65000 ip addresses okay but when you increase the number so let's say if you give slash 24 that means now you have reduced your ip address range So what I've done is I created an IP range which said 10.1.0.0 where zero and zero can be anything, right? And then what I did was while I was creating the subnets, I replaced the third value in the IP address. So I specified 10.1, and instead of zero, I specified a digit. So that digit is now going to be fixed, and only the zeros can be changed, right? So with that, I specified what ranges are going to be a part of the other subnet that i have deployed so you can if if this is confusing for you you can use the same ranges that as i have did and it should be a not not a problem for you uh okay uh ujwal is asking how can we communicate between the two subnets ujwal like i said i'll be explaining in a little while shri ganesh is saying how to put data in subnet uh 
Ganesh, please be with me. I will be explaining in a little while. Ashish is saying, can we limit the number of IP addresses that can connect to public networks? Yes, Ashish, you can do that. So right now what I've done is I specified 0.0.0 slash .0, 0, which means each and every IP address, uh, you know, can connect to the internet. If you want only specific resources to be able to connect to the internet, what you can do is once you have deployed your resources, you will get their IP addresses. Just specify that IP address over here and only that IP address will then be able to connect to the internet gateway. I hope that answers your question. So Hari Krishna is saying, are these CIDI ranges region specific? Uh, so whenever you deploy a network Hari Krishna uh, in, in AWS cloud, it is always specific to that particular region. So right now I have deployed it in the Oregon region, right? So all these data centers in Oregon region can basically, uh, you know, have resources which are going to be a part of the network that I have created. But let's say I go ahead and I choose let's say the mumbai region right so mumbai region will not be able to deploy a resource in this network i hope that answers your question okay any other questions guys can we move forward any other questions okay so there are no questions let's move ahead i hope everyone is on the same page guys Anywhere, if you feel something is not clear, let me know. All right. So now that we have uh, one network which is going to have internet with us, and the other network which is not going to have internet with us, why this does not have in any internet? Because I've not specified any uh, you know connection to the internet gateway, and I will also show it to you in a little while. Now, a very good question which Ujwal asked me was, let's say I have some resources. Uh, you know in the public subnet okay and i have some resources in the private subnet so how can, can they communicate with each other and if yes how so let me answer that question for you well so when you create route tables automatically uh, you know the route table that you have created it has a rule in it which says all the ip address ranges of that network they should be able to connect to the local resources which are there as part of that uh, route table right what that means is the internet route table it has uh, two subnets right it has public 2a and public 2b so when i say that these ip addresses if anyone is requesting uh, anything from these ip address ranges right they should be able to connect to all the resources which are part of the subnets which are connected to this route table. In other words, anyone in this network through this rule, what I'm defining is anyone in this Netflix network, if they have been assigned an IP address, they can interact with the resource which has been deployed in the public subnet. Okay. Similarly, if you have a look at my non internet route table, here also, I have defined that anyone who is a part of the Netflix network can connect to all the local resources which are going to be there in my private subnet. Okay, so this is what I have specified from my router. Does that answer your question, Ujwal? Is it clear to Ujwal and to everyone that all the resources that I'm going to deploy in the Netflix network? they will be able to communicate with each other because they are part of the same network if i were to give you an example of this let's say uh, inside your home network you are your laptop is connected to your wi-fi right and your mobile is also connected to your wi-fi so if you want your mobile and your laptop can communicate with each other even if your wi-fi router is not connected to the internet Okay, if you remove the internet line from your Wi-Fi router and you will not be able to use the internet, that is for sure. But what will now happen is if you two devices are connected to the same Wi-Fi router, you will be able to talk to each other. So let's say on your system, you, uh, you know, create a shared folder and you try to access that shared folder from some other laptop which is connected to the same Wi-Fi. 
you will be able to interact with each other okay similarly all the resources which are a part of this network the netflix network they will be able to interact with each other so hari krishna means this means we can access public subnet from private subnet uh so hari krishna yes the resources which are there in the public subnet i can talk to them i can do a two way communication with them right but if i want to connect to the internet i will not be able to do it from the private subnet okay so ujwal is saying once repeat okay ujwal so i'm saying that in my route table i have specified uh, or this rule is automatically specified which says anyone who is connected to this ip range they can talk to all the resources which are there uh, you know deployed in the subnets which are associated to your route table for example this is a non internet route table and this should, this will have the pub, private uh, uh, subnets or private networks connected to it so anyone from this ip range where is this ip range this ip range is nothing but your netflix network ip range anyone from this ip range can connect to uh, your uh, resources which are a part of uh, you know your private subnets and can talk to them but only the resources which have these ip address will be able to talk no other resource is this clear okay guys is this clear to everyone right uh, are we all clear with what we have done as of now so we have created a network we have created some sub parts of the network those sub parts some parts have internet access some parts do not have internet access but irrespective of the fact whether they have internet access or not they all will be able to talk to each other is this clear with everyone okay hi says yes he is clear thanks very for the kind words others are we all clear with whatever i have just explained please please be a little responsive and chat guys otherwise i will not understand if you guys are actually able to follow me or not is everyone clear ganesh says he is clear thanks ganesh ashish yes uh radhna yes thank you radhna nagaraju says local network do we need to create any firewall rules yes nagaraju uh, so there are some firewall rules that we can create but we have not got to them as as of now just let me know if whatever i have explained to you is clear pravin says yes okay so thank you all for the confirmation i can see a lot of you have said yes thank you all now what i'll be doing is uh, so i think i'm not connected the subnets to my non internet route table let me go ahead and connect so i'll just click on actions uh sorry i'll go to subnet associations of my non internet and let me connect the private subnets to it so private 2a and private 2b let me connect okay so now i have the two route tables configured and i have my network configured in the fashion that i've just explained to you guys and now uh, one final setting that we will have to do is uh we will go to subnets now the resources which can talk to each other on the internet uh or which which will basically have internet access they will need a public ip address as well if they don't have a public ip be uh, outside uh, from the netflix network will not be able to talk to them okay so how do we configure Uh, our resources which are be deployed in the public subnet to have a public ip address this is a small setting that you have to do so you will be clicking on your public subnet you will be going to actions you will have to go to modify auto assign ip settings click on enable auto assign uh, public ip for address and click on save so now all the resources which are going to be deployed in public to a are going to have a public ip address public ip address is basically a address which can be reached out from the internet okay all the 10.1 ip address ranges that i specified earlier are basically going to be uh, a part of the local network that is the netflix network 
but when we talk about the internet internet is also a network right so internet also has its own ip addresses which are given to you know uh, people when they want to connect to each other right so for example if i am connected to the internet if i go ahead and see what is my ip address this is the ip address that i have right and this ip address is basically given to me by my internet service provider so similarly if i want uh, if i want to deploy a resource on aws which is connected to the internet and to which i want to connect to it should have this public ip address okay so that is what we have configured that all the resources in my public 2a will have a public ip address and even in public 2b i will specify that they can have a public ip address okay great so now all the resources that i'm going to deploy in public 2a and public 2b will have an ip address and now we can simply go ahead and go to my uh, service ec2 which we talked about earlier which is going to rent me servers i will go to that service and let me deploy some servers now so what i do is i'll click on running instances and let's click on launch instance okay so the moment you click on launch instance now let's see what are the kind of options that we see on the screen so now when you want to rent a server from cloud the first thing that you need to decide is what is the kind of operating system that you want to run on that server okay so let's say i want to run a linux server so let me select ubuntu i want to run the ubuntu operating system on my server okay so i'll select it and now it will ask me what is the kind of processor what is the kind of ram do you want for your server so here's the list that you can select for now if you want your server to be a part of uh, three tier you can see this green uh, highlighted text over here which says three tier eligible select that it will give you one core cpu and it will give you one gb of ram okay let's go ahead and click on next next thing it will ask you is what network do you do want to deploy uh, this resource in so i want to deploy it in my netflix network right and since this is going to be a public uh, instance that i'm deploying because first what i want to do is i want to configure my server that i'm deploying on aws and later i'll shift it to a private network where we will not, not be able to access it from the internet okay so i am going to deploy it in the public subnet as of now and what i'm going to do is rest i'm going to leave everything at default i'm going to click on next now it will ask me what is the kind of space or what is the hard drive space that i want for my server so when you deploy a linux server it has minimal requirements so a linux server with 8 gb of ram will work uh, 8 gb of uh, storage space will work so I'll just click on next again. Uh, and now this is the place where people were referring to, uh, will, will it have any firewalls? So you, when you talk about firewalls, you basically are referring to security groups in AWS. Okay, so my instance will basically, or my servers will be governed by a firewall, which is called security group and i can create a firewall or i can choose an existing firewall as well so when you create a new network what happens is automatically uh, there's a firewall which is created which is basically called the default firewall so it's called the default vpc security group okay if you select that firewall what are the kind of things that you can configure over here let's see so first of all what you can configure is the kind of traffic which is allowed in this firewall okay so right now now it says all traffic is allowed good what protocol is allowed all protocols are allowed okay so we'll have to restrict this firewall in a little while we'll do that what port range is allowed any port from any traffic is allowed okay and who can connect to this firewall only the people who are part of this 
security group can connect. So this we will have to change since I want to connect to the server to configure it. So I will have to put my IP address over here in the source. We'll do that in a little while. But for now, this is the firewall that you all were referring to, right? And this is uh, something that we are uh, choosing as default over here. You can create it as well. If you create it, you will again get the same options, but you will have to configure them. Okay, so let's click on review and launch. And now you can just review all the settings that you have done. If everything looks good, you can just click on launch. Now, AWS as a security option, it does not give you a simple uh, password based authentication to your server. What it gives you is a file which you can use to connect to your server. Okay, so that file is basically called a private key file which you will have to download from over here right so i have a file that i already created it's called mac oregon so i'm going to select that uh, i already have it on my system if you don't have it you're creating it for the first time you will have to choose create a new key pair let me create it uh, since we are doing it over here let's specify as netflix demo this is the file that i will be using to authenticate to my servers once you specify the name, just click on download key pair. Uh, this will be downloaded to your system and then later you can use it to connect to your server. OK, now I click on launch instances. And with this, my server has now just been launched. OK, and I've launched it inside a public submit. OK, now before I move to the next screen, if there are any questions, I'll be very uh, you know obliged to answer them. So let me just check. Uh, Balu is saying EC2 is one way of launching VMs. Are there any other way we can launch a Linux instance uh, using AWS services? Uh, so Balu, AWS is basically one service which gives you uh, uh, servers. It gives you general purpose servers to launch. But the, the other services that are there in AWS, they are very specific to the kind of server that they will give you. For example, we are going to make use of a database server today right later in this session so if you want to create a database server you can create it with ec2 as well right you can launch a linux instance on that you can install your server and uh, on, on your database right and then it becomes a database server but what aws also gives you the flexibility is that let's say you do not want to do all this hard work what you want is a database server itself so aws has specialized services in its management console which basically gives you a server which is pre-configured and that is about each and every service which is there in AWS right so the different kind of methods that you can launch servers this is the most uh, uh, this is the most uh, common method which is used but let's say uh, you know you do not want to configure your server yourself you want AWS to configure it then there are different services in AWS which you can choose which will give you specialized servers. It could be a database server. It could be a web server as well. It could be a serverless uh, architecture as well. So everything is given to you, but it will be pre-configured by AWS. So those are the different kind of ways that you can launch servers. Hope that answers your question. Uh, Altaf is saying, are these steps what we have done will be charged? No, Altaf, these will not be uh, you know, charging you if you do this, whatever I've done so far. Okay, so Hari Krishnan is saying the default security group we selected was it specific to the VPC we created or is it default for all VPCs? So it is specific for the network that we created. That was Netflix, right? It is not common to all VPCs. Okay, so Nagaraju is saying the free tier you have created, how many days it's free? It's free for one year, Nagaraju. Uh, but uh, let me give you a, 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 a limit as well uh, as to how this free tier operates. So every month uh, you have uh, 24 into 30. That is you have 720 hours uh, in a month, right? So what AWS tells you is you can run a server for 720 hours in a month for free. That means if you launch one server, if you run it for 30 days, and you don't never stop it you will not be charged for anything but uh, the game changes when you launch two servers so if you launch two servers then the number of hours for those servers are counted 
independently so one hour of those two servers accounts to two hours of aws counting with the 750 hours limit in other words if you launch one server in aws you can run it for 30 days if you don't stop it it will not charge you if you run two servers in aws you can run it straight for 15 days without getting charged why 15 days because now for your one hour there are two servers uh, two servers which are running right and those two servers have the different uh, pricing which is running on them per hour right so i hope you understand what i'm trying to say so if aws tells you that you can run 750 hours worth of servers in a month 720 hours worth of uh, servers in a month right but it depends on how many servers you run so if you run three servers then that 15 days time will reduce to seven days so it's always a good idea to stop the servers once you're done with them so if you stop a server right in that case you will not be charged right now the servers are running so there's also an option to stop them but the moment you're done with them just stop it and you will not be charged so that is uh, how you can be under the free tier Okay, so Ashish is saying uh, we are able to connect to EC2 via key pair only or other options available. Uh, Ashish, by default, you can connect only via key pair, which we downloaded. There is no other option available. Okay, are there any other questions, guys? Any any other question that I can answer for you? Cool. If there are no more questions, let's move ahead. Okay, so now I have just launched a server, right? And this server is now a part of my public subnet, which means this has internet access. So let's see what all things we have uh, available for this server. So let's call this as Ubuntu server. Okay, so this has a public IP address. Great, I can use this IP address to connect to this server, right? It has the private IP. Private IP is basically the IP which is given inside the network. So as you can see, the range is 10.1, which is exactly what we specified, right? Uh, it is a part of the 2A data center, which is good. Uh, the firewall attached to it is default. So we will have to change the default rules for this firewall. And others you can verify whatever you configured, exactly those configurations you can see for your server over here, okay? Now what I'll be doing is I will be selecting the security group which is the default security group. And let me change the settings over here. So first of all, I'll be changing the inbound rules. Uh, so the inbound rules of my firewall right now are these. So let me change this. So I click on edit inbound rules. And now first of all, uh, let me tell the server that only I can connect to it. So I will specify my IP. And as you can see, this is my IP address that has been specified. So only my system will be able to connect to this server. And right now you can see this is the public IP that has been attached to my firewall. Okay. So any kind of traffic from my IP address will be allowed to this server. Okay. So this is the setting that I'm specifying right now. I'll click on save rules. And this setting is done. Now, this will be changed later when we will be deploying our full stack application. But for now, this is the IP range that I have specified. Okay. Now I'll go back to my dashboard, go back to my server, I select the server that I want to connect to. So this is the Ubuntu server. So you will notice I have some other servers, EC2 demo, which have been created over here. So this account is used by a lot of people. So you don't have to worry about the other servers which are being launched. Just select the server that you want to use so in my case it's ubuntu now i'll be connecting to it okay so this is the ip address that i'll be connect connecting from let's copy it and now to connect to it i will make use of my terminal okay now here is something that will be different that can be different on your system what is different on mine so I am using a Mac operating system. So I have something called as a terminal, right? So this is a bash terminal that I'm gonna use to connect to my server, okay? Now, when you might be on a Linux, or sorry, you might be on a Windows system. So in that case, if you want to connect to your server, 
you will have to basically make use of a software called putty okay so there's a software called putty which will basically make you to connect to your server right uh, so what we we basically make use of is the ssh protocol to connect to a linux server so this tool the putty tool will help you connect to your server using the ssh protocol so just click on the first link that you see you can see it says you can download putty over here just click over it and here you can download you know the putty version so you have to download the 64 bit version in case your processor is 64 bit if you have 32 bit architecture then you will be selecting the 32 bit version okay once you download it there is one more software that you have to download and that is called putty gen okay download this as well on your system now once you have putty gen and putty downloaded what you have to do is uh, you remember the key pair file that you got this this is the pem file uh, this is the key pair that you got and this is only for windows system that i'm telling you right now is so this pem file is not compatible with your putty software okay so what you have to do is you have to convert this pem file into ppk and that can be done using this putty gen software that you will be downloading okay so how you can use the putty gen software uh, let me show you some screenshots so this is how your software is going to look like um, you don't have to enter any values in key comment key phrase so what i'll do is okay so this is how your uh, putty gen will look like you when you op open it for the first time so what you have to do is you have to click on load okay it will open a dialog box select the pem file that you downloaded click on okay and then click on save private key okay what this will do is it will save a ppk format file on your system and that is basically the file which you will be using uh, now to connect to your server right so pem files are compatible with linux systems but pem files are not compatible with uh, windows systems when you're using the putty software so you have to convert it to ppk okay so with that done once you have the ppk file next you will be opening your uh, putty software so your putty software will look something like this okay this is the ui that you will get so the ip address of your server will go over here in host name so this is my ubuntu server this ip address will go over here uh, in this dialog box the host name okay so once you put the ip address over here next what you have to do is you have to click on ssh right and once you open ssh you will find something called as auth under it click on auth and then you will get a browse uh, window over here okay so if you click on ssh you will get click on auth you will get a browse button over here click on this browse button select the ppk file that you downloaded earlier and then all you have to do is click on open that's it so once you click on open you and i will be on the same user interface as what i'm going to show you as of now okay so this is the only difference that is going to be there while i am doing this demo and while you will be doing this demo so first step you have to convert pem to ppk using the putty gen software put the ppk file over here in browse section of ssh auth and then put the ip address over here by, by going to session click on session put the ip address over here and finally click on open right so now a terminal will open just like this and then i'll tell you what to has to be done from there okay so now what i'll be doing is let me pass in the command so this is the command that you will be using when you are on linux okay so people who are there on linux first you have to go to the folder uh, which will basically have your pem file then pass in this command so ssh hyphen i i basically means the uh, server that you want to connect to Uh, sorry the pem file that you want to connect to this is the pem file that i'll be using to connect and then 
now people on putty you will see a dialog box which will ask you for login as it will ask you for username so if you have launched a linux machine which has ubuntu operating system the username would be ubuntu okay ubuntu at the rate uh, now when you just have to specify ubuntu hit enter you will be logged in people on linux you have to specify username at the rate of ip address of your server and then hit enter okay so it will ask you whether you trust the server this will also be the same for people who are going to work on windows you have to type in yes hit enter and windows people will be able to connect then and there to the server people on linux will find this kind of a warning which will say unprotected private key file okay so you will have to pass in a command sudo chmod 500 uh, which are basically going to change the permissions of your file right and then just change it with 500 and this should do the trick now pass in the same command and there you go i have connected to my ubuntu server on aws so people who will be doing it on windows you will also see the screen as you are seeing right now on my screen right and this is how you connect to a server which is deployed on aws okay so let me see if we have any questions so raju is saying is it enough if we stop or it has to be terminated so raju if you are uh, working under the free tier it is enough if you stop the server uh, you will not be charged but people who are not under the free tier you will be charged for the storage so the hard disk that is there with your server it is not deleted if you stop the server so you will be charged for the hard hard disk but people in in the free tier uh, you know your hard disk space also has some limits uh, which will be basically available under the free tier so if you are choosing the 8 gb option i think if you stop even two or three servers and don't use them you will not be charged anything okay so ganesh is saying why are you using ubuntu instead of windows so ganesh when you are uh, working in production systems right when you are basically uh, if even if we let's talk about uh, you know the session today which is about uh, deploying an application like netflix so all of them they use linux systems only when they are deploying applications and the reason for that is linux basically takes up a very few amount of resources for the whole operating system that it has to run and when you compare it to windows windows takes up a lot of resources to run okay because windows also has a lot of features so to minimize the cost of uh, you know the resources that you're using every company prefers to launch their applications on linux operating system and that is exactly what we are also going to do so is saying how can we connect to aws server through local window or linux command line so this is exactly what i have done surendra right now so i have connected my local machine this is my uh, macbook so i have connected my macbook to the aws server using the terminal right so this terminal what i have commands i have passed is going to be the same for any linux operating system that you use out there for windows i have told you you can use putty to connect to your server so i hope that answers your question so ashish is saying can we create different users that allow to connect to ec2 yes ashish so if you are sound with linux now that you're connected to this server you can do anything with this server it's now yours if you want to create more users you can go ahead and do that you can do anything with this server now it's up to you okay nagaraju is saying pem file is a secure key or cloud server uh yes nagaraju so cloud uh, the cloud server has given us a pem file which is basically a private key so i don't need any password if i have this file only then i will be able to connect to my servers if I don't have this file, I will not be able to connect to my servers. So it's basically a replacement for having a password because password generally gets leaked, right? If you are typing in a password, somebody might see 
what you're typing on the keyboard and they might get to know what your password is so instead of that if you have a file through which you're connecting and given the fact that you are not going to share this file with anyone nobody else would be able to connect to your server okay so that's why it's a little more secure when you come uh, you know compare it with having a password okay so mopai is saying security group inbound rules can you show once yes mopai i'll show you in a little while okay so let me show you the security group rules Opa, one second So these are my rules Mopa. so i have enabled every kind of connection from my macbook to the server that i've just connected to okay great now that we have connected to our server what i'll do is i will basically make it a web server and then once our website is ready we will deploy it in my private subnet which is not going to have any internet access okay so when you want to create a web server, first thing that you have to do is anything that you want to install on a Linux machine, first you update that machine. Okay, so I'll just type in sudo apt get update. It'll take like a minute to update the machine or even less than a minute. So it took 10 seconds to update the machine. Now what I'll be doing is, so this is the command that I passed to update the machine sudo apt get update next thing that i'll be doing is i will be installing a web server so sudo apt get install apache 2 so this is a web server which is now getting installed okay so i just choose yes Okay, so web server is now being installed and after this we'll do a very cool exercise guys uh, so you will be able to see that if i go to the ip address of my server now uh, so i just type the ip address over here in the browser you can see i can able to access this page in my browser okay but let me do one thing let me give this ip address to you guys and then you can tell me whether you are able to access them or not so i'll just put this ip address in the chat let me know if you are able to access this ip address can everybody go to that ip address and tell me whether they are able to access it or not So Raj says he's not able to access. Okay, Raj. Others? Hari Krishnan cannot access. Okay. Okay. Can you guys tell me why you are not, not able to access it? Can anybody tell me? Okay, so Deepti has given me a right answer. Others? Nagaraju also has given me the right answer. Raj also has given me the right answer. Okay, I think everybody is on the same page. So yes, guys, because in this firewall that is in the security group, I just specified that only my IP address can connect to it. Okay. Now, if I change that, let's see what happens. So I'll just go to the default security group, which is this. I'll change the inbound settings. And okay, I think I'm not in the right security group. One second. So 
So let me change these inbound settings. And now let me allow anyone to connect. Now, can you guys confirm if you are able to access your machine or not? Uh, I mean, this web page or not in your browser? Okay, Hari can access. Great. Nagraju can access. Altaf can access. Great. All right. Awesome. So, since you are everyone is able to access now, you can now understand how this firewall basically works. Okay. Okay. So, now what I'm going to do is, guys, I'm going to basically go ahead and define a web page over here. So, let me show you how we are going to go ahead and define our web pages okay so what i'm going to do is uh, this is the architecture that we are going to deploy now so i will have a separate web page for streaming servers one second so i will have a separate web page for uh, you know my uh, video page and I will have a separate web page for my home page. Now, let me show you why we are going to do like this. So, let me go ahead and open the website called Netflix.com and just see what is the behavior. So, if I go to Netflix.com, I automatically go ahead and get routed to Netflix.com slash browse. Okay. And if I select the account that I want to use, it's still the uh, the the URL over here. It's Netflix.com/browse. So Netflix.com/browse is taking me to the home page of Netflix. I hope everybody is clear here. Okay. Now what happens if I play a video? Okay, so let me play this series over here. So now what you can see is the URL changed to netflix.com slash watch and then you have uh, you know some numbers over here which are probably would be the numbers for your video. Okay, so you have connected to netflix.com slash watch one second you have connected to netflix.com slash watch in order to get to this page you know playing this video okay now let me show you what happens when you connect, when you play some other video so i'll again click on back let me play some other video so let me play let's say this space force can you still see it's still netflix.com slash watch and then you have these numbers which are after this url so these numbers basically are referring to the video which is playing on this page but this page is same all the time the page is always netflix.com slash watch which is basically referring you to this video player and then to this video player what you're doing is you're providing this uh, number which is basically now going to play the video that uh, you know you are launching over here let's see if we remove uh, the track ID what happens okay so this is the number which is associated to the video that you are playing right and this is the page that you're going to you're always going to netflix.com slash watch so if you go to netflix.com slash watch you open the uh, the the video player and to that video player you tell okay so this is the video that i want to play and that is what is being played over here so let's see if i just type in watch what happens okay you can see they have routed me to something else because they do not want me to you know just access the web uh, the the uh, you know the video player so when I go to netflix.com slash watch, they basically read out me to some other URL. But you now understand the working of Netflix. What they do is 
if you go to netflix.com slash browse they are routing you to the home page and if you go to netflix.com slash watch uh, and you know some some video id if you specify it will take you to the video which is being played okay so now let's see how we can mimic this architecture on our system so what i'm going to do is if i go to netflix.com uh, slash home i will be taken to the home page and if i go to netflix.com slash stream or let's make it watch so if netflix.com slash watch if i go to it will take me to the video player okay so this is something that we are going to configure now and this we are going to do using the aws infrastructure okay so before we move on guys let me see if we have any questions okay so ujwal is saying streaming and web page can be assigned ssl certificate to elb well ujwal you can do that but ssl certificates will only you know improve the security so my point is to basically show you how you know this uh, this particular mechanism is uh, done on aws so i'll be showing you that so he's saying i'm talking about production so yes on production you can do that in production you can uh, all you have to do is on your server you should have an ssl certificate which is going to enable https connections right but it, since uh, if you might already know that ssl certificates are uh, you know uh, you know you have to buy ssl certificates you cannot just get them like, like that so we are not going to make use of ssl certificates today but we are going to mimic the mechanism that i just showed you so devishish is saying do we need to attach load balancer to route 53 yes devishish we are going to do that uh, actually i have not reached that step yet i'm just still talking about you know the url based routing that we are going to accomplish in some time okay other any other questions guys is everyone clear as to what we have to do is everyone uh, crystal clear as to what we will be doing right now any any questions anaga says yes thank you anaga others radna says yes thank you radna others no queries thanks hari krishnan okay thank you all right so if everybody is clear let me go ahead and show you how this architecture is basically going to work so first of all let's create a home page let's create a page that we will be routed to if you go to slash home okay so what i'm going to do is uh, this is my web server where i am able to uh, go and see this page let's change this page to look like a home page so what i'll do is uh, so when you have an apache 2 server which is running you can go ahead in this path slash var slash www slash html and this will have a page called index.html okay so this index.html page if you change this your html will change over here okay so for now let me first delete this index.html page and now let's create a new index.html page which says let's say welcome to home page so i will create an html page which will this is a very simple html code that i'm writing over here which will says welcome to the home page okay so this is what i've created and if i refresh over here you can see it says welcome to the home page and even you guys if you refresh you will be able to see this particular web page which says welcome to the home page okay so surendra is saying how to minimize uh, streaming surendra i didn't get your question if you can rephrase your question i think i can you know understand what you're trying to ask okay other guys now if you go to the ip address that i gave you earlier you should see this page welcome to the home page 
now our web page our web server our home page is now ready and now what i'll be doing is i'll be deploying this inside a private subnet so let's see how we can do that so for doing this uh, i will first go to my dashboard and this is the server that i created so let me create a copy of this server first and then that copy i will deploy it in the private subnet that we created earlier so i just select the server that i created click on actions then you have something called as image so let's create a image image is nothing but it creates a copy of your server which can be deployed multiple times then so we'll create an image uh, let's call this image name as home page home netflix hyphen home let's specify this right let's click on create image and now my image is getting created okay and that image will basically have uh, this web server already deployed great so now that it is happening i think it will take a minute or two to create that image and you can see that image in the under the image section in ami so if you go to ami uh, you can see that you know a netflix home image is being created and it is in the pending state as of now so i think if we refresh it a couple of times you can see it will change to available so let's wait so while this is happening let me explain you how the other things are going to work out so as you must have noticed right so if you want to have a home page which is going to be separate and if you want to have a watch page which is going to be separate you will be dealing with two servers right and if you're dealing with two servers you obviously will have two ip addresses right but as you can see from the behavior of the netflix website uh the url always remains the same right only the web page is changing so how do we accomplish that so we can accomplish it by having a common medium in the middle which can connect to both my watch page and my home page okay so this uh, resource which is the elastic load balancer that we are going to deploy in a minute is going to have a url which is always going to be the same and this load balancer we can configure uh, to understand if i'm if the url is slash watch or slash stream it is always going to you know route my request to the streaming service whereas if my request is slash home or let's say just slash or just say no uh, url at all in that case it will be routing my request to the home page so this is possible using the elastic load balancer right and this is something that we are going to go ahead and deploy now now i think we are ready to now understand what how our architecture is going to uh, you know be deployed so now what i'm going to do is all my servers they are going to be a part of my private subnet where i do not have internet access right but as we have known from the previous under uh, our pre from our previous understanding we know that uh, everything within our netflix network will be able to interact with each other okay so in my netflix network i have a public subnet i have a private subnet so private subnet does not have internet access public subnet has internet access so in my public subnet i'm going to deploy my load balancer right in my private subnet i'm going to deploy all my servers right and these servers can only be accessed by the load balancer and nothing else okay nobody else will be able to connect to these servers directly only through my load balancer they will be able to access my servers and this is a very good architectural practice when we talk about you know having security for our servers why 
because uh, you know you can control which protocol scan you interact with in your load balancer for example let's say a hacker wants to go ahead and make use of servers they, they want to pass some commands as i did on this terminal okay so if you want your uh, load balancer to restrict that your load balancer will only allow http traffic what is http traffic http traffic is the traffic that you get from your web browser so only the web browser's traffic will be enabled through your load balancer if somebody is trying to uh, pass some command if somebody is trying to connect through some other protocol it will not be allowed okay and even in that case your load balancer will only allow some urls so only if you type in slash home you will be allowed if you are typing something else you will not be routed to my server that again is a very good security aspect that if your url is pointing to netflix.com slash home only then you will be reaching my home server to access that content you cannot access my content and from any other medium from that particular server okay so this is how you can restrict hackers or restrict attackers from accessing your server and it's a very good architectural practice to have your architectures deployed like this okay so let me see if you have any questions with respect to whatever i've just explained Uh, so Ethan is saying, why did you have to create an AMI? So Ethan, if I did not create an AMI, I will have to go inside, uh, you know, the server which will be there in the private subnet to configure it to have, you know, the required software installed and the other software configurations. But I cannot do that obviously because no internet access is given to the resources which are there in the private subnet. So what I'm doing is I'm creating an image which has every bit of the software installed in it. And then I will just deploy that image inside the private subnet. In that case, I do not have to connect to it directly. Okay. So that is why I'm doing it. So Ujwal is saying, how do we manage the private subnet server? So Ujwal, we don't have to manage them. Right, because the reason being we have created an image and we'll be directly deploying it over there now. So we don't have to manage them from our system. But one thing that we can do is something called as a bastion host. So a bastion host uh, is might sound a very big name, but all a bastion host is that it is a proxy server. What is a proxy server? Uh, if I want to connect to instances in the private subnet can somebody tell me how can i access it can somebody tell me uh, if i have to connect to a server from my local system to this server which is there in this network how can i connect to it given i have access to my aws management console given i can deploy as many resources that i want is there a way that i can connect to this server for passing a command can anybody tell me how we can do that okay so ganesh is saying which condition the elastic load balancer will allow access to private server i will show you in a little while ganesh uh prasad is saying are we not using s3 for storing the video or media files so prasad we can do that but right now we are focusing more on the architecture so we're not getting into implementation details so i i hope that answers your question which will saying is bastion host the best solution for connecting to your private servers as well yes so devshi is saying what we put in private subnet exactly and what is the another port you were telling that restrict to access so in a private subnet uh, whatever you see in this rectangle uh, devshi we will be deploying that so we will be deploying uh, you know the servers which will our home page and our streaming page inside our private subnet right our home page and our streaming page will then be able to access it uh, uh, through the load balancer which will be deployed in the public subnet so this is the architecture that i explained you uh altaf is saying i have him having the below issue if you can suggest it will be great otherwise please proceed 
so it says no uh, so altaf is getting an error not supported authentication methods available so altaf uh, you have not selected the ppk file in the ssh option of your auth so select that then put in the ip address and then click on open that should resolve your doubt okay Ujwal is saying Git or AWS CLI. Okay. So Hari is saying, please repeat the question. I'll do that, Hari. Nagaraju is saying, using proxy to connect. Okay. Uh, Nagaraju, you're right. Proxy to connect. But how will we do that architecture? How will we create that architecture of connecting it, uh, of connecting, uh, you know, to the servers that they're deployed in a private uh, subnet? Is something that I'm trying to ask. Uh, Mopai is saying allowing the route in the route table we can connect to the private server. Mm, there is an easy way, Mopa also. So just think on the lines of how your load balancer is accessing your uh, uh, are accessing your private servers. Just think on those lines and you will be able to crack the answer. Uh, Ramesh is saying NAT gateway, not uh, no Ramesh, not NAT gateway. Okay, so can anybody guess it? Okay, so Parveen is saying first connect public network server from that server connect to private network. Okay, so Parveen has given me the right answer. So what I'll have to do guys is this rectangle over here is my public subnet, right? So what I'll do is I'll deploy a server over here, which will have internet access. I will connect to this server from my system using SSH. Now once I'm inside this server, this server obviously can can access every resource which is a part of the netflix network right so using this server i will then ssh into the private servers that i have in the private subnet is everyone clear with what i have just told you any doubts in what i have told you i will deploy a ec2 server over here in the public subnet that subnet will have uh, sorry that ec2 server will have access to all the servers which are there in the network right even if it's private or public so then what i will do is once i'm inside this server which is there in the public subnet i will ssh to the server which is there in the private subnet does that does that make sense is everyone clear so Altaf says yes, okay. Hari says yes. Ganesh says no, okay, Ganesh. So you can tell me what is not clear. I'll be happy to answer. Surendra says yes. Raj says yes. Anaga, Ramesh. Thank you for the confirmation, guys. So Ganesh, let me repeat it for you. So this rectangle over here is my public submit. Is this clear? Ujwal and Amit are also saying repeat. I'm going to repeat it guys for you. So this rectangle is my public subnet. Is this clear to you? Okay. Okay, great. So Devashi is saying, but why we need to do this? Public will be exposed to hacker. Uh, so Devashi, we are going to do this just to configure. So somebody asked a question. If I have to configure my servers, if I have to do some maintenance on my private servers, how will I do it? So I will deploy a temporary server in the public network. I will connect to it. And through that, I will connect to my private server. So this is just for maintenance, right? Uh, and only for that reason i will be deploying that server nothing else so nagaraju says someone hack netflix public server they may get access to the other server the right nagaraju but like i said it is only temporary when i have to do some maintenance on my private servers i'll be doing this other than that i'll not be doing it okay all right so okay let me get back to what i was explaining so this is my public subnet everyone understands this 
and this is this rectangle is my private subnet okay so this rectangle has internet access this rectangle does not have internet access this is the rectangle where my private servers are going to be deployed and this is the rectangle where i'm going to have a public server deployed uh, which in this case i have also deployed a ubuntu server so i have deployed it inside a public subnet okay now do you guys agree that whatever i'm going to deploy in this rectangle or this subnet is going to have access to resources which will be deployed in this rectangle which is the private subnet does everyone agree with that okay nagaraju says yes hari says yes ganesh do you agree with that ujwal amit okay everyone has said yes amit i'm waiting for you okay amit is not sure so amit uh, as i said earlier we are inside inside one network the netflix netflix network that we created right that is the big network that we created inside that big network we created small networks which were public and private public had internet access private did not have internet access okay so all these resources which are a part of the big network which is netflix all the resources can talk to each other is that correct or not do you agree with that amit or not okay amit says yes all right so now because they can talk to each other now imagine this rectangle is my private subnet okay and this rectangle is my public subnet and what is the difference that i told you between the two is the public subnet has internet access the private subnet it does not have internet access okay so if i connect to a server which is there in my public subnet right because i'll be able to connect to it why because it has internet access if i connect to a server in the public subnet i can then connect my private server through this public server right if i connect to this ubuntu server on my terminal like this and then in this uh, in this server which is there in the public subnet if i enter the ssh command again and i enter the ip address this time the public uh, the private ip address of the private server which is deployed in the private subnet will i be not be able to connect to it okay so amit says yes so amit that is exactly what i'm trying to tell if i have a private machine which is deployed in this private subnet if i have to connect it from my machine what i'll be doing is i'll be launching a machine in the public subnet and through that i will be connecting to it okay it will be more clear to you when i do it in the terminal so devashish is saying uh, do you mean to say in real time scenario we do not have any public machine they use only private machines yes devashish so every big mnc right which are dealing with uh, a product which is accessed by millions of people uh, you know every day right and if they are following the right security best practices none of their servers will be exposed on the internet it will always be inside a private subnet so that is what i am trying to tell you okay all right so coming back now we have our home page uh, image ready right now let's create a image for our streaming server as well so what i'll do is again uh, let's create one more image from this server itself let's again go back to this directory let's change the index.html and this time let's say welcome to the streaming page save it okay and now if you go to this ip address 
you will see it will now say welcome to the streaming page okay and now let's create an image out of this as well so again we'll go to ec2 so in our ubuntu image we'll go to image we'll go to create image and let's call this image name as netflix stream okay so now the image will be created for that as well now what i'll do is i will go ahead and launch my home page in my private subnet so let's see how we can do that so i click on launch instance and i will choose my amis over here i'll not choose any operating system now i'll just choose my amis and now i will choose the netflix home image which i created earlier and let's select it uh, i want to launch it in the free tier server everything is going to be the same that we did earlier just that now i will be selecting a private subnet which i'll be deploying it in so i'll be choosing the private 2a network let's deploy it over here and this is our home page that we are deploying security group we will select again the default security group and we are going to restrict it don't worry about that we are going to restrict that security group and let's choose the same key pair that we used earlier netflix demo acknowledge that we have it and click on launch instances so this is now getting launched in us west 2a it's going to be launched in the 2a data center this is basically now called netflix hyphen home this is the home server that you have launched home page that you have launched and it will take a little while and as you can see it is now running now if you have a look at the settings of this server you will see that it will not have a public ip address right why because we deployed it inside a private network right but it will have a private ip address but this private ip address can only be reached out within the network it cannot be reached out from outside of the network remember this okay so this is the ip address uh, that we will be connecting through from our public instance which is nothing but uh you know this instance that we connected to earlier all right okay so we have launched our home page now let's go back let's see if our streaming page is ready so even streaming page is now ready let's launch this as well so i'll just select the streaming image click on action click on launch this is another way of launching it right uh this is the server that i want to launch i want to launch it under the free tier it will be deployed in the netflix network and this time i'm going to deploy it in private 2b data center okay everything else is going to be the same security group i'll select the default one click on review and launch launch it select the same key pair that i selected earlier acknowledge that i have it click on launch instances and with this my streaming page has also been launched okay great so now i have two servers which are now deployed inside private subnets and as you can see i do not have a public ip address over here okay and hence i will not be able to access them from the internet these are not having any internet access and i will prove it to you in a little while okay so i have the home page which is now running i have the stream page which is now running i have uh, let's name it as proxy server so i have a proxy server which is running in the public subnet which has internet now what i'll do is using this proxy server i will be connecting to this home page and the stream page server so let's see how we can do that so first we need to copy the pem file that we have on this proxy server so let's copy it so the way you can copy it is uh, you know use a command called scp which is called secure copy 
So first you will have to authenticate yourself using, uh, you know, the proxy server's pen file. Then you will have to specify the file that you want to copy. So the file name is again, this, this, this pen file I want to copy, right? Where do I want to copy it? I want to copy it on the proxy server, which is this IP address. And I want to copy it in this particular file location, which is slash home slash Ubuntu. Hit enter. Since I specified sudo, it is asking me for my computer's uh, password. Specified that. And now the file has been copied successfully. So now if I SSH into my server again, you can see that the file has been copied. Netflix hyphen demo dot pem. It has been copied onto my proxy server or my public server that I launched earlier. Okay, now people on Windows, if you want to do the same, what you can do is you can do is follow a simpler method. You can download a software called FileZilla. Okay, so FileZilla helps you to copy files from your local system to your specified server, right? So you can do use this software to connect to your server and copy files. How you can use it? I will request you to just follow a small tutorial on YouTube and you will understand how to use this tool. It's very simple. Okay, so let me see if I have some questions. So Nagraj says static PAT need to configure this for private servers. Uh, static private address is that what you mean by PAT? Nagraju, can you explain me what PAT means? But I don't need to configure any uh, static addresses uh, for my private servers. Nagaraju, because my private servers, the private IP that they get, they're already static. They are never uh, unassigned from those servers if, uh, let's say, I'm not using them. Uh, if, if, let's say, I'm not detaching them uh, manually. Even if I stop the server, if I restart the server, it will always going to be the same. Okay. Uh, Kirti saying any feedback link, sir. So Kirti, I did not understand. You mean the feedback for this session? Uh, for the feedback for this session will be available once you this webinar is ended. You can use it to give feedback. Uh, Raju saying you created AMI from public. Will it bring the enable auto IP feature to private instance? Uh, no, Raj, it will not bring it because that feature is basically enabled on AWS. Uh, you know, uh, on AWS configuration, it is not enabled on the uh, server's configuration. So, as you might understand, a public IP address is an external resource to the server, right? So, your server will not get the uh, you know public IP address. Don't worry about that. So, Hari Kishan is saying, is this similar in Windows as well? So, Hari Kishan, like I said, uh, you can use the FileZilla software for copying the files. Uh, Devshish is saying we can use FileZilla to copy. Yes, Devshish. Uh, Nagra is saying port address translations. So port address translations will not be required, Nagaraju, uh, when you want to connect, and it will be more clear to you as we progress in doing this hands-on. Anaga is saying, can you please repeat the step in short once again? So Anaga, what I've done is uh, I use the SCP command. If I can show you. Okay, so I use this SCP command to copy the PEM file uh, from my system to the remote system that I have on AWS. So this is what I've done. And once I did that, I can see that uh, it's now available to me and now I can uh, use this file to you know, connect to my private servers. This is what I've done. Uh, Ashish is saying, sorry to ask, what does AMI mean? AMI basically means Ashish, Amazon machine image. So Amazon machine image basically means the machine that you launched, if you want to create a copy of it, you create an AMI of it. That is what AMI is. 
so Mupai saying Ubuntu server is not able to connect to dot PPK file in North Virginia region. Uh, so Mupa, uh, what is the exact error you are getting? If you can tell me that, I can help you further. Uh, so if you are using a Linux instance, uh, I do not understand what do, what do you mean by I tried with a Linux ins instance instead. So if you did not launch Ubuntu, in that case, your username will be ec2-user. It will not be Ubuntu. So Altaf is saying, how can we install software in private subnet instances? So Altaf, that's why we created the image. So our image already had the softwares installed, right? So we do not have to install it in the private instances again. Okay, that's why we created the image and then we launched it inside the private subnet. Okay, great. So now that I have the PEM file uh, on my server, guys, the next thing that I will be doing is I'll be connecting to my private server. Now, where is my private server? My private server is this. Let's connect to a Netflix home server. Okay. So Netflix home server, this is the IP address. The private IP address for my Netflix home server. Let's try to connect to it. So I will be typing in uh, SSH hyphen I and then the PEM file, the username, and then the private IP address. So as you can see, earlier my IP was 10.1.1216. Now it has changed to 10.1.3.193. And that is the IP address of my Netflix home server. As you can see, the private IP address of my Netflix home server is 10.1.3.193. So this basically means I have successfully connected to my private instance. Now for some of you who still have a doubt, whether uh, you know if I pass this on my local machine, what will happen? So right now I'm inside the AWS server, right? But let's say uh, you know this is the terminal for my local machine. If I pass the same command over here, okay. First, let me go to the folder which has the pen file. Okay. So if I pass in the same command over here, you will be able to see it will not recognize what this address is. Can you see it's not connecting? It's not doing anything. Why? Because it does not know what this IP address means. Why? Because my local machine is not a part of uh, the Netflix network, which is there on AWS, right? But this machine is, and that's why when I passed this command, it was able to connect to this Netflix home server. Now, what I'll do is I'll just check if the web server is running. Yes, so it is active, it is running. That means uh, if I curl, so this is something that I'm just doing for my checking guys. If you don't understand, it's fine. Okay, so that means my Apache server is working on Netflix home, which is great. So I'll let me just exit. So I've exited and now I'm back to my public server. You can see the public, uh, the IP address changed. And now let me log into my Netflix streaming server as well. So I'll just change this IP address to my stream server. So my Netflix stream server has the IP address as 4.167. Let's specify that. So as you can see, I have connected to my Netflix stream server now. And if you check if the web server is running over here. Yes, it is running over here as well. Great. So both my servers are running fine. And I've just showed you how to make if, if some maintenance is required, how to do maintenance on your uh, private machines, right? Now what I can do is once maintenance is done, I can just delete this proxy server and then I'll be I'll, I'll not be giving any access to my uh, private machine. One thing that I forgot to show you was uh, let's say this is my public machine that I've launched on right now, right? Uh, this is my proxy machine that I've connected to, right? 
uh, this has internet connection. How do we know that? Uh, first of all, we are able to SSH it from my local machine. At the same time, if I type in curlgoogle.com, you can see that there is a response that I get, right? But if I, let's say, go to my private machine, right? And if I do a curlgoogle.com over here, you can see that I'm not getting any response over here. Why? Because this machine does not have internet access. Okay, and this proves that. Great. Let me exit. And now that our web servers are ready, they are ready inside, you know, a private subnet. Let's configure our load balancers to connect to this machine. Okay, meanwhile, let me see if we have any questions. So Sri Ganesh is saying how long this session will continue. So Sri Ganesh, it will take 15 more minutes and then we will be done. Asan is saying I'm confused about proxy servers. Did we create this server? So Asan, uh, this proxy server is nothing but the same server that I deployed in the public subnet where I created the image, right? So I'm not creating one more server. I'm just using this as a proxy server now because that is also a part of the same network, which is the public subnet. Right, so initially, essentially what you just need is a machine in a public subnet that you can connect to and through that you can connect to your private machines. So there's nothing to be confused about, but if you still are, let me know. Uh, I can explain you further. Okay. Uh, so Devashish is saying how people connect to private network if you don't have public machine. Devashish, there is no way that you can connect to a private machine. And that is why it is a good architectural practice to do it. Any other questions, guys? Should we proceed? Okay, great. So now what I'll do is, so Devishi is saying only we use website page uh so devishish uh, nobody else will be able to use this website page also it will be through the load balancer that people will be accessing it so let me go ahead and show you how that architecture is and then we can discuss if anything is not clear okay so now what i'll do is uh let's create a load balancer so i'll just scroll on my ec2 console and i will be able to see something called as load balancers over here let's click over it So let's click on create a load balancer. And I will be creating an application load balancer. So application load balancer basically works on the application layer. And it basically helps us to do path based routing that which is something that we are trying to accomplish, which is if I go to netflix.com slash stream, I should be uh, going to my stream server. If I go to slash home, I should be going to my home server. So we'll be creating an application load balancer. Let's name it as Netflix hyphen demo. This is going to be an internet facing load balancer. Right. And uh, the protocol that we are going to use is HTTP protocol. Okay. So here, as you can see, this is very important. So the only protocol that this load balancer is going to allow is HTTP protocol, nothing else. All right. Uh, which VPC will this load balancer be a part of? It will be a part of the Netflix VPC. And this has to connect to 2A and 2B servers, private servers. So if they have to connect to private servers in 2A and 2B, this load balancer has to be deployed in public 2A and public 2B. Only then it will be part of the network and then it will be able to connect to your machines. Okay, so what is the configuration that we did here? So you have configured your load balancer to connect to your private machines only using the HTTP protocol, nothing else. Okay, let's configure the firewall for this. So firewall, we'll, we'll be using the default firewall only, we'll not be making any changes. Let's specify routing now. So for routing, you will have to specify which servers to connect to. Right, so right now let's go ahead and specify a target group. Uh, let's name it as public hyphen server. 
And now let's go ahead and uh, specify the public server IP address. So the way I can do that is by specifying the uh, uh, the the servers that I'll be able to connect to, right? So what I'll do is target group is nothing but the set of servers that you can connect to, right? So let's specify uh, the name of this to be. Let's say this is the home page server. Right, let's click on next. And now what I can do is I can select the home page that I want to connect to. So this is the home page that I want to connect to. And let's click on next again. So this is the target group that I've just created for my home server. I'll be creating one more target group. Uh, don't worry about that. So let me first create it and then I'll explain you what I've just done. So let's create this load balancer now. Okay, so load balancer is now created. Uh, next thing that we will be doing is we will be creating one more target group. So we have created one target group for home page server. Let's create one for streaming server. Okay, this streaming server will also be a part of the Netflix VPC. And now let's go ahead and click on create okay so now uh, my target group has been created so i have a home page server and now i have a streaming server as well that i would want to connect to and in this uh, so home page server should have the home page server connected to it so it is not connected let's connect the home page server over here, which is Netflix home server. Let's register it to this target group, save it. And similarly in my streaming server target group, let's connect our stream server, register it and click on save. Okay, so both of these now have uh, you know the uh, targets uh, attached to them and now what we can do is now we will be specifying the uh, rules for our load balancer so let's go back to our load balancer and now what i can do is so now i have to specify this routing rule which is if I go to slash stream, then it should connect to the target group of my streaming server. And if I go to slash home, it should connect to the uh, stream, uh, the uh, servers of my home server, the, the server of my home uh, home page. Okay, so let's see how we can configure that. Okay, so you will have to go to listener and then you will have to specify rules. So we, let's go ahead and edit these rules over here. Okay, so right now what is happening is anything which is going to this server, it will be routed to the home page server. Okay, so let's add a route over here. Let's click on insert rule and add a condition. So we'll be adding a condition for a path and the path will be if it goes to slash stream or let's say slash watch right it should then uh, you know forward this request to the streaming server all right so if the path is slash watch the request will be forwarded to the streaming server okay if uh, if there is no uh, path specified it will be uh, routed to my home page server if there is uh, let me specify one more thing if so let me first save it right and let add, let us add one more rule so if the path is slash home in that case it should forward the request to my home page server 
and now let's click on save okay so now i have configured my load balancer to forward request to my home page server when this path is specified so let's check if this is working or not okay so i'll just go back uh this is my load balancer that i created right so this is the url that is there for my load balancer let's copy it let's paste it on my browser so as you can see i'm being routed to my home page now i will right now get an error if i go to slash watch it says requested url was not found in this server and the reason for that is that whenever you want to go to a particular path uh, what you'll have to do is you will have to specify a folder in your uh, server okay i will clear it to you in a little while so let me first make it work and then i'll answer all your queries give me one second so if i go to slash stream server this is this ip address i have to go inside the server i have to create a directory called watch and inside this directory i will have to copy the index.html okay and now you can see if i go to I, my load balancer slash watch one second okay so this is my streaming server all right and inside my streaming server if i go to watch I have my index.html and let me verify my settings of load balancer. So if I go to listeners and if I go to the rules, So if slash home is there, it'll go to home page server. If slash watch is there, it'll go to streaming server. And let me verify streaming server's uh, IP address. Okay, streaming server target is Netflix stream and is LD. Okay, so now if somebody is going to my streaming server, and the path is slash watch. It says it's 100%. Okay. Uh, we'll verify that in a moment, guys. Let's see what the problem is over here. So I think if we go to rules and try to edit these rules. Okay, let's try and see if this works for us. So if I'm going to slash watch, yes. So the star was missing over here. So now if I'm going to my load balancer slash watch, I'm going to the streaming page. And similarly, what I'll also have to do is, let me exit and let me go to my home server as well. okay so here as well i will have to add a home directory let me quickly do that
Okay. And now if I go to my load balancer, let's say I'm going to slash home. You can see I'm being routed to the welcome to the home page. And if I'm just going to the uh, URL, then also I'm being routed to welcome to the home page. Okay. Now I know that you might guys, you guys will have a lot of questions. Let me pick it one by one and then I'll be answering it. Okay, Kishore says a lot of kind words. Thank you, Kishore. Uh, Ashish is saying, how do we deploy applications to private networks in future? So Ashish, uh, for deploying application to private networks, uh, it's going to be the same way that I showed you. We created a private subnet, right? And in that private subnet, uh, we deployed some resources, right? So this is how you do it. Now, if you want to configure them, you will have to have a, a proxy server that will be deploying in a public subnet which will then be able to talk to your private subnet but that will be the way okay so Sri Ganesh is saying what is the function of load balancer Sri Ganesh load balancer basically is one single endpoint through which you can interact with a lot of servers so that is what the function of load balancer is uh Murthy is saying any plans to show registered users versus new user accessing websites through ELB um Murthy, that will not actually, you know, be any difference because if you create users that will be actually on the application, it has nothing to do with the load balancer. Nagaraj, you say group level strictness is off in rules. What is it? So stickiness basically is Nagaraju when let's say uh, you are connected to a server and you're uploading something over there, right? So if you have uploaded something to that server, it will not be replicated across the other servers. So when you enable stickiness for the session that you are connected to, your request will always be routed to the same server through which the load balancer has given you the first access. Because what happens is right now we are just have two servers. We don't have any replicas of it. On production architectures, we have a lot of replicas of each server. So which replica do, to connect to, your load balancer randomly picks up one and connect you to it, whichever is available. But if you have something that you are uploading and you're in the process of uploading it, uh, you know, the problem is that you have to be on the same server while that process is happening. And that is what stickiness basically attends to. Uh, so Devishi is saying, why we put star in slash words? So Devishi star basically means that anything after this URL, uh, whatever is anything, whatever thing you want to add after slash watch, Right, it does not matter. You should still be routed to the same server. Uh, for example, if I type in slash watch, right, and then I can type in anything over here. So if this file exists on the server, I will still be on the uh, watch server, not on the home server. So this is what star means. And that means I, I can have anything after this URL and still my uh, request will be forwarded to that uh, target group which has the watch servers, no other target group. That's what star basically means. Uh, so Raj, Raj, Raju is saying, won't be using Route 53, we will be using Raj. Uh, um, okay, so Kishore is saying, uh, wanted to connect with you. Uh, okay, so Kishore, uh, let's talk after this session. Uh, Surendra is saying, awesome and big session. Please share me recording on this email. Yes, Surendra, it will be shared to you. Uh, uh, Nagaraju is saying many thanks for the session yesterday and today. You're welcome, Nagaraju. Okay, Murthy is saying proxy server, private subnet for UI application, private subnet for RDS will be typical config, right? It will be the same config, Murthy. Now that you know which, how the networks are basically configured, you can launch any resource and then you can just have to specify that that resource has to launch in a private subnet. All right, and then since with databases, the scene is that only your application will be connecting to the database. Nobody else, nobody from the outside also will be connecting to your database. So in that case, you don't have to configure anything else, right? Since uh, your database will be going to is going to be a part of the Netflix network, right? So your database can automatically be connected to your application uh, servers which you have deployed in the private subnet. Okay. Altaf is saying Netflix architecture good and easy to understand. Do we have any other cloud architecture repository where we can try to implement and simulate? 
Altaf, not as of now, but uh, you know, you can just uh, subscribe to the Intellipart uh, YouTube channel. So if you have something coming up, we can actually, you know, we are actually going to publish it over there, and you will be the uh, right, uh, you'll be the right audience to get notified in that case. Ashish is saying thanks. For example, if you have multiple servers, say hundred, do we need manual SSH to all with proxy? Um, no, Ashi. So that is why you deal with uh, images. So I created an image, and through that image, now I can create hundred servers. So I don't have to configure every one of them. Now let's say there is one common change that I have to do in all the servers. So what I'll do is I'll create an image, and then I'll replace all those hundred servers with the new servers that I'll be deploying. So that is how we do it. Uh, Deshi is saying, is companies like Netflix use Windows or Linux? Which OS they use for hosting their website? So Deshi they use Linux for hosting it most of the times. It will never be Windows. It will either be Linux or some type of some custom operating system that they have made. It will never be Windows. Uh, so Sharath is saying, please share the recording. Sharath will be shared to you. Don't worry. Uh, so uh, uh, Raj is saying, Heman, do you also teach AWS Solutions Architect course in Telepart? Uh, yes, Raj, I do. So you can just check with Intellipart in case you're interested. Okay, guys. So now what we'll be doing is now we will be connecting a custom URL to our load balancer. And I understand we have already, you know, taken a lot of time for this session. We'll just take five to ten more minutes, guys, and then we'll be done. Okay. So first things first, what you need is a URL first. So what you need to do is just go to your Freenom website. So there's a website called Freenom. It basically gives you free URLs. Okay. Otherwise, if you have to buy a URL, it's a proprietary resource. You'll have to pay for the URLs that you want. But with Freenom, you can get a free URL uh, at your will. Okay. So just sign up on uh, Freenom. So I already have signed up. So let me just connect to it. Let me sign in quickly. Okay, I'm connected. Uh, let's go to my domains. So right now I have some domains, but I'll be showing you once you sign up, you know how you can create your own domain. So what I'll be doing is, as you can see, these are some domains that I have. I'll be creating a new domain, just like you guys would be doing when you sign up. So I'll just go to register a new domain. Go to services, go to register a new domain, and in register a new domain, just specify the name of the domain that you want. So in my case, I want Netflix hyphen demo. Let's check the availability. So as you can see, uh, these are all domains which are free and I can get them. So let's get this domain. Check it out. Continue. And just agree to the conditions and click on complete order. So with this, your order has been confirmed and you can now go ahead to my domains. You have the uh, Netflix demo uh, domain registered to you. You can just click on manage domain. And here you will have to go to click on management tools uh, and then click on name servers. Okay, and what you have to type in is custom name servers. So these are some name servers that you have to fill in. Now, how can you fill these name servers? Again, go back to your AWS management console. Click on services, type in route 53. Now, once you're inside route 53, you will have to choose a hosted zone. Let's click on create hosted zone and over here, just type in the domain name that you created. So it's Netflix hyphen demo dot pk. Give the same name over here. Click on create. And this will create a hosted zone for you. Now, as you can see, these are name servers that you will have to enter over there in Freenom. Okay, so just select this. Copy these name servers one by one. Uh, go to the second name server again copy it from here Third name server again copy it from here Fourth 
both names are again copied from here. Okay, so that's all. That's all the changes that you have to do on Freenom. You can close it now. Now in Route 53, you just have to do one small change. Click on Create Record Set, right? And now what you'll be doing is you'll be pointing. So what has what have you done so far? You have mentioned these name servers in your Freenom website, right? So now your domain will be pointing pointing to these name servers, which are basically the Route 53 servers that you have. Now this route 53 you will have to point to your load balancer. So how will you do that? Uh, you will find this section called alias click on yes and here you have to select your Netflix demo load balancer. Okay, click on create. So our entry is made over here. Similarly one more entry you have to create with the similar settings just that in name you will have to enter www as well. Click on alias yes select the load balancer click on create. Okay, so with this now your route 53 is ready and now what you can do is just go to a, a Browser type in Netflix hyphen demo dot TK hit enter and It will now route you to the home page directly and now if you go to the URL slash uh, watch It is now pointing you to the streaming page and this is exactly what is happening on your Netflix website as well. So let me quickly show it to you. Okay, so if we go to netflix.com slash browse it is it will take you to the home page if you type in Netflix dot dot tk slash home take you to the home page if you type in netflix.com slash watch and then the video title it will take you to the video player which will play the video file for you and similarly if here you go to netflix.com slash watch you will be taken to the streaming page and guys this is how you mimic the architecture for netflix on aws Okay, so if you have any questions, you can let me know. I'll be happy to answer. If not, uh, let's conclude today's session. So Devashi is saying, what are the security group port uh, like RDP, ICMP, etc. Please, little elaborate on this. So uh, in security group, if you specify RDP, uh, Devashi RDP basically has a port of three three thousand something, right? So RDP is always available on a specific port. So if you select RDP that port is opened in the firewall and through that you will be able to connect to your machine. Similarly, if you select ICMP, ICMP has a separate port which is designated to it. So if you allow ICMP connections, then that port is enabled in the firewall. Now uh, the, the application that you have for your streaming player, right, that you will have to deploy in this server. That's it. From the architecture point of view, what we have done is we have showed you how cloud architecture will be deployed for Netflix. And now here you just have to replace the streaming page with your video player, right? And then it will start to work like that. Now what you're asking is how will the movies be stored? It will not be stored inside the database. Your database will just have the data about the movie. For example, the title, the uh, rating of the movie, the description of the movie, etc. Right, and what you'll have later, uh, uh, what you'll have the movie itself will basically be stored in, uh, you know, a service like S3 or Google Drive. Not in Google Drive, but I'm just giving you an example. Just like you have Google Drive, you have something called as S3 in AWS. So that is where you will be storing your movies. So let us begin with AWS beginner interview questions. First, we have what is AWS? AWS stands for Amazon Web Services. It is an Amazon service that uses distributed IT infrastructure to provide various IT resources on demand. It offers a variety of services including infrastructure as a service, platform as a service and software as a service. Next, what is EC2? 
EC2 is a cloud-based virtual machine over which you can have OS level control. You can use this cloud server whenever you want and when you need to deploy your own servers in the cloud, similar to your on-premise servers and when you want complete control over the machine's hardware and updates. Third question, what is VPC? VPC is an abbreviation for Virtual Private Cloud. It enables you to personalize your network configuration. A virtual private cloud network is logically isolated from other networks in the cloud. It provides you with your own private IP address range, internet gateways, subnets, and security groups. Fourth question, what are key pairs? Amazon EC2 employs public key cryptography to encrypt and decrypt login information. In public key cryptography, the public key is used to encrypt the information while the private key is used to decrypt the information at the receiver's end. Key pairs are the combination of public and private key. Key pairs allow you to securely access the instances. Then, what is AWS Lambda? AWS Lambda is a compute service that allows you to run your code without having to manage servers. The Lambda function executes your code whenever it is required. You only have to pay when your code is running. Sixth question, what role does buffer play in Amazon Web Services? An elastic load balancer ensures that incoming traffic is distributed as evenly as possible across multiple AWS instances. A buffer will synchronize various components and make the arrangement more adaptable to a burst of load or traffic. The components are prone to receiving and processing requests in an unstable manner. The buffer creates an equilibrium between various devices and trains them to work at the same rate in order to provide faster services. Seventh question, why do we make subnets? Subnetting is the process of dividing a large network into smaller ones. These subnets can be formed for a variety of reasons. Subnets, for example, can help reduce congestion by ensuring that the traffic destined for a subnet stays in that subnet. This aids the efficient routing of traffic entering the network, which reduces the network load. Eighth question, what is the maximum number of S3 buckets you can create? There is a limit of 100 S3 buckets that can be created. Ninth question, what are the characteristics of Amazon Cloud Search? Amazon Cloud Search features autocomplete advice, Boolean searches, entire text search, faceting term boosting, highlighting, prefix searches, and finally, range searches. Tenth question, what is a hypervisor? A hypervisor is a piece of software that allows you to create and manage virtual machines. It combines physical hardware resources into a platform and distributes them virtually to each user. Oracle VirtualBox, VMware Fusion, VMware Workstation, and Solaris Zones are examples of hypervisors. Let's move on to AWS Intermediate Interview Questions. First, will your standby RDS be launched in the same availability zone as your primary? No. Standby instances are launched in different availability zones than the primary, resulting in physically separate infrastructures. This is due to the fact that the entire purpose of standby instances is to prevent infrastructure failure. As a result, if the primary instance fails, the standby instance will assist in recovering all of the data. Let's move on to the second question. Your company wishes to send and receive compliance emails from its customers using its own email address and domain. What service would you recommend for accomplishing the same goal in a simple and cost-effective manner? So for this purpose, Amazon Simple Email Service, which is also known as Amazon SES, a cloud-based email sending service can be used. Third question, you unintentionally terminated an EC2 instance in a VPC with an associated Elastic IP. What will be the outcome if you restart the instance? So Elastic IP will be disconnected from the instance only if it is terminated. There will be no change to the instance and no data will be lost if it is stopped and restarted. Fourth question, can I vertically scale an Amazon instance? How do you do it? The answer is yes. Start a new larger instance than the one you're running 
then pause it to detach and discard the root. EBS volume from this server then stops the live instance and disconnects its root volume. Take note of the unique device ID, then attach that root volume to the new server and restart. You will have scaled vertically this way. Fifth question, how can you send a request to Amazon S3? You can send requests by using the REST API or the AWS SDK wrapper libraries that wrap the underlying Amazon S3 REST API. And for the sixth question, what are the various types of load balancers available in EC2? In EC2, there are three types of load balancers. First, application load balancers. They are designed to make routing decisions at the application layer. Then we have network load balancer. A network load balancer handles millions of requests per second and aids in transport layer routing decisions. Then we have classic load balancer. The classic load balancer is primarily used for applications developed on the EC2 classic network. It provides basic load balancing across multiple Amazon EC2 instances. And for the seventh question, define Amazon EC2 regions and availability zones. The availability zones are geographically distant areas. As a result, EC2 instances in other zones are unaffected if one zone fails. Regions may have one or more availability zones. This configuration also aids in latency and cost reduction. Eighth question, explain Amazon EC2 root device volume. The root device drive contains the image that will be used to boot an EC2 instance. When an Amazon AMI launches the new EC2 instance, this happens. An EBS or an instance store can support this root device volume. In general, the lifespan of an EC2 instance has no effect on the root device data on Amazon EBS. Ninth question, what is an elastic transcoder? To support multiple devices with different resolutions such as laptops, tablets and smartphones, we must change the video's resolution and format. This is easily accomplished using an Amazon Web Services tool called the Elastic Transcoder, which is a media transcoding in the cloud that precisely allows us to do the necessary. It is simple to use, affordable and highly scalable for businesses and developers. Can S3 be used with EC2 instances? And if yes, how? Amazon S3 can be used for instances with root devices that are backed up by local instance storage. Developers will have access to the same highly scalable, reliable, fast and low-cost data storage infrastructure that Amazon uses to run its own global network of websites. Developers load Amazon machine images into Amazon S3 and then move them between Amazon S3 and Amazon EC2 to run systems in the Amazon EC2 environment. And finally, we have AWS Advanced Interview Questions. Let us look at the first question. What exactly is the distinction between a spot instance, an on-demand instance, and a reserved instance? Spot instances are unused EC2 instances that can be used at a reduced cost by users. When using on-demand instances, you must pay for computing resources without committing to a long-term contract. In contrast, reserved instances allow you to specify attributes such as instant type, platform, tenancy, region, and availability zone. When instances in specific availability zones are used, reserved instances provide significant cost savings and capacity reservations. Second question, your company wants you to propose a solution for connecting the company's data center to the Amazon Cloud Network. What is your suggestion? By establishing a virtual private network between the VPC and the data center, the data center can be connected to the Amazon Cloud Network. A virtual private network allows you to create a secure path or tunnel from your premises or device to the AWS Global Network. Third question, define snapshots in Amazon LightSail. Snapshots are point-in-time backups of EC2 instances, block storage drives, and databases. They can be manufactured manually or automatically at any time. Even after they have been created, your resources can always be restored using snapshots. These resources 
will also carry out the same functions as the originals from which the snapshots were created. Fourth question, what happens if the content in CloudFront is not present at an edge location and a request is made for it? The content will be delivered directly from the origin server by CloudFront. It will also keep the content in the cache of the edge location where it was missing. Fifth question, can you change the private IP address of an EC2 instance while it is in running or in a stopped state? The answer to that is, it cannot be altered. When an EC2 instance is launched, it is assigned a private IP address at boot time. This private IP address is assigned to the instance for the duration of its existence and cannot be changed. Then, what are the native AWS security logging capabilities? AWS CloudTrail, AWS Config, AWS Detailed Billing Reports, Amazon S3 Access Logs, Elastic Load Balancing Access Logs, Amazon CloudFront Access Logs, Amazon VPC Flow Logs, and other native AWS security logging capabilities are available. Seventh question, how can you recover or log in to an EC2 instance for which you have lost the key? So if you have lost the key, follow the steps below to recover an EC2 instance. First, check that the EC2 config service is up and running. Then, remove the instance's root volume. Then, connect the volume to a temporary instance. And then, change the configuration file. And finally, relaunch the original instance. Eighth question, which of Snowball, Snow Edge and Snowmobile is best option for transferring large amounts of data? AWS Snowball is essentially a data transport solution for moving large amounts of data in and out of an AWS region. AWS Snowball Edge, on the other hand, adds additional computing functions in addition to providing a data transport solution. The Snowmobile is an exabyte scale migration service that can transfer up to 100 PB of data. And for the ninth question, what happens when one of the resources in a stack cannot be created successfully? If a resource in the stack cannot be created, CloudFormation automatically rolls back and terminates all resources created using the CloudFormation template. This is a useful feature if you accidentally exceed your elastic IP address limit or do not have access to an EC2 AMI. And the last question, what are some of the best security practices for Amazon EC2? Amazon EC2 security best practices include using identity and access management to control access to AWS resources, restricting access by only allowing trusted hosts or networks to access ports on an instance, only opening up those permissions you need, and disabling password-based logins for your instances launched from your AMI. Just a quick info, guys. IntelliPath offers an AWS certification course for solutions architect certified by Nescom and it aligns with industry standards. Through this course, you can learn all the important concepts of AWS and upon completion of the course, you will receive a Nescom certification. With this course, we have already helped thousands of professionals in successful career transition. You can check out the testimonials on our Achievers channel whose link is given in the description below. Without a doubt, this course can set your career to new heights. So visit the course page link given below in the description and take a first step towards career growth in the field of AWS.